is 5.03 p.m. My name is Lou Oliva and I will be tonight's hearing officer. The hearing is being live streamed and recorded and will be available publicly on the MTA YouTube channel and the Central Business District Tolling Program project website at mta.info slash cbdtp. Sonographers are present and will create a written record of today's hearing. By attending this virtual hearing, you consent to be recorded. Today's hearing will begin with opening remarks, followed by a presentation on the Central Business District Tolling Program environmental assessment, and then public comments. There are 391 speakers signed up. Speakers will be called in the order they signed up. Due to the overwhelming interest in this hearing, there is a possibility we will go well past midnight. After we get underway, through the Q&A function, we will send each speaker present this, this evening your place in the speaker list. Please give us a little time as it will take some time to get, every, get this message to each speaker in attendance. Throughout the evening, we will regularly let everyone know where we are in the list so you can gauge how much longer you may need to wait to speak. During the past few days, we've contacted all those who signed up after the 100th person to let them know about the options to transfer their sign up to another hearing. This is still an option. If at any point in this hearing you decide you would like to speak at a different hearing, please let us know in the Q&A function and we will move your date. If you have joined the Zoom under a name that is different from the one you used when you signed up to speak, or if you did not sign up to speak but would like to speak, please identify yourself in the Q&A function. You may also request to speak anonymously. If this is your preference, please indicate this in the Q&A function and we will give you further instructions. Please do, please do not use the Q&A function for comments um, you would like to submit on the Central Business District tolling program. Comments can be submitted by visiting mta.info slash cbdtp calling 646-252-7440 via email to CBD Tolling Program to Broadway, 23rd floor, New York, New York, 10004, or via email at cbdtp at mtabt.org. You may also submit comments directly to the Federal Highway Administration via email at cbdtp at dot.gov or by mail at FHWA, New York Division, Ray, CBDTP, Leo W. O'Brien Federal Building, 11A, Clinton Avenue, Suite 719, Albany, New York, 12207. Comments submitted by mail, phone, email, online form, or verbally at a hearing will be considered equally and carry the same weight. In addition, and again in recognition of the overwhelming interest, we have added the ability to submit personally recorded video comments. As with oral comments at the hearing, video comments should be limited to three minutes. Recorded video comments may be submitted via email to cbdtp at mtabt.org. Such comments will be considered equally and carry the same weight as all other methods for submitting comments. Cart captioning and American Sign Language interpreters are available at today's hearing. To turn on cart captioning, use the CC button on the bottom of the screen. Sign language interpreters will appear on the screen for all attendees. To hear the translated audio, use the interpretation button on the bottom of the screen. We will now start with opening remarks from Dr. Allison De Sereno, MTA's Deputy Chief Operating Officer. Thank you. And thank you all for joining us today. We are excited to be here as we continue our public outreach on this historic project. I'd like to thank you for taking the time to learn more and share with us your thoughts and comments. This evening, I am representing the Triborough Bridge and Tunnel Authority and MTA more broadly and I'm joined by Nicola Angel, Vice President at Triborough Bridge and Tunnel Authority and other members of the agency, as well as other colleagues from the other project sponsors for this effort. Catherine Leslie, Director of Special Projects for New York State Department of Transportation, and William Carey, Assistant Commissioner for Policy from New York City Department of Transportation. 
We also have with us this evening, Rick Marquis, New York Division Administrator for the Federal Highway Administration, the lead federal agency for the project. He will be joined by Monica Pavlik, Project Manager, and Anna Price, Director for Office of Programs. Key personnel from all four of our agencies are also in attendance today, listening to what you have to say. Your comments will be re recorded, indexed, and responded to as part of the environmental assessment process. Last year, we held 10 webinar-style public sessions, nine similar sessions focused on environmental justice communities, and several meetings each of the Environmental Justice Technical Advisory Group and Environmental Justice Stakeholder Working Group. Since then, we have incorporated comments heard during these sessions into the technical analyses for the environmental assessment, or EA. I want to thank you all for your earlier input. I believe you will see firsthand how your comments affected what we explored and how we addressed concerns. On August 10th, 2022, we released the environmental assessment for public review. If you have not yet had an opportunity to read the entire environmental assessment, the executive summary, which has been translated into multiple languages, is available on our website. The rest of the document is also on the website, and you can find a hard copy of the entire environmental assessment at numerous locations throughout 28 counties in New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut. A complete list of locations is also available on the project website. In a few moments, we will begin with a presentation that provides a summary review of the EA findings. It is a bit longer than one might expect but there is a lot of information here, and we want to ensure that everyone has an opportunity to hear about the areas in which they may be interested. After the presentation, we will listen to those of you who would like to provide oral public comments. The formal comment period on the EA continues through September 9th. For those who prefer not to speak, but still want to submit comments, we will provide information on other ways to do that again later in the session. Now, let's begin our presentation. So what is the Central Business District Tolling Program? In 2019, New York State enacted the MTA Reform and Traffic Mobility Act, which authorized the Triborough Bridge and Tunnel Authority, or TBTA, to design, develop, and implement a vehicular tolling program to reduce traffic congestion in the Manhattan Central Business District. As defined by the act, vehicles entering or remaining in the Manhattan Central Business District on or below 60th Street which is shown in the map in orange, would be tolled. The FDR Drive, Westside Highway, Battery Park Underpass, and any surface roadway portion of the Hugh L. Carey Tunnel connecting to West Street, in essence, the dark red line along the edges of the orange area on the map to the right, would be excluded from the toll. After covering the project-related capital and operating expenses, revenue collected would fund MTA's 2020 to 2024 capital program and successor capital programs. By law, 80% of the net revenues would be used for New York City transit capital improvements, 10% would be used for Long Island Railroad, and 10% for improvements for Metro North Railroad. With respect to how the Manhattan CBD tolling program would work, locations for infrastructure would include detection points placed at entrances and exits to the Manhattan CBD. On the avenues, these detection points would generally be between 60th and 61st streets, and an algorithm would be used so those who stay on excluded roadways are not told. In essence, as someone is coming down the roadway, the detection points would detect their vehicle and determine how long it should be before they're seen at the next location. Assuming they continue to be seen at each location within the allotted time, no toll would be charged. If, however, the vehicle is not seen and then not seen again, at some point, the system will determine that they must have entered the central business district and a toll would be charged. On the right, you can see an example of what the infrastructure and the tolling system equipment would look like. It's predominantly poles, as you see on the right, and mast arms, as you see on the left. Importantly, the tolling system equipment will be clustered and housed in a single unit enclosures, as shown on the bottom. The enclosures are purposely designed to minimize the amount of equipment on the poles and to reflect light in a way that makes them less visible to someone walking or driving. With respect to how customers would pay, it would be very similar to what people experience today. They would be able to pay with Easy Pass or tolls by mail, where an image is taken of the license plate and a bill is mailed to the registered owner of the vehicle. And we will also have the capability for future third-party providers 
in essence, these are companies that may use different types of technology that can link into the technology that this system would have. The benefits of the program would include reduced vehicular traffic in and near the Manhattan Central Business District, improved travel times within the Manhattan Central Business District, including for buses and deliveries, and a new source of local recurring capital funding for subways, trains, and buses, as well as improved regional air quality. So why is an environmental assessment, or EA, needed for this project? Well, some roadways in the Manhattan Central Business District have received federal funds, so approval for tolling is needed from the Federal Highway Administration. Before a federal agency makes a decision, the National Environmental Policy Act, or NEPA, requires the federal agency to understand and disclose the environmental effects of the action, in this case, the tolling. An EA is performed to ensure federal agencies consider the environmental impacts of their actions in the decision-making process. For a proposed action that is not likely to have significant effects, or when the significance of the effect is unknown, the EA aids in determining the significance of the adverse effects. Since the project could have effects on environmental justice populations, Federal Highway Administration and the project sponsors incorporated enhanced public outreach and coordination with federal and state resource agencies. The project's purpose is to reduce traffic congestion in the Manhattan Central Business District in a manner that will generate revenue for future transportation improvements pursuant to acceptance into Federal Highway Administration's Value Pricing Pilot Program, or VPPP. The need is to reduce vehicle congestion in the Manhattan Central Business District and create a new local recurring funding source for MTA's capital projects. The purpose and need are refined through four objectives. To reduce daily vehicle miles traveled, or VMT, within the Manhattan Central Business District by at least 5%. To reduce the number of vehicles entering the Manhattan Central Business District daily by at least 10% to create a funding source for capital improvements and generate sufficient annual net revenue to fund $15 billion for capital projects for the MTA capital program, and to establish a tolling program consistent with the purposes underlying the New York State legislation entitled the MTA Reform and Traffic Mobility Act. You may be asking, why do we need to toll the Manhattan Central Business District? Well, traffic congestion has been a problem in the Manhattan Central Business District for many years and one of the most challenging policy problems for generations. Many efforts have been made, and yet congestion in New York City consistently ranks among the worst in the United States. Indeed, congestion costs 102 hours of lost time, equating to almost $1,600 per year per driver in delay. Between 2010 and 2019, travel speeds fell 22% in Manhattan Central Business District, and local bus speeds have declined 28% since 2010. The average speed of select bus service, New York City's bus rapid transit service routes, in the Manhattan CBD is 19% slower than in the outer boroughs. With respect to MTA's subway, rail, and bus systems, they need to be repaired and modernized. Funding from the project would support the 2020 to 2024 capital program and the successor programs that prioritize investing to improve reliability, committing to environmental sustainability, building an accessible transit system for all New Yorkers, easing congestion and creating growth, and improving safety and customer service through technology. I'll now walk you through the findings of the environmental assessment. There were two project alternatives that are evaluated in the environmental assessment. The no action alternative, in which there is no program to toll vehicles in the Manhattan Central Business District, no comprehensive plan to reduce congestion, and no new annual recurring funding for MTA capital programs. And there is the central business tolling or action alternative, where we implement a tolling program consistent with the Mobility Act to toll the vehicles entering or remaining in the Manhattan Central Business District. We install tolling infrastructure and tolling system equipment and signage within and near the Manhattan Central Business District and generate funds for MTA's capital investments in subways, buses, and commuter railroads. The environmental assessment explores each of the topics in this chart. The specific chapters that address the analysis for each area are identified here. As you can see, the analysis shows that most of the areas have beneficial effects or no adverse effects, but there are a few areas with potential adverse effects. The slides a bit later in the presentation will address each of the areas and identify any mitigation that is needed. This slide has a lot of information, 
and it is in the executive summary and in chapter two of the environmental assessment for further review. I am going to spend a few moments reviewing and explaining it here so everyone can understand its importance. As I said a moment ago, there are two alternatives for this environmental assessment, the no action and the central business district tolling alternative. Within the central business district tolling alternative, there are a number of tolling scenarios that vary in several ways. Modeling these different scenarios helped us to understand the full range of effects of the central business district tolling alternative since the decision on the actual tolling scenario has not yet been made. For those of you who participated in the early outreach, you may notice that we now have seven tolling scenarios when we originally discussed six. That is because we added a tolling scenario, which I'll get to shortly, as a result of concerns raised during the early public outreach. So let me walk you through. Along the top are the tolling scenarios. Tolling scenario A we refer to as the base plan. This is the plan that is characterized by legislation. Tolling scenario B has that same base plan but starts to add caps in the form of how many times a vehicle can be tolled and certain exemptions. Tolling scenario C adds what we call low crossing credits for vehicles using tunnels to access the central business district with some caps and exemptions. Those crossing credits, when they are low, are roughly $6.50. When they are high, as you see in tolling scenarios D, E, and F, the credits are roughly $13, and this was used for modeling purposes. In D, E, and F, you see those high crossing credits. In D and E, they are applied to the tunnels that enter into the central business district. And in F, vehicles using all of the tolled facilities that enter Manhattan would be eligible for crossing credits. Moving down the left side, you see the distinction on the items that are varying. First, the potential crossing credits. Again, these are credits that would be applied toward the central business district toll for tolls paid at facilities prior to entering the central business district. As you move to the right, you can see the no's and yeses, which determine whether or not that potential crossing credit applies to the facilities that are identified. Moving to the next group are potential exemptions and discounts in the form of caps on the number of tolls per day. Importantly, by legislation and in the modeling and in the program, passenger vehicles would be charged only once per day, but other vehicles could be charged more than that. And as you read across to the right, you will see under each of the different tolling scenarios how these different types of vehicles were treated with respect to caps or exemptions. Finally, as you move to the bottom, we have the approximate toll rate for autos, small trucks, and large trucks that resulted from the modeling. The one tolling scenario I'd like to mention is tolling scenario G all the way to the right. This tolling scenario has a base plan with the same tolls for all vehicle classes. We'll talk about that a little bit later in the presentation, but importantly, as you see on the bottom, the toll rate is set the same for every type of vehicle. So that was a lot of information. And so I'd like to leave you with some key takeaways. First and foremost, tolling the Manhattan Central Business District in all scenarios reduce traffic entering the Manhattan Central Business District and results in a net benefit in congestion reduction for the region. Discounts, crossing credits, and exemptions result in the need for higher toll rates. Higher toll rates lead to a greater degree of traffic reduction in the Manhattan Central Business District, but also lead to increased traffic diversions, including increases along the Cross Bronx Expressway and the Staten Island Expressway. Crossing credits lead to more parity in the total cost among different routes that are taken by vehicles entering the Manhattan Central Business District. But those same crossing credits change the balance of effects on traffic. They result in less effect reducing traffic from Queens and much less effect reducing traffic from New Jersey. They result in greater effects reducing traffic from north of 60th Street in Brooklyn. And they result in more traffic at the Queens Midtown Tunnel the Hugh L. Carey Tunnel, and the Long Island Expressway. Before we move on, I thought it was helpful to give at least a sense of where are the commuters actually coming from into the Manhattan Central Business District. 
On the left, you can see the 28 county region. Again, this is all in the environmental assessment for further review. The colors on the map denote the proportion of total commuters to the Manhattan Central Business District from each county in the 28 county region. The map also shows how many commute by transit, car, or some other transportation mode to reach the Manhattan Central Business District. Not surprisingly, counties that are further away tend to have fewer commuters to the Manhattan Central Business District. For example, of all the commuters to the Manhattan Central Business District, fewer than 1% come from counties like New Haven and Dutchess. About 1% to 3% come from counties like Rockland, Morris, and Richmond. And roughly 4% to 5% come from Bergen, Hudson, and Westchester counties. Closer in, about 6 to 10% come from Nassau County and the Bronx, while the remainder of the New York City boroughs contribute 11 to 22% of the commuters to the Manhattan Central Business District. On the right in the figure, you can see that of all the people commuting to work in the Manhattan Central Business District, the vast majority, 85%, commute by transit. Of the 11% who commute by car, approximately 8% of them are from counties in New York, roughly 3% in New Jersey, and less than 1% from Connecticut. Now we'll go through the effects of each of the topic areas. On the top right of each slide, you'll see that we've identified whether effects are beneficial, not adverse, or adverse. In this case, this is the regional effects of transportation. Broadly speaking, all tolling scenarios reduce the number of vehicle entries into the Manhattan Central Business District and reduce vehicle miles traveled in the Manhattan Central Business District. The table on the bottom left provides the degree to which the traffic is reduced. In this case, there's a reduction of vehicles entering the Manhattan CBD of nearly 20% to roughly 15%, depending upon which tolling scenario one is looking at. On the right-hand side, you see the increase or decrease in daily vehicle miles traveled for each of the areas throughout the 28 counties. And as you can see, broadly speaking, regionally, again, there's largely a benefit. In the Manhattan Central Business District, VMT decreases anywhere from a little over 9% to about 7%. Throughout New York City, the reduction is roughly 1.5% to about 0.7%, and so on down the group. With respect to highways, we have beneficial effects, and we do have some adverse effects in a few locations where mitigation will be required. Some locations experience a decrease in congestion, which is a beneficial effect. There were three highway segments, though, that would experience adverse effects in the form of increased delays at certain times. As you can see here, it's the westbound Long Island Expressway near the Queens Midtown Tunnel in the midday. Approaches to the westbound George Washington Bridge on I-95 also in the midday. And in the evening, the southbound and northbound FDR Drive between East 10th Street and Brooklyn Bridge. For mitigation, the project sponsors implement a monitoring plan prior to the project beginning that identifies thresholds for adverse effects. If the thresholds are reached as a result of the project, the project sponsors will institute transportation demand management measures, such as ramp metering, motorist information, or signage at identified highway locations with adverse effects. In addition, post-implementation, the project sponsors will monitor effects, and if needed, Triborough Bridge and Tunnel Authority, TBTA, will modify the toll rates, crossing credits, exemptions, and or discounts to reduce those adverse effects. Note the call out in the upper right and recall what I mentioned regarding tolling scenario G earlier. During our early outreach and conversations with environmental justice communities, we shared information regarding changes in traffic patterns. Here on the left, you can see one of the maps that was used for analysis related to traffic and air quality effects. These are areas with environmental justice communities. Under this tolling scenario, some of these communities would experience reduced vehicle miles traveled. Others would see some increases as traffic diverts to avoid the toll. As noted earlier, as the toll goes up, these diversions increase. Participants raised concerns about the increased traffic along the Cross Bronx Expressway and asked what that meant in terms of truck traffic, as trucks are associated with particulate matter and associated health effects. The team reviewed the initial six scenarios at a specific location, McCombs Road, and found the daily increases in truck traffic in the table to the right. During this same outreach period, the trucking associations also raised their concerns that people can move to transit to avoid the toll, but trucks cannot do this. Further, 
Though tolled bridges, roadways, and tunnels typically charge higher tolls for trucks given the wear and tear on the roadway, the purpose of this project is to reduce congestion. The project team looked closer at why trucks were diverting in the modeling. We found that the extent of the diversions was linked to the truck toll and price differential in the initial six tolling scenarios where trucks are tolled at a higher price. To test this, we created tolling scenario G, which prices all vehicle types the same. The results, as you can see, reduced the diversions along with the relative incremental number of trucks on the Cross Bronx Expressway. Given the concerns raised, the project team decided to include this tolling scenario formally in the environmental assessment. With respect to local intersections, again, there are beneficial effects and adverse effects where mitigation is required. Specifically, most intersections would experience decreases in delay. Tolling scenarios D, E, and F, the high credit scenarios, have four out of 102 intersections that experience adverse effects in the modeling in the form of increased delay at certain times. And you can see them here on the right. Project sponsors will monitor those intersections where adverse effects are identified and implement appropriate signal timing adjustments to mitigate the effect per New York City Department of Transportation's normal practice. In terms of transit, we found beneficial effects and some adverse effects where mitigation is required. With respect to beneficial effects, reduced roadway congestion would result in reliable, faster bus trips. There is an increase in transit ridership of 1% to 2% system-wide for travel to and from the Manhattan Central Business District, but no adverse effects from increased ridership on any lines or transit stations. We do see that some scenarios increase ridership could adversely affect passenger flows at specific stairs or escalators, what we refer to as station elements. With respect to mitigation, in tolling scenarios E and F, TBTA will coordinate with New Jersey Transit and the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey to implement a monitoring plan with specific thresholds for pedestrian volumes on a specific station stair in Hoboken Terminal. If the thresholds are reached, TBTA will coordinate with these agencies to implement signage and wayfinding. In all the tolling scenarios, TBTA will coordinate with MTA's New York City Transit to implement monitoring plans with specific thresholds at the locations bulleted here. At 42nd Street and Times Square, there's a specific stair affected, and if the threshold is reached, the center handrail will be removed and the riser will be adjusted. At Union Square Subway Station and Flushing and Main Street Station, there are two escalators, one in each, that could be affected. If the thresholds are reached, we would increase escalator speeds. And at Court Square, there's a stair affected. If the threshold is reached, we would construct a new stair to increase capacity. With respect to pedestrians and bicycles, the EA found that increases in passengers at transit hubs would have no adverse effects. It would be some increases in bicycle trips overall and near the transit hubs, but again, no adverse effects. Outside the Manhattan Central Business District, increased transit usage at individual stations would not adversely affect pedestrian conditions on nearby sidewalks, crosswalks, or corners. But within the Manhattan Central Business District, there are two crosswalks and one sidewalk that would be adversely affected. You can see here on the right, with the red lines, that they occur near on 8th Avenue, near West 32nd Street and 7th Avenue, and on West 34th Street and Avenue of the Americas. For mitigation, the project sponsors will implement a monitoring plan with threshold for action. If the threshold is reached, pedestrian space would be increased and obstructions will be removed or relocated. With respect to parking and to social conditions, specifically population characteristics and neighborhood character, we found either beneficial effects or no adverse effects. With respect to social conditions, improvement in travel time and safety, reduced vehicle operating costs, and reduced emissions would occur from the project. There would be no adverse effects on neighborhood character or access, travel to employment within the Manhattan Central Business District or reverse commuting traffic patterns on local streets or community facilities and services. With respect to parking, the study found a reduction in parking demand within the Manhattan Central Business District, an increased parking demand at subway and commuter rail stations and park and ride facilities outside of the Manhattan 
central business district. But the increase at any individual location would not be large enough to result in an adverse effect from the project. Economic conditions found increased productivity as well as safety improvements. There were no adverse effects to any particular industry or occupational category in the Manhattan Central Business District. Depending on the tolling scenario, the toll could reduce taxi and for higher vehicle revenues in the Manhattan Central Business District. While the industry would remain economically viable overall, individual drivers could be adversely affected. And this is dealt with a little bit later in the presentation. In terms of energy and noise, again, there are beneficial effects and no adverse effects. With respect to energy, the region would benefit from reductions in regional energy consumption as a result of reductions in the vehicle miles traveled. In terms of noise, 102 intersections were assessed and all the crossings into the Manhattan Central Business District. The study found imperceptible increases or decreases in noise levels resulting from changes in traffic volumes. With respect to air quality, the environmental assessment found that regionally air pollutants would be reduced, including precursors to greenhouse gases. There would be no local exceedances of air quality standards. Recognizing that air quality is of great concern to many constituents, we have several enhancements, though there were no local exceedances of those standards. New York City Department of Transportation will coordinate to expand the New York City Community Air Survey Network of air quality monitors. This will be supplemented by a small number of real-time monitors for particulate matter. Also, based on feedback during outreach for the project, MTA will prioritize Kingsbridge and Gun Hill bus depots, both located in and serving primarily environmental justice communities in Upper Manhattan and the Bronx when electric buses are received in MTA's next major procurement of battery electric buses. In terms of environmental justice, the study did find adverse effects where mitigation is required. The map to the right shows the communities that are environmental justice communities throughout the region. They are widespread and as shown earlier, in some cases, certain EJ communities will benefit directly from this project. However, the project would have the potential for disproportionately high and adverse effects on low-income drivers who do not have an alternative transportation mode for reaching the Manhattan Central Business District, and on taxi and for higher vehicle drivers in New York City, many of whom identify as part of an environmental justice population. This adverse effect occurs specifically in tolling scenarios that toll their vehicles more than once per day. We have a number of mitigation for low-income drivers, which you can see here on the left. There will be a tax credit for central business district tolls paid by residents of the Manhattan Central Business District, whose New York adjusted gross income for the taxable year is less than 60,000. CBTA will coordinate with New York State Department of Taxation and Finance to ensure availability of documentation needed for drivers eligible for the credit. CBTA will also post information related to the tax credit on the project website with links to the New York State Department of Taxation and Finance website to guide eligible drivers to information on claiming the credit. TBTA will also eliminate the $10 refundable deposit required for EasyPass customers with no credit card linked to their account. It will increase promotion of existing EasyPass payment and plan options, and will work with MTA to increase outreach and education on eligibility for existing discounted transit fare products and programs. The project sponsors will establish an environmental justice community group that will meet on a biannual basis with the first meeting six months after project implementation to share updated data and analysis and hear about potential concerns. For effects on taxi and FHV drivers, the project sponsors will work with appropriate city and state agencies so that when passengers are present in the vehicles, the passengers will pay the toll rather than the driver. Again, these mitigations would be for New York City taxi and FHV drivers if a tolling scenario is implemented with tolls of more than once per day for their vehicles. TBTA will work with MTA New York City Transit to institute an employment resource coordination program to connect drivers experiencing job insecurity with a direct pathway to licensing, training, and job placement with MTA or its affiliated vendors at no cost to the drivers. For those who may not want a commercial driver's license, TBTA will coordinate with MTA New York City Transit 
to submit a request to the Federal Transit Administration for a pilot program that will help increase eligibility of taxi and FHV drivers to use their vehicles to provide paratransit trips. And MTA's New York City Transit will implement this program if approved. With respect to construction effects, no adverse effects were found. Construction would consist of replacement of existing poles or installation of new poles and mast arms, excavation and construction of foundations, placement of new support poles or structures, attachment of tolling system equipment, and restoration of the roadway, sidewalk, or ground surface. The construction would occur on streets and sidewalks and take approximately one to two weeks per location. During this time, there would be temporary disruptions to traffic and pedestrian patterns and temporary noise disruptions at nearby land uses such as residences and businesses. The project sponsors would require the contractor to develop and comply with plans and procedures to minimize construction effects. With respect to visual resources, there were also no adverse effects. Infrastructure is similar in form to streetlight poles, sign poles, or similar structures already in use throughout New York City. Signage is similar in size and character to signs already present, and the color would match existing light pole colors. On the bottom right, there's a rendering of tolling system equipment that would be placed on existing infrastructure. Again, as noted earlier, the tolling equipment is clustered into those single enclosures to reduce visual impact. And cameras would use infrared illumination at night, so there would be no visible light needed. The project would have a neutral effect on viewer groups and no adverse effect on visual resources. With respect to Section 4F, a de minimis impact is one that, after taking into account any measures to minimize harm, results in either a Section 106 finding of no adverse effect or no historic properties affected on a historic property, or a determination that the project would not adversely affect the activities, features, or attributes qualifying a park, recreation area, or refuge for protection under Section 4F. Central Park in the High Line have the potential for a de minimis use. Federal Highway Administration is soliciting input from the public on the effects of installing equipment and signs within and on these properties. Signage and four replacement poles with tolling technology would be installed in Central Park. Tolling technology equipment would be added to the underneath of the existing structure of the High Line. You can see some of the renderings at the bottom here. With respect to the findings, the Central Business District tolling alternative does not result in adverse effects pursuant to Section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act, and it does not adversely affect the activities, features, or attributes that qualify the resource for protection under Section 4F. Federal Highway Administration has concurrence on a proposed finding from officials with jurisdiction over Central Park and the High Line, and will consider public input on its proposed finding received during this public review of the environmental assessments. There were two final additional enhancements I would like to mention, and again, they were in response to outreach during the early outreach period. First, the project sponsors are committed to ongoing data collection and reporting on the potential effects of the project. Data will be collected in advance and after implementation, and a formal report will be issued one year after implementation, and then every two years thereafter. The reporting website will make data analysis and visualizations available in open data format to the greatest extent possible, with updates provided on at least a biannual basis as data becomes available and analysis is completed. Again, through our conversations and public outreach and particularly with environmental justice communities, we are also committed to prioritizing equity in bus service improvements. New York City's buses serve a greater share of low income minority households than other modes, including subways. MTA developed a new approach that combines considerations of equity and air quality to identify equity priority areas, which are then used to target improvements and investments to promote equity and access to opportunities in transit-dependent, historically marginalized, and underserved areas. Information on our early public outreach is here on the left. During that period, we held 10 virtual public outreach meetings, as well as nine environmental justice outreach meetings. We had three meetings of the Environmental Justice Technical Advisory Group and two meetings of the Environmental Justice Stakeholder Working Group. During the 19 public outreach and EJ outreach meetings, we had over 1,000 participants registered and nearly 400 speakers. All of the sessions were left on our project website and people could access them through YouTube. 
To date, we've had over 14,000 views and we've received over 7,300 comments. Our current public outreach sessions will include six public hearings starting on Thursday, August 25th and running through Wednesday, August 31st. We will also have another meeting of the Environmental Justice Stakeholder Working Group and another meeting of the Environmental Justice Technical Advisory Group. With respect to schedule, this shows where we currently are. We did our early public outreach in 2021 and early 2022. We prepared the environmental assessment. We've notified agencies and organizations and individuals of the environmental assessment's availability. And we're now in the midst in orange here of public review and comment on the environmental assessment. After the formal comment period closes, there will be a determination whether the action, in this case, the tolling, will result in significant effects. Ultimately, we're expecting that in early 2023, Federal Highway Administration will issue a decision document. If adverse effects are not significant or can be mitigated below significant levels, FHWA would issue a FONSI, a finding of no significant impact. If there are significant effects that cannot be mitigated, then an environmental impact statement or EIS would be required. As noted, our public comment period is open until September 9th of 2022. If you'd like to submit written comments, you may do so in the following ways, through our project website, by email, mail, phone, or fax, or to the Federal Highway Administration by email or mail. All of this information is also available on our website and the information on the project website, email, mail, phone, and fax for MTA bridges and tunnels is also in the environmental assessment. In addition, formal oral comments can be made at the public hearings, as many of you are doing today. They will be recorded by the stenographer. Thank you again for attending this public hearing to learn more about the environmental assessment for the Central Business District Tolling Program. And now, we look forward to hearing from you. We encourage anyone joining via Zoom or live stream to take a short survey using the QR code or link currently being displayed. The link can also be found in the chat section of the Zoom. We are gathering public comment today on the environmental assessment for the Central Business District Tolling Program. Comments will be recorded, indexed, and responded to as part of the environmental assessment process. There are 391 speakers signed up to speak today. Each speaker is limited to three minutes. At the two and a half minute mark, the clock will turn red and you will hear a beep notifying you that you have 30 seconds remaining. We ask that the speakers keep their remarks to the three minute time frame out of respect for all other speakers. We will be calling speakers in the order they signed up, but anyone who wishes to speak will have an opportunity. Due to the volume of speakers, there may be extended wait times to speak. Comments submitted by mail, phone, email, online form, or verbally at a hearing will be considered equally and carry the same weight. If you have joined the Zoom under a name that is different from the one you used when you signed up to speak, or if you did not sign up to speak but would like to speak, please identify yourself in the Q&A function. You may, you may also request to, to speak anonymously. If this is your preference, please indicate this in the Q&A function and we will provide you with further instructions. Please note that comments on the Central Business District tolling program are not being received via the Q&A function, and comments submitted in that fashion will not be part of the hearing record. When you are called on to speak, there will be a brief transition on your screen before you will be able to unmute and enable your camera. Please make sure that once your screen updates, your camera and your microphone are enabled. Before beginning your remarks, if you do not wish to use your camera, you do not have to do so. You will not be able to unmute or enable or enable your camera until it's your turn to speak. Please remain patient until then. In the event you miss your name being called, we will call you again after all other speakers in attendance have been called the first time. As a reminder, this hearing is being live streamed and recorded and will be available publicly on our YouTube channel and on our project website at mta.info slash cbdtp. Zonographers are present and will create a written record of this hearing. By attending this virtual hearing, you consent to be recorded.
We will now begin the public comment portion of today's hearing. Our first speaker is Senator Anna Kaplan, followed by Congresswoman Nicole Maliotakis. Senator McCown, I want to thank you for this opportunity. When we set out to enact congestion pricing in 2019, we were trying to address chronic problems impacting our region, traffic, and the lack of investment in our public transit. Unfortunately, the pandemic has only made these problems worse, straining finances at the MTA and putting new investments in the Long Island Railroad at risk. So it's important that we do this right so that our region can benefit from new investment with the lowest cost to Long Islanders. The promised 10% proceeds for the Long Island Railroad, estimated at 100 million per year, will allow for transformative investment to take place in our local infrastructure, like the purchase of desperately needed new train cars and overall improvements to service and reliability for Long Island commuters. Importantly, it allows this investment to take place without hiking rates on Long Island commuters who take the train into the city. This money must be protected for Long Island and must be used exclusively for the benefit of Long Island Railroad riders. And I will not accept any program that does not fulfill this promise. Additionally, in setting toll prices and exemptions, there must be regional fairness if this program is going to succeed. To succeed. There can only be, there can be no reference given to New York City or New Jersey residents that aren't also given to the suburban Long Island residents, carving out certain people from responsibility while shifting the burden to others is unfair. And I will not support a program that mistreats Long Island residents and commuters. Ultimately, the tolling plan that should be enacted is the one that has the lowest out-of-pocket costs for residents who choose to drive into the city while still hitting the targets needed for investment in Long Island's infrastructure. This program stands to be a huge win for our region, $1 billion invested annually in our mass transit and our subways. But it must be reasonable for residents who are still struggling themselves due to, to higher costs on everyday items. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Congresswoman Nicole Maliotakis, followed by New York State Assembly Member Mike Lawler. Uh, good evening, everyone. Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Uh, I want to thank you for putting together this comment period. Um, but I do believe that this uh, program is being jammed down the throats of the people that I represent and all New Yorkers. Um, and I think that there's more time and transparency that is needed to ensure that the consequences of this program are understood before its implementation. Uh, I understand that you guys did a shortcut here in terms of environmental impact. And uh, I believe that it needs to be a full, thorough environmental impact study um, and also an economic impact study to understand the consequences of what this will mean and the burden that it will place on our business community, on our residents, and on tourism. New York City is just getting back on its feet following the COVID pandemic. We are trying to get more people to come to our city. Um, and I think that this is going to have a detrimental impact on that. And I think those consequences need to be understood, considering that this is the first in the nation type program. Also, as it relates to congestion in our city center. And I understand your goal of wanting to uh, reduce congestion, 
But really, this is also about revenue, let's be honest, right? There's always been this uh, war on cars approach, but there's always also been a need by the MTA to get more resources and revenue. I just feel that we need to pause here so it doesn't have an impact on the other the constituencies that we represent. I have a very toll sensitive community representing Staten Island. As you know, we're the only borough that has to pay a toll to connect to the rest of the city. And I fear that this will lead to my constituents being double tolled. And no one should have to pay a $23 fee to, ha to connect to another borough in the city in which they live. And in terms of congestion, uh, if you look at what occurred in London, the congestion just shifted. So I know uh, my colleagues have brought up concerns about pollution in other areas. I mean, this is going to also just shift that burden to, you know, whether it's the Bronx, whether it's Manhattan above 60th Street, whether it's downtown Brooklyn. And we need to understand the entire picture before we just jam this through. Now, I was very proud to support the bipartisan infrastructure package because I understand that the MTA does need revenue um, for important capital projects to hopefully expand uh, its options to transportation com uh, deprived communities like mine. I'd rather have you look at those resources and opportunities for matching grant programs um, and understand that communities like mine, Staten Island, Southern Brooklyn, we lack transportation options. And so a lot of people do rely on their cars. Let's get the city subways under control. Let's make them safe. Let's make sure people are not turnstile jumping or fair evading. Uh, and that should be the first step uh, to, to try to satisfy the fiscal needs of the MTA. And I thank you for your time. Thank you. Our next speaker is New York State Assemblymember Mike Lawler, followed by Councilmember Joseph Borelli. Well, good evening. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak with you tonight. Um, I think the uh, hearing certainly was informative and I appreciate the opportunity to speak. Uh, I represent Rockland County. And Rockland County is the only county in the MTA region that has a value gap. We pay 50 million more in taxes to the MTA than services we receive. It's totally unacceptable. Congestion pricing is nothing more than a money grab. Uh, this has been a, a plan to tax suburban commuters. In Rockland County, we do not have a one seat ride. Express rail service has been limited. The MTA even threatened to eliminate it during the pandemic totally unacceptable. And now what you're proposing is to tax Rockland County residents at $23 a hit for coming into lower Manhattan to go to work. That's cops, that's firefighters, first responders. Um, it's totally insane. We are forced to cross it over the Tappan Zee Bridge, the George Washington Bridge, or go through the Holland or Lincoln tunnels to get into the city. We do not have adequate mass transit service. And yet we're expected to pay for your bloated and out of control agency. The MTA is the worst run authority in the country, period. You guys borrow billions of dollars every year. You're given billions of dollars by the state. You were given billions in a federal bailout. And now you wanna tax New York state suburban commuters and New Jersey commuters and Connecticut commuters, and you wanna tax them at about $6,000 a year, in addition to the tolls they already pay. And we all know in Rockland County, there is not gonna be one ounce of investment that comes towards upgrading our rail service, that comes towards upgrading our ability to get a one seat ride, that comes towards upgrading our ability for our commuters to get into Manhattan to work. So, I am totally opposed to this uh, plan. I have put a bill in, to, in the state legislature to repeal it. Uh, it should be repealed in full. Uh, should I be a member of Congress next year, I will work to end this program in its entirety. It has never worked wherever it has been implemented around the world. And for this to be put forward as a, a plan, uh, knowing full well what you are all attempting to do, which is to just take more money and invest it in New York City and pay for your operations because it has been so poorly managed for over 30 years. So 
I, at a time with inflation being at a 40 year high, gas prices hovering around $5 a gallon, taxes being through the roof, this plan needs to be dead on arrival. Please conclude your remarks. Thank you. Our next speaker is council member Joseph Borelli, followed by Rosalind Carter. Our next speaker is Rosalind Carter, followed by Beatrice Bofill. Rosalind, you may unmute yourself and begin your remarks. Okay, sorry about that. Good evening, my name is Rosalind Clay Carter. I currently serve on the Permanent Citizens Advisory Committee to the MTA and the Metro North Railroad Commuter Council. We already knew that congestion pricing will re reduce traffic, improve air quality, and help fight climate change. More importantly, the data and projections in the environmental as assessment show that the vast majority of people who enter Manhattan below 60th Street do so using public transit. Given our mass transit system that permits one to board a train in the northernmost section of the Bronx, and travel all the way to Coney Island on a single swipe of a Metro card or Omnitap, it makes sense to implement a toll on the few who still choose to drive in order to fund tra transit improvements for the millions of riders who depend on the MTA every day. Of course, the reality is that there are still transportation deserts that deny many residents of the outer boroughs ready access to reliably convenient public transportation. These residents should not bear the burden of congestion pricing. There are still questions to be answered and time to develop answers. Congestion pricing should be accompanied by other policies to accomplish these goals, including restrictions or incentives on truck deliveries during peak or off-peak business hours and variable congestion pricing tolls depending on vehicle. We have companies with fully remote staff. Surely these same companies can determine how to receive deliveries in off-peak hours. The transit system design, um, pricing schedules, and service frequency must be reimagined based on the new remote work and lifestyles, not to mention the need for safe and clean transit vehicles and stations to attract riders and increase revenue. Congestion can be further improved by trucks not being double parked for deliveries and blocking streets and bus lanes. I recognize these are not easy solutions, but they do warrant research and exploration as you impl implement congestion pricing. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Beatriz Bofill, followed by Michael Smith. Our next speaker is Michael Smith, followed by Philippe Castillo. Our next speaker is Philippe Castillo, followed by Jonathan Peterson. Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for providing this panel. Thanks for the panelists. Thanks for um, the elected public officials who made um, their time available to speak on the matter. Uh, I just want to uh, share my resounding support for uh, any sort of congestion pricing. Um, I think that this plan will be able to save lives by decreasing the levels of traffic violence currently in on our streets, um, streets that are um, uh, belong to the public and belong to all of us. And uh, when private vehicles come into these streets, uh, they occupy space that uh, other other vehicles cannot occupy, other pedestrians cannot occupy. 
Um, as you showed in your environmental assessment, uh, more than 80% of people come into the district uh, via transit. Uh, the people who remain in private vehicles should pay their fair share. Uh, they make um, the, the rest of us, uh, there are externalities to, to driving a car, parking it in, low, in Manhattan. So I, I commend uh, the panel and uh, the Department of Transportation for putting together this plan. Uh, I thank everybody for taking the time to listen to our concerns as there may be uh, further modifications that need to be made so that we can ensure that this is the most equal and the most um, beneficial to everybody. Um, thanks for everything. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jonathan Peterson, followed by Laura Mount. As a reminder, if you've joined the Zoom under a name that is different from the one you used when you signed up to speak, or if you did not sign up to speak but would like to speak, please identify yourself in the Q&A function. Our next speaker is Laura Mount, followed by Bob Frederick. Laura, you may begin your remarks. Um, I'm a longtime resident of Midtown Manhattan. I came here as a student. And because of the nature of my work, I'm a performing artist. Um, much of my work is in um, outer boroughs, other states, uh, neighboring states. So I commute the reverse commute of most people. And because of the nature of my work, concerts starting at 8 PM and ending sometimes 10, 11 o'clock, um, when I come home, there's no public transportation for me to come that's uh, reasonable coming from uh, faraway places in Connecticut. And I find it um, disturbing that although 80% of the people who are, this is targeting, those of us who live in the zone, who do make maybe $61,000, um, will be taxed in a, that um, maybe we'll have to move I don't know, but I wonder why the consideration hasn't been that all residents who's, who's billing for their easy passes are in the zone are not exempt. Offering a tax credit does not really make lower income residents exempt as they will still have to pay the toll upfront. In addition, this model discriminates against all residents in the zone who will have to pay a toll to get to their homes. Um, I repeat, I think that it's unfair to toll residents returning to their home because they reside in the, in the zone. And if the purpose is to reduce congestion, has any consideration been given to restricting commercial deliveries between the hours of 9 p.m. and 6 a.m.? Um, I understand that many businesses close at 6 or 8 p.m., but it would create jobs and it would create, reduce the congestion if businesses had to receive deliveries overnight as they do in actually other countries. Um, and finally, if the plan is to fix the broken MTA, um, elevators, escalators are added but not maintained, the cars are filthy on the M then when I've taken the LIRR, it's dirty inside. The subway stations are renovated, not maintained. W what is the plan with all this new windfall of money? And how does the anticipated increased budget from tolling mean that anything will actually change? for the MTA because it hasn't changed in the last 30 years. Thank you very much. I hope that consideration will be made to exempt all residents who live in the zone from this unfair tax. Thank you. Our next speaker is Bob Friedrich, followed by council member Joseph Borelli. Bob, you may begin your remarks. 
Hi, my name is Bob Friedrich, and I am president of Glen Oaks Village, which is a co-op in Queens. We are the largest Don and Poppin co-op in New York with 10,000 residents. There are no subway lines in our community and no 24 hour or seven day mass transit services available in our community. Our residents are working class families where both parents work to make ends meet. We are a community with many seniors who often need to travel into Manhattan for medical care. Have you lost sight that we are in very tough economic times and just coming out of a pandemic? The various scenarios you propose are all unaffordable and make the already stressful trip to a doctor in Manhattan even more stressful. Our seniors could be your grandparents and we should not be punishing them or making their trip to a doctor more difficult than it already is. Please try to understand the financial crush of your proposals. In summary, we propose one, exemption from the punitive tolling plan for any resident with a handicap hang tag or a New York City handicap placard that wasn't even shown in any of your scenarios. Number two, congestion pricing tolls should be limited to actual peak congestion hours and not a 24 hour per day as your plans propose and no congestion pricing tolls on weekends and holidays. That was never envisioned when we first started discussing these plans. And three, no congestion pricing tolls or significantly reduced rates on motorcycles, which are a solution to congestion and not a detriment. The revenue loss would be de minimis based on the most recent data available from the MTA. So I'm asking you to take into consideration the fact that we have no mass transit here in Eastern Queens that's available 24 hours a day or on weekends. And we have seniors who need to travel into Manhattan for medical care. Most of them have the hang tags or the New York City placard. You really need to take into consideration those individuals and they should be exempt from the tolling proposals that you have put forth. And by the way, the last thing I just want to mention, subways are now very, very dangerous and people are very concerned about going into them. So please take this into consideration while you study your proposals and implement them. Thank you so much. Appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Our next speaker is council member Joseph Borelli, followed by Gil Franco. Hi, thank you, and I'm sorry for the miscommunication earlier. Um, I want to be extremely brief uh, and to the point. Um, the MTA board is unelected. Uh, the fact that you'll have power to raise revenue without anyone's consent is appalling for anyone who believes in democracy. Uh, I think the real person all of our comments should be addressed to is Governor Kathy Hochul, whose consent is 100% necessary for this to be implemented. The fact that we're modeling this essentially off of London, uh, a city which has actually worse congestion by the but by the the study that you guys, the INRIC study that you guys actually use, uh, should be embarrassing to the governor and everyone in the MTA who suggests it. The fact that your study admits this will have a disproportionate impact on low income and poor residents of this city, meaning that poor and low income people will be more adversely affected than anyone else. That should be embarrassing to Kathy Hochul. The fact that you're going to admittedly add pollution, add cars, add traffic to every single other place in New York City uh, and the surrounding counties uh, without any concern for those people is embarrassing. So I, uh, I, I just want to say that I, I don't think there'll be any change in this process uh, unless the governor is changed or the governor changes her mind. So it's mission critical, I think, that everyone makes uh, that clear uh, in their comments as well. Um, the fact that, that this will have an impact on so many people disproportionately uh, should be something that embarrasses the MTA uh, and those that appoint you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Gil Franco, followed by Luke Sabados. Our next speaker is Luke Sabados, followed by Craig Later, and we are now at the 15th person on our speaker list. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. 
Hi, thanks so much for having uh, this hearing. And uh, it's a pleasure to again uh, testify um, here. Um, I am totally in support of uh, congestion pricing. We need to do it uh, as much mitigation as possible. Um, as somebody who lives in the Bronx and who uh, bikes uh, nearly every day to work, it's uh, astounding how much pollution we have um, and is experienced by, um, by constituents in the city. Um, could, putting a, a price and mitigating the amount of uh, pollution causing vehicles that are entering the city is gonna be a great win uh, for us. I think that the MTA needs to take a step further, needs to explore putting bike highways in the city, such as the Hudson River Greenway, uh, the MTA needs to explore high-speed rail on Long Island. Uh, Long Island, who is going to be benefiting from a lot of these transit improvements, uh, need to seriously uh, accommodate the density uh, by upzoning uh, places right next to the stations, for example, uh, along the Long Island Railroad. Um, the MTA, this is, this is great. We need this immediately, but we can go bigger. Uh, California is moving to ban gas vehicles by 2035. What is New York State doing? Um, uh, this needs to be paired with realistic uh, and immediate um, micro-mobility uh, options, such as bike lanes on the Verrazano Bridge, um, better uh, bike access on the Queensboro Bridge. Um, and um, I want to thank again for, uh, for the time. I also want to flag uh, the concern about air quality across the Cross Bronx Expressway, which is uh, thought to increase in uh, truck pollution. As somebody who works a block from the Cross Bronx, um, that's a really big concern. I think the MTA needs to um, double down on the federal and city a study around capping the Cross Bronx and moving to implement uh, pollution mitigation in uh, uh, heavy transportation uh, vehicles, like trucks. Um, and uh, that's pretty much it. I think we can solve a lot of our problems if the uh, electeds on the call can actually support uh, micromobility uh, options in their neighborhood. Um, thanks so much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Craig Later, followed by Andrew Fine. Craig, you may unmute yourself and begin your remarks. Good evening. I am a transportation planner and co-chair of Community Board 8 Manhattan's Transportation Committee and Congestion Pricing Task Force, though my statement reflects my personal opinions as a supporter of congestion pricing who wants to see a successful implementation that minimizes disruption across the city and specifically to my Upper East Side neighbors, and one that is fair and equitable to vulnerable populations across New York City. My comments are as follows. One, the EA depicts all entry and exit points of the Queensboro Bridge as being told, except for the Manhattan bound upper level. If this becomes the preferred route for those destined north of 60th Street and the untold portions of the FDR Drive, this will likely create adverse impacts on 62nd and 63rd Streets and perhaps further, offsetting some of the benefits that would result from crossing credits granted through at other crossings. Two, the EA concedes that some vulnerable populations would incur additional costs especially those to those accessing medical appointments. This is problematic. If a resident in my community who has a physical disability and is living on a fi fixed income that is just over $60,000 needed to access healthcare facilities in the toll zone, or if someone similar residing in the toll zone is trying to access the East 60s hospital corridor, they would be treated the same as wealthy or able-bodied individuals who enter the toll zone for any non-medical related trip. It would be insensitive to encourage use of the transit system when doing so would be too physically challenging or inconvenient and unwise to further strain an already very expensive paratransit system. 
enrollment-based discounts or exemption programs for congestion pricing, similar to those for reduced fare transit, should be considered and put in place to ensure that healthcare needs of vulnerable populations are not jeopardized. There should also be a sliding scale for income-based tax credits rather than a stark cutoff that would hurt those making just over the $60,000 threshold the most. Three, none of the scenarios depicted in the EA are ideal, but scenario C strikes me as the most balanced approach with one exception. The idea of exempting taxis and capping for higher vehicle charges. The TMRB must find a balanced approach that doesn't penalize drivers <clears throat> of taxis and for hire vehicles for doing their job, but also doesn't promote modal shifts for persons who are aware of this loophole that would result in a passenger paying only the current $2.50 surcharge to enter the congestion zone, a significant savings compared to driving into the zone. Four, although I certainly a group with imp impressive credentials, I fear the appointed TMRB representatives will be making decisions solely from a dollar cents perspective without regard Excuse to- Excuse me, sir, could you please speak a little slower? Impacts to, that may affect specific neighborhoods or groups. And finally, I'm disappointed that the public hearings were scheduled for late August when many people are on vacation. I also believe two weeks between the EA release and the public hearings is not sufficient given the immense nature of the document. I hope you will consider additional and more targeted outreach similar to how the original round of hearings is performed based on geography. Thank you very Please much for the opportunity to comment. Thank you. Our next speaker is Andrew Fine, followed by Jonathan Blair. Our next speaker is Jonathan Blair, followed by Daniel Hernandez. Our next speaker is Kay Cardona, followed by Frank Tufano. Our next speaker is Frank Tufano, followed by Michael Adler. Our next speaker is Michael Adler, followed by Ross Perlin. Our next speaker is Ross Perlin, followed by Silvano Ferrin. Our next speaker is Silvano Ferrin, followed by Pedro Rodriguez. Our next speaker is Pedro Rodriguez, followed by Michael Gentile. Hello, uh, my name is Pedro Rodriguez and I live in Forest Hills, Queens. I grew up in the Bronx uh, since, I was, since I was a child and like all New Yorkers, I have, I have relied heavily on public transportation and the MTA since I was a kid. I depend on it now, just like I did back then. Um, for, to go to the doctors, to go to parks, shopping, visit friends, and everything in between. Um, we need congestion pricing. For congestion pricing. We needed it three years ago, uh, and we need it now even more than ever. Uh, car usage in, in New York in New York City leads to the premature death of 1,400 New Yorkers from pollution alone every year, and about 300 cra from crashes, uh, and those are, those are deaths per year, and then countless lives life-altering injuries every single year. Reducing the, num the number of cars on our streets will not only save countless lives, but it will also help uh, fund the life lifeline of our city, which is the MTA and our transit system. Without it, workers won't be able to get to work, children won't, get, won't be able to get to school, elderly, won't, el elderly New Yorkers won't be able to get to, the, to their doctor appointments, millions of New Yorkers will also be forced to drive even more than they do right now, massively increasing our cost of living as well as increasing our mortality rate. New York will simply not be New York without, a without our transit system. For that reason, we need congestion pricing and we need it now. The MTA's future depends on it, the city's future depends on it, and the future of more than 1,700 New Yorkers every year that die from pollution or car crashes also depends on, depends on it. No more delays, no more exceptions except, except the ones that were required by the law and no more excuses. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Michael Gentile, 
followed by Brooklyn Borough President Antonio Reynoso. Hi there, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Great, thank you for having me. And thank you everyone for setting up this forum. Uh, you mentioned 391 speakers. It's gonna be a long evening for a lot of you. So thank you for uh, everyone who's on the screen who's uh, here today. Uh, and I apologize up front if I'm misstating any facts, I'm sure you'll correct me. Um, but I think in the presentation, you talked about reducing vehicles uh, between five and 10%, the number of vehicles heading in. Uh, but according to the website, the MTA website, we've already achieved that as part of the pandemic. I think we're at 90%. We're at pre-pandemic pre level traffic, and that feels about right. I do drive into Manhattan. I live in Astoria. Um, there's a uh, lot of conversation here about environmental justice, which is certainly important. Uh, California just uh, enacted a law, which perhaps in the future New York will as well, uh, where we're switching to electric cars. So perhaps you know down the road, the pollution issue will be mitigated by that. But I also I want to talk about sort of economic and social justice as well. And some other folks have mentioned this. This is ultimately disproportionately going to affect elderly, disabled, and their caretakers. Um, as a caretaker myself, I can speak to that. Many of these folks cannot or will not take public transportation to get to medical appointments or to their rehab. Um, this is also going to impact many small businesses or a number of parking garages throughout Manhattan uh, that rely on folks from the outer boroughs to come in, and they will also disproportionately be impacted. Um, I do understand that a part of this move is to get people to public transportation. I also use public trans transportation, but that continues to be unsafe, uh, even more so during the pandemic. So the timing here just seems a bit not, not the best. Um, just doing simple math, right? If folks take a Qu Queens Midtown tunnel, then they drive into Manhattan, then they park at a garage, you're looking at over a 50 to $75 experience, probably even further, just to get into Manhattan. There's also the element here of toll creep. Uh, you've heard it already with some folks talking about uh, disproportionate impact to 60th Street and above. So we start in Midtown. Uh, then do we have another toll that affects Uptown? Do we then look at the outer boroughs? Is there then a toll from Long Islanders to get into the borough? So I think once you set up a technology like this and sort of have it working, uh, there's always that, that uh, possibility for toll creep. And I do appreciate the benefit of, of of protecting those who make under 60,000 a year. But as anyone who lives in New York City can attest, uh, folks who make more than that, you know, uh, it, it's still every penny counts. So that element of economic justice um, should also be considered. So um, ultimately our taxes and current tolls should be subsidizing uh, uh, all of the things that are intended to be subsidized here. So perhaps we can manage that better. So thank you all for your time. Be well, be safe. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Brooklyn Borough President Antonio Reynoso, followed by Corey Birak. Hello. I hope you can all hear me. Yes, uh, we can. Thank you so much. Um, first, I just want to thank the representatives that are on today. Um, thank you for your work and your dedication that you will be having today. So to the FHWA, the MTA, and the state and city DOT, thank you so much. Um, also, thank you for the opportunity to speak today in support of the Central Business District Tolling Program, also known as congestion pricing. The policy has been a long time coming, more than 15 years, in fact, and I'm very happy to see it finally moving forward. Implementation of this program is even more dire now with car ownership in New York City up over 200% due to the pandemic and the MTA facing a fiscal cliff as, uh, as soon as 2024 if we fail to act. In Brooklyn, we've seen the harmful impacts of growing congestion on the economy and especially on street safety and local air quality. Brook go to school and only two to 5% of New York City residents drive a car into the central business district. And drivers are, on average, significantly wealthier than other car-owning New Yorkers. For this reason, it is crucial that the plan move ahead with a fee structure that provides no exemptions or as few exemptions as possible. The fairest approach for drivers is a very broad base and a comparatively low toll rate that does not disproportionately burden non-exempt drivers. If we are to seriously take on the responsibilities of improving public health and addressing the reality of climate change, we need to remove as many cars from our streets as possible. This, is, this will only be achieved through applying the fewest exemptions, 
Additionally, the fee structure should be equalized across the crossings to eliminate toll shopping. This behavior will only exacerbate the issues we are trying to solve. And while one of the most important outcomes of implementing congestion pricing is decreasing air pollution across our city, I recognize that the environmental assessment identifies potential additional increases in truck emissions for our South Bronx neighbors with no mitigation required. We must ensure that the proposed enhancements are sufficient to improve air quality for these residents as they have already battled poor air quality, high asthma rates, and other associated environmental justice issues for decades. In summary, for our city to continue to function, we must get people out of their cars and back into reliable public transportation. Congestion pricing is set to be a win-win-win for the city, region's economy, transit system, traffic reduction efforts, and overall safety and quality of life for Brooklynites and all New Yorkers. Thank you again for your time, and I look forward to continuing this conversation. Uh, given the quick turnaround and the late summer schedule of these hearings, I hope that the Traffic Mobility Review Board will consider conducting more outreach and holding these hearings in the fall, specifically on the proposed pricing structures, so that more New Yorkers will have the chance to have their voices heard. Thank you again, and please don't forget to spread love. It's the Brooklyn way. Peace. Thank you. Our next speaker is Corey Birak, followed by Tommy Rukusik. Corey, you may begin your remarks. Okay, just gotta choose a different background. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, by every measure, the regressive, inequitable, unfair, and unsustainable congestion tax fails on every level. And despite its name, it achieves nothing of any consequence with relieving congestion. It even falls short of its claims concerning the environment. Everyone should recognize the need to build and maintain an effective public transit system serving 22.2 million residents in the largest and most economically significant metropolitan region in the US with more than 10 million, million jobs. The issue should be number one, resources, and number two, impacts of any resource plan. Here's some misguided folks got into their heads a need to eliminate passenger cars in Manhattan, mostly south of 60th Street, by imposing a tax on entry that effectively eliminates all but the uber wealthy if this toll tax scheme that requires a net revenue ultimately prevails. And it, it's first weakness, a total failure to consider alternative revenue sources that likely better meet the funding goals of the program, thus improve public transit and thus induce those relying on cars to opt to use transit. Almost as important from an environmental justice perspective, the entire project fails to resource improvements in transit deserts. Additionally, the adverse effects on low income drivers associated with the cost of any new toll tax scheme would constitute a disproportionately high and in adverse impact. In New York City, the tax scheme imposes displacement as drivers seek parking outside the zone in Manhattan's Upper West Side and East Sides and neighborhoods near transit in Brooklyn, Queens, and the Bronx. No capacity exists to absorb displaced cars or new transit riders at any of these locations. The parents of the congestion tax offered no improvements to transit deserts in Brooklyn and Queens. Consumers in the zone who may opt to drive outside the zone likely face increased costs of consumer goods they receive instead through delivery. Further, the tax scheme proposes no measures that address asthma where it impacts most. Air pollution hotspots, including the South Bronx, East Harlem, South Jamaica, and bedford Stuy. Long Island working class drivers and small businesses will get no benefits and will be burdened with yet another senseless cost scheme. It ignores most congestion in the zone, which results from a predominance of app-based for higher vehicles. Um, the rest of my testimony can be found at keepnycfree.com and I will submit it, but we have a list of revenues and additionally 13 points that, uh, that also speak to this issue. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Tommy Rukavich, followed by Jennifer Beretta. Our next speaker is Jennifer Beretta, followed by Marcos Pelozo. Our next speaker is Marcos Pelozo, 
followed by Gilda Aronson. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to speak. Uh, some folks say that CBD tolling is strictly a money grab affecting the residents of the New York metro area. I believe this is obviously true and undeniable. I believe if the MD MTA were given a trillion dollars, they would find a way to spend it, and then they would say they need more. There are two primary reasons that I believe this is a money grab for the bloated MTA. Firstly, and most importantly, is that the data used to come up with the reasons to tell us this tolling is critically needed is very old. That data uh, regarding environmental impact was gathered a very, very long time ago. The environmental data was gathered years before COVID when workers would have to go to their workplaces in person. Fewer people go to their workplaces now. There are fewer cars in New York City today, as a prior speaker recently mentioned. Lower congestion is not just because of changes in commuting habits, but also because driving into Manhattan and other boroughs is already extremely challenging to, due to the lack of lanes, uh, lack of uh, parking, people are just not driving into Manhattan unless they absolutely have to. Uh, second reason, this is obviously a money grab, is that you state that the environment will be helped by drivers paying a lot of money to enter the CBD zone. Uh, obviously, this will simply move a perceived environmental problem to the periphery of the CBD zone. Among others, this would this will harm Harlem, Washington Heights, Western Queens, the Bronx, Staten Island, and parts of uh, Eastern New Jersey across from Manhattan. So there will so there will be a lot of impact to those in the poorer communities. I hope you guys have thought that out. I know that sometimes there are unintended consequences to very large. Uh, changes. This is going to end up uh, making huge impacts to, to the poor communities. Uh, that, that's all I have to say. Thank you so much for this opportunity to speak. Thank you. We'll now move on to the 31st person on the list, Gilda Aronson, followed by Anderson Plackman. Our next speaker is Anderson Blackman, followed by Fred English. Our next speaker is Fred English, followed by Nicole Nurse. Our ne next speaker is Nicole Nurse, followed by Isaac Perez. Our next speaker is Isaac Perez, followed by Joshua Beinstock. Our next speaker is Joshua Beinstock, followed by Michael Murray. Our next speaker is Michael Murray, followed by Isabella Reeking. Our next speaker is Isabella Reeking followed by Anthony Nichols. Our next speaker is Anthony Nichols, followed by Vladimir Malinsky. Our next speaker is Vladimir Malinsky, followed by Dan Rodriguez. Our next speaker is Dan Rodriguez, followed by Henry Kim. Yep. 
please deliver your remarks. On before you as a representative of Coach USA, its subsidiaries and the Bus Association of New Jersey, of which I am president. Thank you for the opportunity to state our position on the Central Business District Tolling Program. Coach USA looks forward to the opportunity to separately comment on the environmental assessment for the program, which as will be made clear in our comments, Coach USA believes inadequately addresses the central issue I'm here to speak about today. The need to exempt the reliable, affordable intercity bus service provided by Coach USA carriers from congestion tolling. Coach USA operates more than 25 bus carriers in North America that operate scheduled bus routes, motor coach tours, airport shuttles, and city sightseeing tours. The bus routes operated by Coach USA subsidiaries include private passenger service as well as, well as federally funded public transit service, including throughout New York. Thus, while a public carrier, a private carrier, we are fundamentally intertwined with public transit bus service in the New York area. One of our carriers is notably Megabus. Since its inception in April 2006, Megabus is one of the leading intercity motor coach services with more than 55 million customers. Megabus has 196 daily routes serving four stops in Manhattan. Megabus's relationship with Manhattan is vital to this service and most importantly to our passengers who rely on an economical and efficient transportation to New York metropolitan area. I want to stress and make clear from the start that we value the support, the needs to address the New York traffic congestion concerns at issue here today. As such, we provide public transportation to over 73,000 passengers every day and over 26 million a year. That's 26 million cars we take off Manhattan streets. Therefore, we believe that the MTA Traffic Mobility Review Board and the Federal Highway Administration should not approve any congestion tolling that applies to buses. While currently several proposed tolling scenarios in the environmental assessment include exemptions for buses, other proposals do not. Moreover, the assessment also does not clearly distinguish between New Jersey transit buses and private operated buses serving New Jersey transit routes. It is where, why we seek that any and all bus operators should be expressly exempt from all tolling requirements imposed by the program. Don't get me wrong. There is a clear need to impose tolls on passenger cars as opposed to buses that enter Manhattan below 60th Street. The current traffic created by passenger cars and their emissions is bad for quality of life, public health, and adverse to businesses. However, Please conclude your remarks. And the public interest served by buses should not be penalized through congestion tolls. Ridership on our buses has, as I mentioned, removes 26 million passenger Thank cars you. from Manhattan streets every year. By removing Thank these you. cars, we have already reduced the carbon footprint. Thank you. Our next speaker is Henry Kim, followed by Daniel Geary. Our next speaker is Daniel Geary, followed by Gregory Bishop. Our next speaker is Gregory Bishop, followed by Sonia Figueroa. Our next speaker is Sonia Figueroa, followed by Colette Vogel. Our next speaker is Colette Vogel, followed by Suzette McLeod. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi, so I live in the uh, congestion zone in the East 30s. I'm a middle-class family with two children here. Um, I don't have access to the Second Avenue subway to take my kids to all of their after-school activities. So I can't use public transportation to go from 30th Street all the way to 90th Street and get them there in the time that they need to. 
So for you guys to tell me there's going to be $23 every day that I need to take my car out of my driveway is outrageous. And I can't believe that this is even being discussed. I mean, how would you feel if they said to everyone in the boroughs, it's $23 to move your car out of your driveway? I'm sure if that happened, we wouldn't be having this discussion. If you want to stop the congestion in the Manhattan, then you need to get rid of all of the restaurant shanties, all of the stupid bike docking systems that are around the most inconvenient areas around the midtown tunnels and the bridges. I'm a cyclist and it's not safe to cycle in Manhattan. Plus I can't take a bike and take my kids to where they need to be. It is ridiculous and outrageous. You also have a congested pricing on all the taxis. If I'm correct, it's $2.50 for every person that takes a, a, takes a taxi ride or an Uber. What has the MTA done with that money? They've wasted it. They've done nothing with it. They just It's a money grab, as someone earlier said. Um, I, the only way to really stop this fee, to stop this whole process, is to elect Zeldin. We need to get Hotchell out and get a Republican in here that can really get us back to where we need to be. Okay, all these businesses in the area here are gonna go out of business. I, I shop here, I buy things here. All your deliveries, who do you think is gonna pay for that? The consumer, the people that use it in the area. So if you're gonna go and buy a donut, your donut that's $1 now might, might be $1.50. It's bad enough that we have to spend more on our groceries, but now every delivery is gonna be passed on the, to the consumers in the congestion zone, and it's just not fair. So I think this is a horrible idea. I believe that your, your idea of um, this environmental impact, I think is flawed. I don't think it's even correct. I think you're just moving the climate change area. So you might not have a little bit of uh, climate area in the, the zone, but it's gonna be moved elsewhere. So this whole thing is a poorly planned situation and people like me are all gonna move out of Manhattan and the people who live here are not even gonna be able to sell their apartments if you continue on this journey. And it's gonna be the death of lower Manhattan, say goodbye. And all the businesses are gonna end up moving out anyway because no one's gonna to wanna to work here. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Suzette McLeod, followed by Israel Kaufman. Our next speaker is Israel Kaufman, followed by Phil Konigsberg. Our next speaker is Phil Konigsberg, followed by Dana Dennis. Okay. Can I start? Okay. Yes, you may. Okay. Hi, my name is Phil Konigsberg. I live in Bay Terrace in North, Northeast Queens. And for over a decade, I've been speaking against congestion pricing from years and years that this has come up before. I'm a member of the disabled community, and I'm also on the board of directors of the Jamaica Estates Volunteer Ambulance Corps. So I'd like if possibly when I'm finished, someone here could address if already that disabled drivers and emergency vehicles are exempt from this congestion pricing. I believe that was established previously and I don't see that listed on, on any of the uh, information so far. Now to my uh, presentation. How do you expect New York metropolitan residents to give up their vehicles and take mass transit when on a daily basis criminal activity is a headline on television, radio, and print and social media? Community, commuters are afraid to ride mass transit. So why does anyone think they will give up their cars and put their health and safety in jeopardy? As a result of congestion pricing, Businesses are going to choose to relocate to the surrounding outer boroughs and New Jersey or be, or be the deciding factor of businesses to leave the entire New York City metro area. This goes against the goal of bringing business back 
to Manhattan after COVID. Traffic and air pollution north of 60th Street in Manhattan and the outer boroughs will significantly be increased by implementing this tax on vehicles entering the central business district. Queens already experiences traffic congestion throughout the day on most major highways. Implementing this tax will only slow traffic movement, which often is moving at a snail's pace in Queens, not just for cars and trucks, but for the local bus and express bus traffic that the congestion pricing policy is encouraged, encouraging commuters to switch to. And let's not forget about the congestion pricing effect on our taxi industry. They are struggling now to make a living. Congestion pricing will have a combined effect of decreasing this vital service and or reducing the number of passengers who will have a surcharge added to their fares. I urge that someone, Governor Hochul, an elected state uh, legislator, as uh, previously Senator uh, Mike Lawyer mentioned, he was going to propose a bill to, ca to cancel. Uh, at this Please point, conclude your remarks. Okay, someone has to step up at this 11th hour and, and put a stop to this before it's too late. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry. Thank you. Our next speaker is our 51st sign up, Dana Dennis, followed by Chris Collins. Our next speaker is Chris Collins, followed by Sharon Lee. Our next speaker is Sharon Lee, followed by Henry Scher. Our next speaker is Henry Scher, followed by Christopher Colon. Our next speaker is Christopher Colon, followed by Cindy Patterson. Our next speaker is Cindy Patterson, followed by Jean Darcel Michelle. Our next speaker is Jean Darcel Michel, followed by Lauren Secular. Our next speaker is Lauren Secular, followed by Chris Doyle. Our next speaker is Chris Doyle, followed by John Chamberlain. Our next speaker is the 60th sign up, John Chamberlain, followed by Howard Babbage. Our next speaker is Howard Babbage, followed by Kat Harley. Yes, hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, sorry, I'm sorry about that. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, I think it's very interesting that both the city's original report, Move New York, and the state's original report, Fix New York, say that the reason for the congestion, the reasons for the congestion are the proliferation of far higher vehicles, lack of enforcement of traffic laws, and construction. Yet we have a program here that does nothing to address those causes. Also, I saw a recent study of the program in place in London that said the program was a total failure and congestion hasn't been addressed at all because it hasn't addressed the true cause of the congestion, which is the proliferation of for higher vehicles. So it seems that the state is saying, we have congestion, we know what the problems are, and we're putting forward a program that does nothing to address those problems. Makes, <laughs> makes a lot of sense. Um, as a matter of fact, this, the, the city's mobility report of 2019 and your own uh, environmental assessment say that the proliferation of uh, the poor higher vehicles have tripled over the past decade. So there's a serious problem right there. Also, in your uh, environmental assessment, you state that the project's purpose is to reduce traffic congestion in the Manhattan CBD in the manner that will generate Revenue for future, transp future transportation improvements. It's funny that you don't say that the project's purpose 
is to reduce congestion, period. You go on to say that to raise money. So I, yeah, I have to tend to agree with Assemblyman Lawler when he says this is a money grab, but to put it a little more nicely, it's a revenue enhancement. Nothing more than that. And I think everybody knows that and you're not fooling anybody by saying it's otherwise. But it seems to be, as, as the governor said, a done deal and it's a fait accompli, so I don't really wanna dwell on that. But what I would really like to focus as a resident of the district, I live, I live in Chelsea and I'm concerned about a carve out or exemptions. Um, the $60,000 uh, cap on income, first of all, it's not clear whether that's household income or individual income. If it's household income, it's ridiculous because two wage earners earning the minimum wage earn over $60,000. So $60,000 is ridiculous. As a matter of fact, Assemblyman Gottfried was going to propose raising that to 100,000, but unfortunately he's retiring. Also, as for the tax credit, I need to know, is that gonna be a refundable tax credit or non-refundable? Because if it's non-refundable, then persons who don't have tax liabilities cannot use a tax credit. If you do not pay state tax, and many people do not pay state tax, the tax credit is useless. So to do it as a non-refundable, or as a non-refundable tax credit would be a waste. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Kat Harley followed by Barack Friedman. Our next speaker is Barack Friedman, followed by Renee Kinsella. Hey everybody, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, well, first of all, thank you to the MTA for uh, having this meeting and giving us opportunity to speak. Uh, I wanna say that I'm a huge supporter of congestion pricing or central business district tolling program. I live in the congestion zone. And honestly, we're, we're drowning here in the congestion zone. Uh, so many people are driving in um, and, and the um, air quality is pretty bad. We have high asthma rates. The noise pollution is terrible. We have the slowest buses in the country. So I'll repeat that again, that's atrocious. We have the slowest buses in the country, and this is uh, serving people who are less uh, wealthy. Uh, we have our deliveries being slowed down by all this congestion. Our deliveries, uh, drivers have to double park with all the externalities of double parking uh, that occurs. Um, this will be a huge help for emergency vehicles, uh, fire trucks, ambulances who need to uh, obviously get to emergencies on time. Um, there's a, a traffic violence epidemic in this city. Uh, we have hundreds of people uh, die every year and get uh, hit, and this will help that. Um, this will fund the subways and buses, uh, which we desperately need. Um, I would only support an exemption that's already in effect for the buses, subways, LIRR, and Metro North. Um, any exemption that applies to um, uh, car drivers must also apply to public transit users. Otherwise, it's unfair and regressive. Uh, I want to thank you for your time. And that's it. Thank you. Our next speaker is Renee Kinsella, followed by Ji Peng Peng. Our next speaker is Ray Peng Peng, followed by Michael Goals. Our next speaker is Michael Goals, followed by David Tenenbaum. Can everybody hear me? Yes, we can, please proceed. All right, so uh, I just wanna go over some history. Uh, I think every single one of us, no matter if you're pro or con against congestion pricing, we can't trust the MTA. I'm just gonna go over some financing and accounting as issued by the NY State Controller. And this has to do with outstanding, outstanding long-term debt. 2010, $25 billion. 2019, $35 billion, increase of 37%. 2021, $40 billion, increase of 13%. Outstanding debt will re reach $47 billion by 2026 could go as high as 57 billion by 2030. And that includes all bonding backed by congestion pricing revenues, 
paid for by the MTA's capital program. And this same report by the NOI controller identified 54 billion that the MTA has yet to be committed to project this date as back as 2010. So 2010, you have $54 billion out there that you haven't even applied yet to projects that are going on. Now, for example, here's something, the Second Avenue subway, one section of it with three stops was initiated, and I'm being generous here, 1972. There needs to be an independent federal audit of the MTA finances before any of this is even considered. New Jersey and the other surrounding areas will not be double taxed for the MTA's fiscal failure. This is a cash grab, as many people have said before, plain and simple. At a time where you're trying to get back people back to the city, you do this, it sounds like it's opposite day. I don't even understand. Even if rail and bus commuters do return to pre-pandemic levels, the systems were already over capacity. Look what happened this week. A stalled train called a 90 plus minute delay at Penn Station. New Jersey Transit, Transit is still only running at 60% capacity. Maybe you should have done it like London did, improve mass transit before you implement, implement congestion pricing. But you can't because you've been made a mess of your own finances over the last 50 years. And we can't expect any different with this poorly conceived program. And the environment, you're just putting pollutants in other places like the Bronx. Places in New Jersey, Lincoln and Holland Tunnel, Fort Lee, George Washington Bridge, congestion? How about all those pedestrian plazas and bike lanes you built? I'll finish. You're using the surrounding communities, downstate, New Jersey, Connecticut, Long Island, as your piggy bank. We are the economic engine and workforce of the community. And if you think that charging, uh, charging trucks that bring in the supplies to the city are a good thing, if you think inflation is bad now, just wait. That gallon of milk, that dozen, dozen eggs, now nah, ain't going to happen. Please Thank conclude you. your remarks. Thank, Thank you. you. Our next speaker is David Tenenbaum, followed by Jaina Lim. Our next speaker is Jaina Lim, followed by Austin Celestin. Our next speaker is Austin Celestin, followed by Michael Gross. Our next speaker, the 70th sign up is Michael Gross followed by Aileen Goldstein. Our next speaker is Aileen Goldstein, followed by Christopher Gomez. Hello. I can hear you, please proceed. Hi, this is just geographic discrimination for Atterboro residents. We pay the same taxes as Manhattanites. You're only addressing the lower income group, but with additional tolls and fees, you're pushing us in the middle class down to the lower class. Why do we get rid of the commuter tax all these years? That could have been used to fund the MTA. And why is tolling 24 seven when there's no congestion overnight and most weekends? I'm gonna use myself as an example. I transit through Manhattan from Queens to reach the Holland Tunnel for work. I go from the Manhattan Bridge through Canal Street for approximately 12 blocks to get to the Holland Tunnel. Why should I be tolled at the same rate as someone who is in the district riding around for the whole day causing congestion? I'm leaving and not part of the congestion. I also do not always come home the same day, so I will be tolled twice. I had four medical procedures in the past few months. I had to be at the hospital at 5.30 a.m. in the CBD. I had general anesthesia and I needed to be accompanied home, which is a hospital rule. There was no way I could have taken public transportation or a for hire vehicle. It would have an economic hardship to have a toll in addition to the garage. I had chemo and radiation a few years ago, weekly and daily. There is no way to afford to go for treatment with additional tolls. World-class hospitals will be out of reach for most New Yorkers. There should be a cap on the number of for hire vehicles and the ones causing the congestion are them as well as restaurant sheds, delivery trucks and double parkers and city bike ranks, racks. All of this only reduces daily vehicle miles within the district 5% and daily, right, um, daily cars entering by 10%. That's a paltry number for a big money grab. How do we know that the MTA will not continue to waste money like the cost overruns on the Oculus and the Second Avenue subway? And Jana Lieber, 
don't keep threatening that the more exemptions and carve outs will cost us more. Some people deserve those exemptions like the handicapped. This is all a farce. You've all decided already what's gonna happen and nothing we say is gonna change the plans. I'm a member of the environmental justice group and you have not addressed anything that was brought up being disabled or motorcycles. This city has world-class museums, theaters, and cultural attractions. We can barely afford to take advantage of them now. With these kind of fees, nobody will be able to come into the city that lives around to take advantage of this. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Christopher Gomez, followed by Maria Del Pilar. Our next speaker is Maria Del Pilar, followed by Jennifer Harvey. Our next speaker is Jennifer Harvey, followed by Michael Dumas. Our next speaker is Michael Dumas, followed by Evan Ferrer. Our next speaker is Evan Ferrer, followed by Ian Robinson. Hello, my name is Evan and I was born and raised on Manhattan Island, specifically Morningside Heights. Besides four years at university, I've lived my entire life on Manhattan Island. Neither of my parents have ever owned a car and neither have I. I took the bus to Corpus Christi Grammar School on 121st Street and I took the one train to Xavier High School on 16th Street. Currently, I work as a CPA for Deloitte Tax. Our offices are headquartered in 30 Rockefeller Plaza in Manhattan Central Business District. I commute to work by subway or bicycle. With that said, I am desperately in favor of congestion pricing. I have lost friends to traffic violence. I have friends that currently ride bicycles for fun and some for work. That is deliveristas that fuel our city's economy. I ride my bicycle and so does my girlfriend. Let me tell you plain and clear, there are too many cars on New York City streets. Congestion pricing is not just another toll and certainly not a tax on the poor. It is a means by which we will fund the future of our infrastructure. It should serve as a stepping stone to a change in the way we fundamentally think about transportation. The socioeconomic benefits of a healthy public transportation system are invaluable. Also, I don't think the loud tinted cars on our streets are all driving to their doctor's office. Cars are currently terrorizing our city streets. Enough with the rhetoric about unsafe subways for the elderly. Are highways any safer? Have you ever seen the madness that occurs on our city roads? Is this really safer for the elderly? Enough is enough, no more excuses, no exemptions and no caps. It's clear where my support lies and so I'll end on this note. It's not fair to New Yorkers that congestion pricing is only to be applied in Manhattan Central Business District. In fact, it should be applied to every one of the five boroughs with the central business district told more heavily than others. Other metropolitan cities have figured it out. It's time for New York to step into the 21st century. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ian Robinson, followed by Alexander Frank. Our next speaker is Alexander Frank, followed by Wendy Pincus. Our next speaker is Wendy Pincus, followed by Erica Levin. Our next speaker, the 80th to sign up is Erica Levin, followed by Felicia Sparkman. Our next speaker is Felicia Sparkman, followed by Eric Martz. Our next speaker is Eric Martz, followed by Quanda Francis. Our next speaker is Quanda Francis, followed by Tensei Andargachu. 
Our next speaker is Tensei Andargachu, followed by James Offalo. Our next speaker is James Offalo, followed by Maritza De Leon. Our next speaker is Maritza De Leon, followed by Dunton Black. Our next speaker is Dunton Black, followed by Chase Pena. Our next speaker is Chase Pena, followed by Tai Lau. Our next speaker is Tai Lau, followed by Christopher Amplo. Our next speaker, the 90th to sign up, is Christopher Amplo, followed by Harmanpreet Singh. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Please proceed. My name is Christopher Amplo. I'm a born and bred New Yorker from Brooklyn. I've lived in Queens. I've lived in Nassau County. And I'm also a small business owner. My main clientele that we service, as we are in the service industry, is that of New York City, with an unusually high rate of those that are in the lower side of Manhattan. I'm adamantly against the idea of congestion pricing as I don't find that it will be a solution to remove the vehicle from the road. Additionally, it will increase the cost of services and goods that are being provided for the residents that you're so desperately attempting to help. A few of the questions that I myself ask when I review this idea is, why do we not limit or reduce the number of four hire vehicles on the road? How will this affect the goods that people do need to purchase that are being brought in through trucks? How will this affect the cost of services, such as just fixing something like a refrigerator or dishwasher, which generally needs to occur during normal business hours as to building rules? Additionally, when it comes to the toll itself, how do we know the limit will be maintained for any extended period of time or whatever the final amount is decided upon? With that, how will the success of the program be measured? Who will be the oversight? Once the program is reviewed and either deemed a success or failure, if it were to be deemed a failure, would it be rolled back? Additionally, and finally, the question I find myself repeatedly asking about the MTA in particular, a service that I use quite frequently to visit clients and uh, travel throughout the New York City area, is why has the fares to the buses and trains not been increased in quite some time, and yet the penalties for people that need or choose to use vehicles is consistently being increased in some form or another, whether it be speed camera, violations, increased registration cost, limited parking, and a number of other things that really do lead me to believe that there is a war on vehicles in New York City. I'm not saying that there isn't a problem with traffic, but I do feel that there may be other solutions such as the uh, EV technology that will be coming out and limiting the amount of four hard vehicles in New York City. Thank you for the opportunity and we appreciate you giving us all the chance to hear our perspective. Thank you. Our next speaker is Harman Preet Singh, followed by Steve Nereen. Our next speaker is Steve Nearin, followed by Brent Bavenzi. Our next speaker is Brent Bavenzi, followed by David Stern. Hi there, uh, my name is Brent Bavenzi. I live in Brooklyn, I work in Manhattan. I grew up in Jersey. I'll go take the train, hike in the Hudson. I'll visit my friends in Westchester in Connecticut. 
we have ample public transit to cross this region, but that transit right now is under threat due to budget shortfalls. And Manhattan is currently choked with cars. People that cross Manhattan through Canal Street to just get to Jersey, just like, it leaves us in a really dangerous position as a pedestrian, as a cyclist. And this program for, for the congestion pricing is a great first step to make this city cleaner and more equitable. And it should happen as soon as possible and with the fewest possible exceptions. Of course, there should be for um, handicapped uh, vehicles. Of course, it should be for emergency vehicles, but not for a police officer that choose, that takes their private car to then drive an emergency vehicle. And we should then use this money to eliminate all the transit deserts in the region and provide everybody in this region with fast, frequent, reliable, and accessible transportation options that serve us seven days a week, not just during, not just Monday through Friday. And this funding source can help a ton for us to achieve that. So we don't need a car to enter Manhattan and we can do more with that space than just have it for these massive highways that, that destroy our neighborhoods and cause our asthma problems. But this is not, and these suggestions are not a, but we have to do these things first and have congestion pricing later. We can do all of this together. This is a yes and. Yes to put congestion pricing, and provide better options. Yes, and let's uh, yes, and let's work on our transportation options. Yes, and let's improve park space. Yes, and let's figure out better ways to get goods into the city without all of these trucks that cause mass amounts of pollution. That is what we can go, that's what we should be focusing on. What can we do with this? From what I've read, I would prefer option D, and I hope that's what we go for. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker is David Stern, followed by Richard Calabro. Our next speaker is Richard Calabro, followed by Frederick Cavassier. Our next speaker is Frederick Cavassier, followed by Lee Berman. Our next speaker is Lee Berman, followed by Tu Hin Khan. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, I'm Lee Berman, district leader from the Lower East Side of Manhattan, a transit desert, and I represent thousands of residents within the Central Business District, many of whom have lived here for generations that will be irreparably and negatively affected by this ridiculous plan. If this ill-conceived and discriminatory plan is approved, an exemption for all residents who live in Lower Manhattan must be granted. Those of us who live here, who, unlike as stated in your environmental assessment, do not have the ability to just pick up and move to outside the zone, should not have to pay an additional tax on top of the taxes and fees we are already forced to pay to live here. The purported credit for those earning under $60,000 will still require them to fork over this tax and then wait to get a refund when they file their income taxes. And if you earn $1 over the $60,000 threshold, you're totally screwed. Many in this very community, this transit desert, require the use of a car, whether to get to and from their job, to get to doctor's appointments, to pick up their children from after school programs or extracurricular activities, or who wish to visit family who live too far to visit on unsafe and unreliable mass transit, or because taking a family of four or six or eight on buses and trains for two to three plus hours each way is not possible for them. You're going to tax Orthodox Jews who drive to Brooklyn to buy kosher food and Chinatown residents who drive to Sunset Park and other Chinatowns to shop for their families because they don't want to risk being victims of hate crimes on the subway. Congestion pricing will further tax the working middle class and lower income families of lower Manhattan. One of the things the pandemic has shown is that more and more residents who can afford to will leave. But too many of us in lower Manhattan do not have that luxury, no matter what the anti-car fanatics claim. Every lower Manhattan resident will now have to pay higher prices for everyday goods and services, including those who can least afford to. That includes those of us living in poverty and the disabled. 
Our local bodegas, supermarkets, and other stores are not going to eat the increased fees they have to pay for deliveries. Every store is going to pass along the cost of their supplier's transportation to all of us in lower Manhattan. And while the bougie cyclists and those of you making this decision to tax my community can afford it, we cannot. You insult New Yorkers' intelligence by telling us that the MTA, which for generations has squandered our tax dollars and fares to the tune of hundreds of billions of dollars over the years, will actually spend this newfound tax to actually improve transit and not waste it. If you believe that, then I've got a bridge to sell you. No, we will not let you bleed the working class people of Lower Manhattan dry so that you can continue the wasteful spending of the MTA on the backs Please of our conclude residents. your remarks. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Tuhan Khan, followed by Wasim Rikabi. Our next speaker is Wasim Rikabi, followed by Tim Schnurr. Our next speaker, the 100th to sign up, is Tim Schnurr, followed by Pablo Zavalos. Our next speaker is Pablo Zavalos, followed by Jessica Gitti. Good evening. My name is Pablo Zavalos, and I'm a lawyer, a strap hanger, and an Upper West Side resident. I'm testifying in support of speedy adoption of congestion pricing with only the exemptions required by statute. And this approach would benefit my West Side neighbors and me. Congestion pricing is vital because if set up for success, it will raise 15 billion for capital improvements to our transit system. These improvements, in addition to reduced car traffic to begin with, will make transit faster, more reliable and more accessible. For my part, whether I'm heading down to court or to see friends and family, I need transit I can trust, not two and three trains held between 96 and 72nd streets due to signal problems. Crucially, these improvements would in turn also make using buses and subways a steadier option for older adults and people with disabilities who are eligible for half price Metro cards and disproportionately used buses to begin with. In addition, the MTA's plan to submit a request to the federal government to allow more taxi and for hire vehicles to use their vehicles for paratransit will combine with funded accessibility improvements and the MTA's existing paratransit options to create a fuller suite of accessible public transportation options. Now, of the scenarios evaluated, scenario A is best positioned to bring about faster, more reliable, and more accessible transit. By spreading across broadly, it ensures that we will still have enough drivers coming in to work and visit our city and pay the tolls that will fund these improvements. It would be unworkable for West Side drivers to pay $23 to enter the Manhattan Central Business District just to create carve outs for Uber, Lyft, and Amazon while further straining our supply chains with sky high rates for trucks. Scenario A would also work for our West Side community. Under scenario A, traffic from vehicles entering and leaving the CBD would decrease by about 23% on West Side streets. For taxis and for hire vehicles, which have been the single biggest driver of increased traffic in our city, this decrease would be 29%. And for trucks, 17%. Vehicle miles traveled in Manhattan between 60th and 82nd streets would shrink by 11%, an additional 1% reduction between 82nd and 126th streets. These traffic reductions would slash greenhouse gas emissions and accelerate city implementation of street safety measures to, that would reduce speeding and traffic injuries and deaths. Also, congestion pricing scenario A would be a boon to transit riders like me, as well as to our surrounding community. Thank you for the opportunity to comment. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jessica Gitti, followed by Murtaza Munir. Our next speaker is Murtazu Munir, followed by Jeffrey Zak. Our next speaker is Jeffrey Zak, followed by Sumiko Ito. Our next speaker is Sumiko Ito, followed by Joel Antonio Cespedes Rodriguez. 
Our next speaker is Joel Antonio Cespedes Rodriguez, followed by John Lindenbaum. Our next speaker is John Lindenbaum, followed by Millwood Hughes. Our next speaker is Millwood Hughes, followed by Lenz Jean Michel. Our next speaker is Lenz Jean Michel, followed by Jesus Urena. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hello, my name is Len Jean Michel. Uh, thank you for giving us this opportunity to speak to you. Um, first off, I want to say that I support reducing congestion and pollution in the city. Uh, I just have a few concerns as to how this program will affect the, our New York citizens. Um, first off, I want to, uh, my main concern is how are the funds going to be used uh, that this places uh, on the, on the, on our people. Uh, for example, um, I think that there are some issues when it comes to uh, driving into the city and being charged. Uh, let's say I need to get to 70th Street and I'm taking the Queensboro Bridge and I'm dipping into the central business, business district for just about a couple blocks because it gets me off of 59th Street and it's now charging me. Um, I don't think that's really fair or, or as to I'm only in the area for just a moment. Um, I think that we need to uh, address concerns with uh, for higher vehicles and how they affect congestion. And I hope that the funds that are raised by this program are going to be used to expand transit service to those of us in less accessible areas, uh, such as uh, certain parts of Queens and certain parts of Long Island. Um, overall, I do support the program. Uh, I just hope that everything that, is, that you do will actually uh, benefit us. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jesus Urena, followed by Lisette Velez. Our next speaker and 111th on the list is Lisette Velez, followed by Anthony Duran. Hi, again, <laughs> thank you for allowing me to speak. I just have some quick comments that I've been jotting down as I go through. The outer, I'm in, I live in the outer boroughs. I live in um, Queens and we're consistently being treated as second class citizens. Everything is, is hosted in, this, uh, in Manhattan and we're prompted to go there for, to receive services like from the major hospitals, city offices, for school movements, for our kids and small businesses um, out trying to get um, their needs met. Before any price increase is considered or congestion pricing is considered, transportation to the outer bor boroughs, especially for those who have two and three fare zones, needs to be implemented in a more fluid manner. If not, there will be a total backup and fiasco. Transit issues need to be addressed properly, not ignored. Uh, my question is, why are, um, why are so many new, outside of New York City vehicles being allowed to park and enter into New York City? Will they be held to the same standards? And why is that? Because we're already paying New York City taxes. And on top of paying New York City taxes, we would have this congestion pricing. That's a double tax, as I see it. Congestion pricing has to take effect for the, 
in, if, in, in consideration for those of lesser means who have urgent needs to use their vehicles. For example, I had my mother with multiple myeloma in her spine. She was disabled. I had to pick her up many times for access to ride and take her back from the chemotherapy. At the same time, I had a son who was on a scholarship to go to um, a fencing for fencing. That's major equipment. You can't take a train with that. And there's just tons of other. I also had a small business. I was a restaurant owner, and many times we had last minute needs. Um, why are not? Why are they not? Why are we not seeking more remedies for the outer boroughs? For express, for example, the express buses go from, let's say, Forest Hills or Fresh Meadows directly into the city. Why can't they make stops in Long Island City to reroute people to allow them to stop and work at Long Island City if they do so, go to school in Long Island City? And to MTA did away with, uh, for example, MTA did away with the Queensboro with, for the Queens bus to Bronx Science, and Bronx Science had about 50 students and people who worked in the Bronx utilizing the bus that one time, yet they compared it to other buses that had frequent trips during that day to that one trip that the buses did. That, that in itself would alleviate. As a woman of middle age, I do feel- Please conclude your remarks. I'm sorry? Please conclude your remarks. As a woman of middle age, I do not feel safe driving the subway today, for example. Thank you. Platforms were super. Our next speaker is Anthony Duran, followed by Malik Francois. Our next speaker is Malik Francois, followed by Christopher Piero. Our next speaker is Christopher Piero, followed by Sean Gerlis. Our next speaker is Sean Gerlis, followed by Tiffany Zhang. Our next speaker is Tiffany Zhang, followed by Deno Lufo. Our next speaker is Deno Lufo, followed by Giovannia Esquivel. Our next speaker is Giovannia Esquivel followed by Stephen Burke. Our next speaker and 20th on the list is Stephen Burke, followed by Roland Levin. Our next speaker is Roland Levin, followed by Robert Schwett. Our next speaker is Robert Schwett, followed by Arlene Karinga. Our next speaker is Arlene Karinga, followed by Wallace John. Our next speaker is Wallace John, followed by Judy Edwards. Wallace, you may begin your remarks. Your, Wallace, uh, unmute yourself and then you may begin your remarks. Sorry about that. Hi, um, I'm against congestion pricing. I live in the North Bronx and this is basically like other people said is an unfair tax on commuters and disenfranchised people. I'm a cyclist myself. I use public transportation as much as I can, but the MTA for years has been stealing money 
mismanaging money. So I don't trust the MTA either. As far as 2004, cooking the books, having two sets of books and raising the fares, the subways are unsafe for elderly people, young people, basically anybody in this city. So in order to get rid of the cars, you have to make the subway system safe. I don't ride the subway. I don't take the public transportation because it's not safe for anybody. If you take public transport, you're risking either assault, robbery, or death. And that's not fair to people. People in the South Bronx, middle class and working class people can't afford another tax. The Brooklyn Borough president said that um, people that have cars are, are wealthy. That's not true. People take drive their cars because they don't feel safe on public transportation. That's the thing. Fix the system that's currently existing and people will come. Until then, taxing people $23, you're not seeing the big picture. People will leave. I'm a property owner in this city. I live born and raised in this city. But again, the MTA continues to mismanage our public dollars. You're not working for the people. You're working against the people. This is not right. It's not fair. And you no know, matter, even though we're, we're speaking on this panel, you're going to do what you want to do. And it's it's you're just going to drive more people out of this city. You're going to drive more people out of this state. And that concludes my remarks. Thank you. Thank you. As a reminder, if you've joined the Zoom under a name that is different from the one you used when you signed up to speak, or if you did not sign up to speak but would like to speak, please identify, identify yourself in the Q&A function. We'll now call our 125th speaker on the list, Judy Edwards, followed by Marcel Kaganovskaya. Our next speaker is Marcel Kaganovskaya, followed by Gerald Adams. Our next speaker is Gerald Adams, followed by Christoph Plewinskowicz. Our next speaker is Christoph Plewinskowicz, followed by Ranjit Singh. Our next speaker is Ranjit Singh, followed by John Samolis. Our next speaker is John Samolis, followed by Abdelkader Frika. Our next speaker is Abdelkader Frika, followed by Jan, excuse me, John D'Amato. Our next speaker is John D'Amato, followed by Bryce Schumann. Our next speaker is Bryce Schumann, followed by Octavia Williams. Our next speaker is Octavia Williams, followed by Joel Samuel. Our next speaker is Joel Samuel, followed by Daisy Cuevas. Our next speaker is Daisy Cuevas, followed by our 140th speaker on the list, Mukul Biswas. Our next speaker is Mukul Biswas, followed by Abdul Wadud. Our next speaker is Abdul Wadud, followed by Anika Richman. Our next speaker is Anika Richman, followed by Marietta Vieira. Our next speaker is Marietta Vieira, followed by Sandra Fleming. Our next speaker is Sandra Fleming, followed by Neil Williams. Our next speaker is Neil Williams, followed by Andrew Hyatt. Our next speaker is Andrew Hyatt, followed by Robert Arnone. Yeah, hello. Um, 
yeah, thank you. Thank you for everyone for presenting this. I think this sounds like a really well thought out plan. I appreciate all of the work that's gone into this, which is considerable. It's been years. I live in the central business district. I lived in Queens for 10 years. I raised a family in Queens uh, and here as well. I've taken my kids to the doctor. I've, I've been hospitalized myself. It's uh, yeah, I, I understand the needs of people. You know, it's, it's not like I'm a recent convert who co I'm coming here and I just don't understand how people, actual people live. I think I, I, think I have that experience. I, I support this with minimal exceptions. I think a lot of people have mentioned that this is gonna be a, a very high tax. Uh, I think it's, uh, if you look at the slides that were presented at the beginning of this meeting, it's high to the extent that there are lots of ex exceptions. If there's not lots of exceptions, it's not that high. There's, I think in the central business district, it's hard, like unless you've lived here, it's kind of hard to appreciate how much pollution there is, both uh, actual pollution, just grime that gets on everything caused by cars and noise pollution uh, caused by cars, but mostly, mostly motorcycles, but also cars quite a bit. And this, uh, there's besides all of that, which is, uh, actually, studies have shown that noise pollution is harmful to your health. Like, so, you know, we're being, we're being harmed here in the central business district, really, because lots of people are coming here, they're taking joy rides, they're doing it for free. Yes, I know no one's arguing for exceptions for these people. But this is a lot of traffic that is coming in. Furthermore, there are these, uh, the more cars, the more crashes. This is Dudley, I've lost a friend and coworker to to crashes, uh, to vehicle, vehicular violence. This is going to get better with this plan. So this is another reason I support it. Many people have said that there's a cash grab by the MTA. I feel like to say that it's a cash grab by the MTA and yet you want the MTA to do lots of things to make it better before you can support it, there's a contradiction, right? It doesn't work. Yes, the MTA could do better in managing money for sure, but it's not the MTA who caused the pandemic and now is the subway system has 70%. That's also not cause of crime, that's cause of creating. So in sum, I think this will be good for everyone in the MTA. I think it's even gonna be good for drivers. They're gonna get less congestion. They're gonna, yes, they pay something, they get something. They're getting less congestion. They get where they're going faster and with less headaches. So this is gonna be great all around. Thank you so much for being here and presenting this. End of, end of comments. Thank you. Our next speaker is Robert Arnon, followed by our 150th speaker on the list, Seydou Sangir. Our next speaker is Seydou Sangir, followed by Ibrahim Sedrak. Our next speaker is Ibrahim Sedrak, followed by Hassan Ali. Our next speaker is Hassan Ali, followed by Johnny Smith. Our next speaker is Johnny Smith, followed by El Medina. Our next speaker is El Medina, followed by Dr. Uzma Go. Our next speaker is Dr. Uzma Go, followed by Anne Marie Carbonet. Our next speaker is Anne Marie Carbonet, followed by Edgar Rodriguez. Our next speaker is Edward Rodriguez, followed by Joseph Sitkawi. Our next speaker is Joseph Sitkawi, followed by Howard Spector. Our next speaker is Howard Spector, followed by our 160th speaker on the list, Janice Gardner. Our next speaker is Janice Gardner, followed by Susan Lee. Janice, you may begin your remarks.
Janice, you may begin your remarks. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, I just wanted to say that I live on the south end corner of 60th Street and Freedom Place between, well, 60th Street between West End Avenue and Freedom Place. I have no idea of how this congestion pricing is gonna work out when this is supposed to be a private parking area. I don't understand how any of these things could have been made available or without any kind of input coming from these building owners. I live in this area, I park on the street, and for me to, to go around the block from West End Avenue to make a right on 59th Street to make a another right on Freedom Place back to 60th Street. That's like I'm paying a double toll to come to, to come home. So I would like for you guys to really, really, really take assessment of that because there are people that are residents of this area and we're still trying to figure it out. How can we park here without having other people from other places to come and park? So that's my very short answer or my short you know, request to the MTA and, and, and would you look out for the residents over in this area on the west side near um, near the Hudson the Hudson River. So look look for us, look out for us over on this end. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Susan Lee, followed by Marion Cerrone. Our next speaker is Susan Lee, excuse me. Our next speaker is Mary Ann Cerrone, followed by Stephen Collage. Our next speaker is Stephen Collage, followed by Andrew O'Toole. Our next speaker is Andrew, Andrew O'Toole, followed by Jason Seo. Our next speaker is Jason Seo, followed by Michael Simon. Our next speaker is Michael Simon, followed by Donald Davis. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you very much. My position is that medallion taxis should not be charged while Uber and Lyft should be. After the Great Depression, Mayor LaGuardia created the medallion for the same purpose you are having a hearing now to limit congestion. Taxi medallions were given the exclusive right to cruise while capping the number of cars, achieving the purpose of limiting congestion. Taxi medallion owners bought their medallion for the right to cruise. Uber and Lyft didn't pay for the right to cruise. If they wanted the right to cruise, they should have bought medallions. By avoiding buying the medallion, they avoided the cost. New York City permitted vast numbers of app cars without charging them for the privileges privilege to cruise. This created congestion. By utilizing taxi service, you could greatly decrease the 100,000 app cars. Yellow cabs can service with a street hail or an app service. You do not need the 100,000 app cars only. With all the cabs in storage, why is anyone worried that jobs would be lost? App drivers and taxi drivers have identical jobs. You can change from one to the other the very next day. So if app drivers are disadvantaged in any way, renting or buying a medallion now is an opportunity. There is a lot of medallions in storage and medallion values are cheap. Taxis can transport more passengers per vehicle compared to app vehicles. App vehicles need to travel to the next fare, while taxis can immediately pick up a fare, giving it a higher utilization rate. Taxi fares are fixed due to city rules. Pas passengers rely on taxis for a reliable price. Taxis are being subjected to more or less price harassment when the city is slow Uber Lyft apps undercut taxi fares by going lower. When the city is busy, app cars raise their rates, making more dollars than taxis. There needs to be some reward somewhere for taxis in exchange for, prov for, for providing this price stability. Eliminating the congestion fee for taxis is one way of achieving this. 
why do you need so many black bars when you have taxis? It's a redundant service. There's a strong branding between New York City and yellow cabs. It helps bring tourists in. The yellow cab is an icon of New York. In the yellow cab, you already have everything you need to get congestion under control while providing the needed service for passengers to go about town. Let the tourists and the residents know that they can leave their car behind and go everywhere in the city by taxi at a reasonable price. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Donald Davis, followed by Neil Cooper. Our next speaker is Neil Cooper, followed by Reva Ambrose. Our next speaker is Reva Ambrose, followed by our 170th speaker, Daniel Feldman. Our next speaker is Daniel Feldman, followed by LD. Our next speaker is LD, followed by Daniel Tainau. Our next speaker is Daniel Tainau, followed by Jasper Sidhu. Our next speaker is Jasper Sidhu, followed by Bill Feinberg. Our next speaker is Bill Feinberg, followed by Craig Seal. Our next speaker is Craig Seal, followed by Aziz Ba. Craig, you may unmute yourself and begin your remarks. Thank you. Uh, give me one second. I'm having problems with my video, but I'm just gonna go ahead. Um, you guys can hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Uh, thank you, Allison, Rick, Catherine, Will, and Lou, and of course, our ASL interpreter uh, on, on the screen. Appreciate you guys being here and doing this. Hopefully you guys are taking some good notes. Um, so good evening, I'm Craig Seal. I live and work within what's being established as a central business district. I do ride on the MTA subway buses. Of course, I walk as a true New Yorker. I've been here for majority of my life, born in Brooklyn, raised in Jersey and spent my uh, most of my adulthood here in Manhattan. Um, I ride bicycle, city bike, and at times, uh, more than not, I do travel quite a bit within Manhattan and the other boroughs on a motorcycle. Um, so with that said, I participate in a few New York City motorcycle communities, New York Classic Riders, which is a global community, New York Motorcycle and Scooter Task Force, which I'm sure some of you are all too familiar with. Um, I'm sure you've met with some of them regarding some of our DOT and New York City policies towards motorcyclists. Um, and I'm also a proud member of the Gotham uh, New York Ducati Desmo Owners Club, which is also a global community um, in celebration of all things Ducati. Um, though I'm not speaking on any of their behalfs, many have shared their sentiments. So once again, as I did last fall, I'm advocating for full exemption of motorcycles from the CBD tolling. Motorcycles not only do not contribute to factors that aren't CBD tolling, like parking, congestion, air quality, stress and infrastructure and others, but rather help alleviate them. Most, if not all jurisdictions around the world exempt motorcycles from congestion pricing. And there's no reason why New York City would not follow suit with this best practice, such as the congestion pricing uh, reference documentation in your recent studies that uh, note Stockholm and London, Stockholm exempts motorcycles 100%. London 
exempts motorcycles providing that they meet the minimum EU emission standard or pay an ultra low emission zone fee, um, of which most modern motorcycles manufactured after July 2007 adhere to those standards. Um, just a quick summary, virtually um, uh, motorcycles demonstrably reduced congestion uh, traffic, uh, they take up less space than cars in parking. Um, they also are more fuel efficient and produce uh, significantly less greenhouse gases compared to passengers, cars, SUVs, taxis, and trucks. Um, and in terms of noise, uh, noise pollution, I have yet to hear or see any uh, noted complaints or studies of motorcycle noise complaints filed with the DOT remark. or the New York City. Thank um, you. Okay, thank you. Our next speaker is Aziz Ba, followed by Steve Karelis. Good evening, everyone. Um, thanks for the opportunity to speak. My name is Aziz Ba. I'm a for hire vehicle ride share driver and the organizing director of the Independent Drivers Guild which represent over 140,000 drivers in New York State. I am here today on behalf of New York's FHV ride share drivers to implore you to not add any additional congestion charges on trip involving for hire vehicles, including Uber, Lyft, liveries, and taxis. If for hire vehicle, vehicle are required to pay additional congestion fees as recommended under any of the scenarios in the environmental assessment, Thousands of drivers will lose their life saving, their investment, their livelihood, their homes, their abilities to survive, feed their families. We all know that while passengers may be charged this additional surcharge, but it is the driver who will ultimately pay in significantly fewer trips and lower compensation. This will result in thousands of jobs lost and continued economic disaster for the FHV driver community. 90% of which are immigrants, people of color. Our industries, drivers, taxis, and FHV are a very fragile community that collectively has been through a lot over the last several years. I'm talking about demonstrable experiences. I'm talking about hard fact, fact in which your own environmental assessment acknowledge, but completely disregard. Many of our drivers were out of work for several months and still are. Some drivers got sick, some drivers died, some have continued to suffer from depression, anxiety, and other mental disorders. Many drivers have been financially devastated and are still struggling to recover. Even as business slowly began to return, drivers could not recoup their loss amid record high gas price and soaring expenses. The MTA should be ashamed of themselves. Why are immigrants, people of color, poor and working class folks the only one being asked to pay two congestion fees? Why is it that our investment, our livelihood and mental health matters less than others and are in fact offered to be sacrificed over the business and environmental interests? Do the benefits you achieve you seek to achieve with congestion pricing really outweigh the devastation that will be brought upon our communities, our children, and our families. Making us ask for an exemption make it sound like we are asking for some kind of special treatment, which in itself is outrageous and unfair. In sum, we respectfully ask the Traffic Mobility Review Board and the MTA to reject any further surcharges and any and all for higher vehicle as such action would include your remarks regarding of the impact of the working class immigrants of people of color that makes up both the driving and passenger community. Thank you. Our next speaker is Steve Carellis, followed by Pedro Acosta. I'm Steve Corellis, 
the head of the New Jersey chapter of the National Motorist Association. Uh, many others will comment on the New Jersey issues with the plan. So I'm just gonna focus on why this ill-conceived plan should be rejected by the Federal Highway Administration with the no action alternative. The project sponsors are seeking tolling authority under the value pricing pilot program that was originally established for congestion pricing. Now the name change was an attempt to put sheep's clothing on a predatory wolf, and in some cases to provide actual value. So what is real value pricing? Now value pricing provides a choice, in this case to the motorist, to travel on a congested roadway or to pay more to travel on a better flowing one with a charge proportional to the real time level of the better service. The keys here are choice and valued better service. The CBD tolling plan is not value pricing. It's clearly congestion pricing where the only choice to avoid paying is for motorists not to use their vehicles, while those who do are forced to pay for supposed congestion relief based on the hope and a prayer that the new cost will force to reduce traffic. That's right. The congestion toll is just a money grab for motorists to pay for a hopeless attempt at improving MTA services without providing any congestion relief to motorists. Under this wishful thinking approach, motorists will actually be paying more for a worse driving experience. The estimates in the environmental assessment for congestion reduction are a joke. They won't be achieved, neither will the motorist's perception of reduced congestion, nor will the other associated benefits aside from revenue generation. Now, the FHWA must take a careful look at the modeling assumptions and the probabilities of achieving real congestion relief. Why would they approve a value pricing project that will fail to reduce congestion? Well, follow the money. New York City congestion tolls is all about providing a billion a year for the MTA and two railroads. All seven toll scenarios are designed to generate this annual revenue with no allocation of investment to actually improve the roadway infrastructure. Now, where's the value in that for motorists that have no interest in New York City's perennial problematic public transit? And congestion tolling will create unintended consequences and escalating costs. That includes toll collection and billing problems, toll avoidance, fraud, more enforcement, equipment vandalism, all plus more that would further cut into revenue. Now, what will happen when it goes all wrong? Will the pilot end? Will tolls be raised to punish motorists if congestion can't be reduced or if significant costs cut into revenue? Will be there guarantees or guardrails? What a racket. The structure of this tolling plan is horrible, but thankfully many forces are in play to kill or radically fix it. If the FHW- Please conclude your remarks. That concludes them. Thank you. Our next speaker is Pedro Acosta, followed by Sheldon Sud. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, yeah, my name is Pedro Acosta and I'm a driver for over 20 years. I live in Brooklyn. Um, I'm totally opposed to um, these uh, taxes to F FHB industry. Um, if you were grateful, you, you have to remember that during the pandemic, we were the only one who were offering the service to everybody who was moving from point to point. Not even the train or the buses were working when we were doing this work. Um, also, I have to tell you that we lost hundreds of drivers doing this service, but you guys don't look at it. We also offer the service to the handicapped people, um, people with other disabilities, which is a very important point that sh you should pay attention to. Okay. okay. Um, I remember that two years ago, two or three years ago, they put a cap on the new plates for FHV vehicles, and they only allow um, a handicapped plate, new plate, or wheelchair vehicle. I mean, so I'm you are trying to get to get us out of the of the service as well. So if you don't think about was like human being, and like at least think about the. Um, disability people who need our service. 
we are totally opposed to this tax to, for FH, FHB industry. Please, no, we don't want that tax. Thank you so much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Sheldon Sood, followed by Jim Reyes. Our next speaker, the 180th to sign up is Jim Reyes followed by Imran Khan. Our next speaker is Imran Khan, followed by Stuart Keller. Our next speaker is Stuart Keller, followed by Dale Posey. Our next speaker is Dale Posey, followed by Jean Han. Our next speaker is Jean Han, followed by Ray M. Our next speaker is Ray M, followed by Patricia McSherry. Our next speaker is Patricia McSherry, followed by Matthew Hopkins. Our next speaker is Matthew Hopkins, followed by Andrew Krug. Our next speaker is Andrew Krug, followed by Lisa Martin. Our next speaker is Lisa Martin, followed by Devin Edwards. Hey, I got this. Uh, I'm a little slow with this. Oh no, my video, start the video. Okay, can you see me? Yes, we can, oh. please proceed. Oh good, hi, I'm Lisa Martin. Um, I'm a public high school teacher. I live in the East Village. I am posted in East New York. So, and I'm older and um, it's, it would just, I, I, I'm wondering if you all had an idea of, as to what you do being a city employee I don't have a choice where I work. I am posted there, but I have to return and it's so expensive, you know, with this congestion pricing. Anyway, I just want a little shout out to all the teachers out there. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker, the 190th to sign up is Devin Edwards, followed by Ray Dries. Our next speaker is Ray Dries followed by Brendan Payo. Our next speaker is Brendan Payo, followed by Kabir Javed. Hi there, can you hear me? Yes, please proceed. Great, I'm speaking today to share my concerns with the CBD tolling initiative uh, that have been proposed. And while I believe they're well-intentioned, I don't think uh, the totality of the initiative will have the desired effects. Uh, the use of mass transit is still performing way under, under what it used to. And it is to no surprise, it's due to the increase in violence, disruptions on the subway, et cetera. Weekly, we hear about events, um, that are occurring underground and make it unsafe for us to use the subway. If we want a greener and cleaner New York City, we must work with what we have first. No one wants to take mass transit. It's not safe. Jumping turnstiles, shooting, looting, fighting, the list goes on. I feel like we're still talking about the smoke and the bombing from the subway shooting in Brooklyn only a few months ago. And here we are now talking about putting a toll um, for those entering Manhattan. The suggestion that more people will use mass transit instead of driving when conditions are like this in the subway is asinine. 
Another concern of mine is I am a New York City public schools teacher. I'm also a resident of Bergen County, New Jersey. I commute into the city to go to work. In mid-2022, the Port Authority removed the toll discount for carpools on the George Washington Bridge, Holland Tunnel, and soon the Lincoln Tunnel, making it once again more difficult and costly for us who work in the city and live outside to get into the city. In fact, without that discount, the pollution goals are essentially null and void because there is no incentive to carpool and people will continue to come into the city with more cars, increasing greenhouse gases. Now, with the prospect of an additional toll to enter Midtown and below, it is beyond me why I should consider even coming into the city, not only for my professional job, which I can change, but for my entertainment purposes as well. I'm proud to work in person and be a public school teacher for the Department of Education in New York City. Living here in New Jersey and in the tri-state area, I'm accustomed to higher prices for food and for gas, but increasing the burden with additional tolls is ridiculous. I would like to note that a stakeholder, which is not here, the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, in which it doesn't directly involve, but will directly impact them, should also be present to have a say in this, especially representative of consumers myself. I want the best for all people and I want the best for our planet and our neighbors. However, the creation of an additional toll is not the way to achieve environmental sustainability. I'm happy that my governor, Governor Murphy is listening and he will represent us as well if you won't. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Kabir Javed, followed by L.D. Solomon. Our next speaker is L.D. Solomon, followed by Dale Posey. L.D. Solomon. Hello? Yes, please proceed. We can uh, hear I, you. I didn't sign up to speak. They just told me to unmute. Very well. We'll move to the next. The next speaker is Dale Posey, followed by Christina Santos. Dale Posey. Hello? Yes, please proceed. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to make the case that uh, congestion pricing is going to be onerous and slightly cruel cool for the seniors and the disabled, as well as the unwell who live below 60th Street, particularly those such as myself and my husband who live in the Northern End, whose lives are very much across the now, you know, the invisible border. Um, it is uh, inconceivable that, let's say a woman of 75 who is unstable on her feet or a man suffering from cardiac or respiratory issues is going to be able to walk to a subway or bus stop, the right subway or bus stop to visit a doctor or family member or place of worship or to access shopping that may be a little more affordable than in their own neighborhood. Not all of us who live below 60th Street are very wealthy, nor do many of us meet the 60 thousand income threshold. Um, I say this personally from personal experience. My husband and I were active train and subway users until about four years ago when my husband was put on a medication that had to lower his heart rate slightly. Um, in April of 2018, while running to catch a train in Penn Station because the route there was delayed, uh, 
Uh, my husband slid off from me for a moment to get the tickets. And when I looked over my shoulder, he was gone. But there was a man laying on the floor who I very quickly realized was my own husband laying blacked out on the floor of Penn Station with blood pouring from his head. His heart rate could not keep up with the rush down the, down the escalator and over to the ticket booth. So we've had to become drivers to get out of our neighborhood more often. Um, I really hope that you will consider the burden on the elderly um, in the neighborhood. And I hope you'll understand that our cost of living for deliveries for services will go up and we will also now have to pay this added premium. Thanks very much. Thank you. As a reminder, if you have joined the Zoom under a name that is different from the one you used when you signed up to speak, or if you did not sign up to speak, but would like to speak, please identify yourself in the Q&A function. You may also request to speak anonymously. Our next speaker is Thomas McGuire, followed by Martin Weinberg. Our next speaker is Martin Weinberg, followed by Tom LaJudis. Our next speaker is Tom LaJudis, followed by Alex Shahosov. Our next speaker is Alex Shahosov, followed by Stephen Kent Abraham. Our next speaker is Stephen Kent Abraham, followed by Joseph Labetti. Our next speaker, our 200th to sign up, is Joseph Labetti, followed by Robert Arasena. Our next speaker is Robert Arasena, followed by Richard Catalano. Our next speaker is Richard Catalano, followed by Ciro Luna. Our next speaker is Ciro Luna, followed by Naomi Pemberton. Our next speaker is Naomi Pemberton, followed by Davida Lasavio. Our next speaker is Davida Lasavio, followed by Prakash Parmar. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Please proceed. Okay. Uh, hold on. Delia, I'm speaking, Sorry. please. Sorry, that was my child. <laughs> um, so I'm calling, I'm here, I'm from the Bronx. Um, and I'm very concerned about this. I am a single mother to a special needs child. Um I have a car that right now actually I'm waiting on a replacement car because it got broke my other one got broken into and vandalized to the point where it was considered and declared um totaled so i'm now been waiting for five months for my daughter's cousin to send me another one i need to have the car because due to my daughter's excuse me a minute get out of the room please thank you due to my daughter's um diagnosis she is bipolar one with mania the mta is dangerous as in fatal dangerous for me, me and her because something happens we don't know if it's going to trigger her she act up we know what's going on in these subways with people who either have undiagnosed mental illness or don't have mental illness just the world's acting like they're crazy um the thing is is that you're going to raise these prices okay i also use my car to earn a living, which already I barely make any money because I do deliveries such as Instacart and such. And most of the money goes to the gas, which we all know is high. Doing a $23, so I had to do deliveries. I'm gonna make no money. You're gonna put me out in the streets. I am, I live in the Bronx, like I said, which we all know is the poorest borough. And I am considered well below the poverty level to have us constituents in the five boroughs to pay these prices 
is inconceivable. It's disrespectful. And you're like spitting in our faces. There's too much going on in this world right now for you to go and have us pay more. I'm already struggling trying to keep a car so that my child is safe, so that I am safe, so we don't get COVID, we don't get the polio, the monkeypox, all the stuff that's going on nowadays. So we don't get shot and the subway pushed into the tracks, X, Y, Z. Also, to the bicyclists, they need to stop fighting with um, vehicles about issues due to the fact that bicyclists are not following road rules and they need to. So that's got to stop. Um, as for um, stating about... Um, there was another thing that was said. I, I can't think of it right now. But, there, you know, this is wrong. And those of us vulnerable New Yorkers that are already struggling to even try to survive and keep a roof over our heads. your remarks. This is inconceivable. You need to find a way to exempt us. Thank you. Whether you do. Our next speaker is Prakash Parmar, followed by L.D. Our next speaker is L.D followed by Eliza Gregory. LD, please proceed. Our next speaker is Eliza Gregory, followed by Shane Harris. Our next speaker is Shane Harris, followed by LD. Our next speaker is LD followed by Robert Bolowski. Can you hear me? Yes, please proceed. I am strongly opposed. It is inhumane. You have not announced exemptions for cars with passengers who have disabled car tags, not disabled license plates, but disabled auto tags that hang from the inside car mirror because some have disabled tags which are not tied to a specific vehicle, but are tied to a disabled individual who is driven by a caretaker. A speaker alluded to those who can choose to drive. For some people, there is no choice and driving is the only way. There are elderly disabled patients who are physically incapable of navigating the subway system. They go to medical care in the district. They will not be able to afford to continue with their medical care given the exorbitant price you propose. Many disabled elderly are on a fixed income. The exorbitant fees you propose can make the difference of the elderly not being able to afford food or medicine. Your plan harms the vulnerable community and causes economic hardship for the elderly. You must exclude the physically disabled who are driven in cars with disabled tags hanging on the mirrors not just disabled license plates and make a way for the disabled to submit their disabled tag information and the corresponding license plate for exclusion. Safety is an issue in the subway. It is not safe. Un it is unfairly burdensome to the disabled. Everyone who opposes this plan should contact Governor Hochul. This is a selfish money grab for the MTA that will shift congestion elsewhere. The MTA should not benefit off the backs of commuters in cars. Some drivers carry heavy and bulky items into the city that they could not possibly carry on the subway or bus. The plan presumes drivers are wealthier and can support the MTA. It is not true. Some drivers have cars that are 10 to 15 years old and the drivers are barely making ends meet. 
Your plan will have a disproportionate effect on the poor and low income individuals. Mike Gentile pointed out earlier, your target congestion reduction has already been reached because, COVID, because of COVID and the hybrid work situation. So congestion pricing is not even needed because COVID decreased congestion. In addition, electric vehicles will negate the so-called concern with air pollution. You have not adequately studied the unintended consequences and how your plan will redistribute congestion. All the models you propose are theories or hypotheses. There are no actual data. You look at the cost of building the infrastructure. It's not fair for drivers to shoulder a heavier financial burden for transit riders. You are mandating that drivers from outside the district unfairly subsidize New York's mass transit infrastructure. It is not fair, it is not equitable, it is outrageous. And many of you work for the MTA, so of course you would want it because it would benefit you. It is a money grab jammed down our throats with unintended consequences that disproportionately affects the disadvantaged and the insensitive. Remarks. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Robert Bolowski, followed by Thomas Neubauer. Our next speaker, the 210th to sign up, is Thomas Neubauer, followed by Angel Rodriguez Jr. The next speaker is Angel Rodriguez Jr., followed by Michael Torres. The next speaker is Michael Torres, followed by Isabel Hernandez. The next speaker is Isabel Hernandez, followed by Mark Berger. The next speaker is Mark Berger, followed by Angel Paredes. The next speaker is Angel Paredes, followed by Tawana Denard. The next speaker is Tawana Denard, followed by Konstantin Shushkovsky. The next speaker is Konstantin Shushkovsky, followed by Kofi. A free The next speaker is Kofi Afriye, followed by Andy Wong. The next speaker is Andy Wong, followed by Carolyn Davis. The next speaker is Carolyn Davis, followed by Anonymous Kareem. The next speaker is Anonymous Kareem, followed by Sergei Lyshenko. The next speaker, Sergei Lyshenko, followed by Eric Pinto. The next speaker is Eric Pinto, followed by Alfonso Anderson. The next speaker is Alfonso Anderson, followed by Seth Dobie. The next speaker, the 225th to sign up, is Seth Doby, followed by Grace Marrero. The next speaker is Grace Marrero, followed by Dario Crimades. The next speaker is Dario Crimades, followed by Enrique Quezada. The next speaker is Enrique Quezada, followed by Cheryl Boylan. The next speaker is Cheryl Boylan, followed by Karen Loriano. The next speaker is Karen Loriano, followed by Joseph Muto. The next speaker is Joseph Muto, followed by Sandra Flores. The next speaker is Sandra Flores, followed by Ali Mohammed. The next speaker is Ali Mohammed, followed by Richard Osman. The next speaker is Richard Osman, followed by Paul Mankabadi. The next speaker is Paul Mankabadi, followed by Andres Cano. The next speaker is Andres Cano, followed by Tomas Santana. 
Next speaker is Tomas Santana, followed by Jan Gershkovich. The next speaker is Jan Gershkovich, followed by Elizabeth Curry. The next speaker is Elizabeth Curry, followed by John Buckholz. The next speaker is John Buckholz, followed by Ahmad Saeed. The next speaker is Ahmad Saeed, followed by Agalia Davis. The next speaker is Agalia Davis, followed by Ralph Sorrow. The next speaker is Ralph Sorrow, followed by Dan Anacito. The next speaker is Dan Anacito, followed by Haran Douglas. The next speaker is Haran Douglas, followed by Stephen Omeis. The next speaker is Stephen Omeis, followed by Margaret Basilio. The next speaker is Margaret Basilio, followed by Ranghunandan Anko Likar. The next speaker is Ranghunandan Akolikar, followed by Mamadou Diallo. The next speaker, the 250th to sign up, is Mamadou Diallo, followed by Susan R. Please proceed. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, just on double check. So I would like to thank comment you. about that. Oh, thank you so much. Um, well, thank you for having this panel to discuss about the conjunction pricing. I really appreciate it. And you know, so we could go like, give our little um conjunction pricing is not fair. I think um it should it should not be a goal. It should be so if they talk emissions, first of all, we have so many electric cars now coming in. They should have the California mandate in New York State. Be like, okay, in 2030 something, all cars should be electric. You know, something like that. That will go ahead and like about uh, uh most of now, so Do why don't you try calling back in? We'll move on to Susan R, followed by VJ Nyack. The next speaker is VJ Nyack, followed by Tobias Russo. The next speaker is Tobias Russo, followed by Robert Gilpin. The next speaker is Robert Gilpin, followed by Tyrone Murray. The next speaker is Tyrone Murray, followed by Antonio Cerquiera. The next speaker is Antonio Cerquiera, followed by Michael Samuels. The next speaker is Michael Samuels, followed by Rafael Santos. The next speaker is Rafael Santos, 
followed by Jessica Jean Baptiste. The next speaker is Jessica Jean Baptiste by Rafael Salazar. The next speaker is Rafael Salazar, followed by Geraldine Fredericks. The next speaker is Geraldine Fredericks, followed by Michelle Sarno. The next speaker is Michelle Sarno, followed by John Bailey. The next speaker is John Bailey, followed by Damiana Johnson. John Bailey, you could unmute, please proceed. Yes, I'm unmuted. Um, good evening and thank you. My name is John Bailey. I'm owner and operator of Bailey Coach located in Spring Grove, Pennsylvania. We're approximately 180 miles from New York City. I'm a second generation of a three generation travel and transportation business. I'm also immediate past chairman of the Pennsylvania Bus Association located in the state of Pennsylvania. My family, has transported tens of thousands of tourists to the city of New York over the decades, since the 1940s. Although I support the efforts to address the congestion in the city, I'm very concerned by the options proposed by the environmental assessment and the limited time available to review the documents and participate in the process. New York City is a national tourism and commuter destination and any congestion Con congestion relief or pricing models need to take into consideration concerns of interested parties beyond the local geographic area. Operations like mine are critical to any congestion relief modeling because we take cars off the road. Plain and simple, and motor coaches often are the only form of transportation available to low income and underserved communities. Several options proposed in the New York Central Business District tolling program would include tolling buses, motor coaches like mine and many other operators in adjoining states. This process is moving too quickly. You are not allowing sufficient time and conducting sufficient outreach to the many transportation operators who serve the city on a daily, weekly and monthly basis. There are hundreds of operators like me that come from beyond New York City, Connecticut, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Maryland and District of Columbia and many more. I urge you to slow down this process, broaden your outreach beyond the states to ensure the providers of mass transportation, both public and private, who provide actual congestion relief are not subject to this proposal and that we are exempted from tolling costs. Plain and simple, motor coaches need an exemption from this. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> Our next speaker is Damiana Johnson, followed by Luis Gamboa. <clears throat> the next speaker is Luis Gamboa, followed by Rodney Carter. The next speaker is Rodney Carter, followed by Jeffy Tuller. The next speaker is Jeffy Tuller, followed by Ira Gershenhorn. The next speaker is Ira Gershenhorn, to be followed by Urshad Kareem. The next speaker, the 270th to sign up, is Urshad Kareem, followed by Atta Panyan Young. Rashad, you can unmute and Hello. Sorry for the technical. Yes, we can hear you. Thank no you. No problem. Please proceed. So I, I, I just want to start off with a procedural point. I, I've stayed on for I don't know, three and a half hours now. I, I find it 
surprising that while I appreciate the comment period, that there are only a handful of these hearings and they're all scheduled the last week in August and I am out of the country next week. So this is the only opportunity that I have. I am both a uh, resident of this uh, central business district as well as work in the district. I don't use a car to commute, so I'm not gonna to speak to that. I, I do bike to work and I appreciate all the protected bike lanes that the MTA has provided. Um, I do though wanna reiterate a point others have made um, for an exemption for residents. Uh, I have to keep a car because my mom who lives outside the district has dementia, she can't drive. She can't, I, I have to go up two to three times a week to help her grocery shop and just assist her with her sort of daily living activities. Um, she, she has a health care giver, but there are limitations on that as well. And I try to time my visits to my mom. Uh, so it's, I'm not doing it during peak traffic times. I'm doing it off, off traffic times. And to be charged for that seems, you know, contrary to, to the point of congestion pricing. In addition to a resident exemption, I also think that there should be more pricing differentiation for off-peak and weekend tolls. I have friends, I've got family, I've got a daughter in Brooklyn, in addition to my mom in the Bronx. Uh, I have friends in outside the district, uh, in the suburbs, and I don't want them to have to pay a toll to visit me you know, to come in for dinner or on the weekend uh, to pay, uh, you know, a $2 difference. It, the congestion on the weekends and at the evenings is just not at the same level as business hours. And I don't see why there is a toll at all uh, during the off, off hours. Uh, finally, I have to mention that I'm a little skeptical of the, the business impact. In the central business district, I, I uh, patronize a lot of restaurants, there's theaters, there's lots of cultural attractions. And uh, I'm concerned that there will be an adverse impact on those businesses uh, in my neighborhood and as well as in throughout the, throughout the district if, if the, uh, particularly the off-peak tolls uh, are not reduced. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Our next speaker is Ata Hanyan Young, followed by Teresa Collins. Our next speaker is Teresa Collins, followed by Felix Ottenwalder. Our next speaker is Felix Ottenwalder, followed by Robert Last. Our next speaker is Robert Last, followed by Flory P. Our next speaker, 275th to sign up, is Flory P, followed by Anwar Malik. The next speaker is Anwar Malik, followed by Arifa Tirmizi. Okay. Please proceed. Yeah, businesses in the CBD area don't pay tolls to operate. So why as a Uber driver should I be paying to uh, pay, paying tolls? Because this is my business, but my business just moves around. But when you come to think about it, businesses don't pay tolls, right, over there? So as a driver, we actually helped New York City move. We kept it moving during the pandemic peak, but never once were we appreciated for our suffering, suffering or losses. Number one, where we asked, what do we want? We helped MTA make hundreds of millions of dollars since 2018. Yet here we still are robbed like it's okay. It's a shame that not anyone gives a damn about us and keeps stressing us with more payments and more bills. The whole world has upgraded their subway system, yet here MTA is just robbing money and letting people die in their trains. Last but not least, I would like to say MTA has failed hardworking New Yorkers 
You all should be ashamed of yourselves. You failed big time and will keep failing. Thousands of us will lose our livelihoods. The MTA's own environmental assessment states that it will be FHV and taxi drivers who will, be, who will ultimately pay the price within. Significantly fewer trips, less pay and loss of jobs. And the pathetic part is MTA has not fixed the subway system. So how do they plan on getting everyone to work on time? Shit, at least do something about being productive before robbing us. Bye. Thank you. Our next speaker is Arifa Chirmizi, followed by Larbi Aitabu. Our next speaker is Larbi Aitaubu, followed by Sonam Lama. All right, I think I got this. We can hear you. Oh, great, thank you. Um, I'm just gonna go uh, right to the point, just present myself pretty quickly right here. My name is Larbi Aitaubu. I'm a uh, TLC licensed driver and also uh, an FHV uh, driver uh, and also uh, IDG or Independent Drivers Guild member. Uh, just gonna jump in right here. Uh, congestion pricing should be fair and equitable across the industry. Uh, one sector of the industry should not receive an exemption while other do not. All livery, taxi and FHV drivers should all be subject to the same rules and fees. You propose giving taxis exempt exemptions for additional surcharges, but not FHVs. The irony here is that FHVs serve outer borough communities of color, not taxis. And there was a time, and still probably, when the taxi industry regularly discriminates against customers based on geographic discrimination. <clears throat> uh, do you want a repeat of this reprehensible practice? No, you don't but I don't know how you think about it. So not only will this make FHV unaffordable to these communities, but you will now incentivize discriminatory practice against them. This is an absolute madness. All rules and surcharge surcharges must be fair across the board. The additional congestion uh, tax proposal come as ride share drivers are already in an economic crisis ride share drivers were hit hard by the pandemic stuck with car payments and insurance bills they could no longer afford to pay as business slowly began to return drivers have struggled to make ends meet amid unprecedented gas prices and expenses not to mention the inflation in recent survey <clears throat> Uh, of more than thousands of rideshare drivers, IDG, the Independent Drivers Guild, found that nine in 10 rideshare drivers are unable to afford basic living expenses, and more than half are struggling to afford food. Addition, uh, adding additionally, taxes on this, uh, adding additional taxes on this already struggling. I wanna mention one thing, I know I have 30 seconds uh, left, but also all these other companies such as Amazon, FedEx, and all these companies, they are blocking the road of Manhattan. I live in Manhattan. They're blocking the road and you are not charging them a penny. No one is charging. The city is not charging them a penny. And this is a very shame, shameful of this agency to only target people like me, uh, minorities, Please immigrants, your remarks. people of color. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Sonam Lama, followed by Jingsheng Li Lin. Hello, can you hear me, guys? Yes, we can. Okay. 
So first of all, good evening and thank you uh, everyone and uh, for giving this opportunity. Uh, my name is Sunan Lama. Uh, uh, I am a driver advocate from the uh, from the TLC driver and I myself a TLC driver. So why everyone is so interested to rob us? Uber company, Dave company, all these app companies take more commission from us. TLC make money from us. The state, the federal, they love our taxes. And MTA, we are giving you guys to save your life already. So why are you guys robbing us who is working days and night and who is helping to build this New York City community better after this COVID? When there was a shortage on the staff with the MTA bus and train, who do you guys think gave all this right to the uh, bus responders? It is us, all this. We put our life at risk for you guys. And most of you, whoever are here, you might have taken the ride with us, right? The, uh, the Uber or Lyft, we are the same drivers. So why you guys are so like, you know, into us uh, robbing, making money out of us? We are not a sugar daddy for you guys. If you do that, how can we survive? And how can you guys make money from us? So this condition price is something should be exempt from us, especially FSB drivers. We are never recognized and we are the backbone of New York City that runs keep, you know, 24 hours. So, and adding to the point, as an Uber driver and Lyft driver, I give right to the service animal people, you know, like the people who have a service animal, the disabled, the FSB, my fellow drivers are helping them. We include all kinds of passengers and patients in, in our, car and give them right. It is a way to us, our family, and most of us are immigrants. We have to family back home too. We great will for them. And each dollar definitely, it 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 definitely like, you know, uh, affect us. So please uh, make us not pay this kind of fees. Instead, add some money to us, we could, we could make for our family. And DOT, I'm a big fan of DOT, but agent that you have, they sucks. They and they give us hundred dollars, hundred and fifteen dollar tickets. You guys already made so many from us. It's time to give us the money, not to talk with this condition price. Take from the billionaires who are in the Wall Street and meet some people. Good your know? remarks. Not from us. Thank you. Thank you. Our next and 281st speaker on the list is Jin Cheng Lin, followed by Mamadou Diallo. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. All right. Uh, so, yes, my name is uh, Jin Cheng Lin. Uh, and, you know, FHP drivers, we've been paying the congestion price already. You know, ever since the law passed back in 2019 in January, they are telling us we have to pay 275 as an FHP driver, and that's been driving around in below 60th Street in Manhattan. You know, out of that whole time, we've been paying congestion prices, even when there was not a single congestion during the pandemic. During the pandemic, we've still been moving people around, and during that time, where's the congestion? Everybody was off. People still need to go around and we're still paying the congestion prices. Riders are still paying the congestion prices. What have the city done? What improvements have been made? MTA, buses, there's still signal problems. That None of those changes. Train, uh, subway stations, there's still signal problems. None of that changed. During the whole time, throughout the years, right? Every single year, MTA has been able to uh, bring in about 300 million per year just from the taxi drivers and FHV drivers of, uh, of, 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 of this congestion price. What has that $300 million per year gone to? Where did it go? You know, that is the main question that I want to know because all these fees, there's no, not a single improvement. Roads are not even being fixed over there. It's all you do is construction and all you guys add is more what? More bus lanes, more bike lanes. And where the hell are the drivers going to go? Of course, there's going to be more accidents on the road because of that. You know, cyclists, I'm sorry, but... You know, there's a, there's a place for them to ride and they still go all over the road. They feel like they own the city. They own the city streets. 
this congestion price, it makes no sense. It doesn't provide a safer way. None of that. All it does is it creates more congestion, right? And the reason why I say that is because now you're going to have people circling around like, oh, are you looking for a ride again to Manhattan? No? Okay, uh, there's going to be more ride of discrimination. And that's going to be another thing that drivers have to face. This is not fair for the drivers. This is not fair for anybody around. And if this, gets, if this does get passed on to the riders, how is that fair for the riders? You know, they still pay for the MTA uh, congestion charge, but then where does that go? Does that improve their service? No, it doesn't, right? So this is not right. Exempt the riders, exempt the drivers. You know, we are here as a human being. We have to make a living to provide for our family, not only back home, but for the families here. We have, you know, what we do is that we are here to provide a service to the uh, to the working to the working class, to the every any class in, in New York City. We are here to support everybody. But if this congestion pass, if this congestion bill passes, then we are totally screwed. Okay, thank you, and I buy the rest of my time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Mamadou Diallo, followed by Mathos Sangir. Hello there. Can you guys can you guys hear me? Yes, this time it's better so far. Appreciate it. Okay, so you know, I have to, you know, I feel like history repeats itself again, okay? America is fine. America, America was built based on the back of slavery, all right? Poor people. Let's go back. Same old thing, same story. The big guys never get taxed. Little men have to get taxed. Same old thing. This congestion pricing is ludicrous. You got people with, with no income. You got people with, um, literally people struggling now. Okay? This is middle of pandemic. Pandemic has not been done, gone yet. And now MTA is coming out with the congestion. Come on now, let's be very serious about that part. Second part that I want to talk about, the cyclists, I love them. You know, we all are supposed to share the, share the road. All of us have to own the street because we're all citizens. You know, pedestrian was here before car came. I don't mind seeing cyclists on the street. I drive taxi. Sir, did you please Uber. Get a little slower? Okay, sorry. I drive Uber and Lyft. And, you know, so, hey, I don't mind having playing his cycle, a bicycle around. That's great. That's okay with us. But the thing is this, MT need to rethink about this plan. This plan is very discriminatory. I live in the Bronx. You're going to have X amount. Bro Bronx is already suffering with pollution. So you're going to have an X amount of pollution. It's just sad, the fact that the only focus on the central district, we all matter. Okay, everybody matter. Not just that area of New York City matter. The five boroughs are gonna be all full of polluted because okay, because all the drivers are gonna be driving around, not coming to midtown districts and because of the congestion pricing. So all lives matter. Stop all this pollution because this was MTA is lean, leaning toward pollution, but guess what? It's a money grime scheme. This is the money grime scheme. Now all of you guys on the board, all your salary gonna be raised. So you guys want to put, you guys want it to pass because you're going to have more money in your pocket. You guys want to have more money in your pocket. You guys sitting over here looking pretty, blinking all that. Stop it. Stop it. I barely make $50 a day. You guys need to stop this. This is ludicrous. No congestion pricing. It's nonsense. We all deserve the right to move around Manhattan freely. We already pay enough taxes. These guys are already paying double... If you double park your car just a little bit, you're going to give $150 on tax, DOT. Come on now, let's be serious. This is ludicrous. But congestion pricing, please stop it. It's nonsense. It's discriminatory, right? All lives matter. Talk about pollution down there. It's nonsense. Okay, what about the pollution in the Bronx? What are you going to do with the pollution in the Bronx? All right? All, so you're going to see heavy traffic moving around. Come on now. This is nothing but a scheme. MTA, we know the games. I see you all in MTAs. Most of them even do work. They just stand around. So come on, let's be very real about this. This is ludicrous. Come on, man. come on, MTA. Thank you. Our next speaker is Mathos Sangir, followed by Arifa Tirmizi. Our next speaker is Arifa Tirmizi, followed by Judith Dahil.
Our next speaker is Judith Dahill, followed by Lisa Mangle. Our next speaker is Lisa Mangle, followed by Marvin Lowe. Our next speaker is Marvin Lowe, followed by Patrick McLaughlin. Our next speaker is Patrick McLaughlin, followed by Dina Ruiz. Our next speaker is Dina Ruiz, followed by Eric Bell. Our next speaker is Eric Bell, followed by Stephen Paul Miller. Our next speaker is Stephen Paul Miller, followed by Ibrahima Berry. Stephen, you may unmute yourself and begin your remarks. Okay. Okay. All right, I took, I took a while to find myself. Uh, I, I, um, I, a few years ago, uh, the, uh, the dividing line was 86th Street. And I know you might have had some reasons for lowering it to 60th Street, but uh, I think the most important thing is that we should all do our part. If you really need money and this is the way to raise the money, uh, the Upper West Side and the Upper East Side uh, should want to be part of the whole scheme, if it's a good scheme, uh, or even if it isn't, <laughs> you know? Uh, and, uh, and it also seems to me I, uh, that, um, that, that I live uh, on the Lower East Side. There's no more traffic on the Lower East Side than the Upper East Side, um, or parts of Brooklyn. So, the sense for Manhattan, if, if the scheme made any sense at all, uh, would have something to do with charging a toll on the east side bridges, uh, which would be unfortunate, sort of turning, um, you know, bridges into paywalls, which, which emotionally sort of hurts me. It seems to me there was something in the original 1898 New York Charter about providing uh, easy access between the boroughs. Um, you know, of course, uh, I, um, I see your point and, uh, gas, uh, polluting cars are terrible. Uh, but, uh, you know, maybe you're fighting the last war in a way, you know, it's just today the California mandate and electric cars. It seems to me that if you were serious about discouraging pollution to be some sort of a exemption for electric cars. I know you would argue that they create congestion also. Wait, I seem to not have used all my time. Uh, I really could use more time. Uh, I just want to say that it's uh, a shame that you really don't care about the collateral damage. Uh, obviously, there are a lot of people with a lot of collateral damage, and you just don't care. It might be anecdotal to you, but it's real. And... Uh, and I think there are other ways to do this. What about universal taxation? What about everybody chipping in? If this was so important, why are you hermetically sealed from taxation in general? Um, uh, you know, and the very notion of this, like, I don't, I don't get it. It, seem, it seems like, um, anyway, um, you know, you, you don't answer any questions here. You're just like proverbial uh, psychotherapists listening to everyone. There could, it would be better to have two minutes and have you answer something rather than you just Please be conclude stuck. your remarks. Say it again. Thank you. Really? Our next speaker and 290th speaker on the list is Ibrahima Berry, followed by Betsy Plum. Our next speaker is Betsy Plum, followed by Douglas Gordon.
Good evening. My name is Betsy Plum. I'm here tonight on behalf of Riders Alliance, New York's grassroots organization of subway and bus riders. I'm here to voice our strong support for implementing a robust congestion pricing program as quickly as possible. Public transit is the beating heart of our city. It is a core piece of bringing about an equitable recovery in New York. And what we need at this moment is a transit system that works and that working and middle class New Yorkers can depend on. The only way we can see that, the only way we can see a reliable transit system delivered for riders is with this program, with congestion pricing. Congestion pricing is the single biggest piece of funding, $15 billion for the MTA capital plan. Without the revenue, riders will continue to experience daily subway delays caused by ancient signal technology and an outdated system. Riders who depend on elevators will continue to face a subway system that is nearly impossible to navigate with accessible stations few and far between and elevators too frequently out of service, and riders will continue to experience buses that are unreliable and maddeningly slow, stuck behind gridlock traffic. Congestion pricing has the power to deliver overwhelmingly positive environmental impacts by reducing car congestion, by clearing the air of excessive vehicle exhaust, and by raising funds that will be invested in delivering cleaner transportation for millions of New Yorkers. Moreover, it's a progressive means of raising revenue from those who can afford the cost of car ownership and traveling by car into the central business district. We have no other choice. Our collective futures depend on congestion pricing. We call upon the governor and the MP MTA to do everything in their power to implement congestion pricing quickly and fairly and for the federal government to understand that for nearly five decades, congestion pricing has been the answer. It's time has come and we must see it implemented. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Douglas Gordon, followed by Basia Osowski. Our next speaker is Basia Osowski, followed by Jonelle Wright. Our next speaker is Janelle Wright, followed by Jamal Mo. Our next speaker is Jamal Mo, followed by Christine Negra. Our next speaker is Christine Negra, followed by Akinwol Kilanen. Our next speaker is Akinwol Kilanen, followed by Juliet Kedlasik. Our next speaker is Juliet Kedlasik, followed by Arthur Keeler. Juliet, you may unmute yourself and begin your remarks. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, I am Juliet Kadlicek. I'm a single mother of two school-aged children and a resident of the Central Business District living in subsidized housing. Um, though I qualify for subsidized housing, I do not qualify for the tax credit offered with the congestion pricing scheme. I also work in, for a subsidized housing community in Northern Westchester County, and therefore I'm a reverse commuter with public transportation times equal um, in current costs, car versus public transport with the Metro North, yet my commute time if I use public transport would be double. And having two school-aged children, this makes it pretty much impossible. Um, the, um, but my personal situation aside, I support a fair and equitable application of the congestion pricing in New York City. Um, in a paper by the Institute of Transportation Studies by UC Davis in December of 2020, which addressed equitable congestion pricing, cities around the world have been able to provide equity, equity while adapting a congestion pricing scheme that provided for the residents living within those congestion price um, districts. London offers a 90% discount with a 10 pound annual registration fee. Milan has 40 free entry and exits followed by a two euro fee, much lower than the out of district um, residents. Um, and even places that don't offer these um, benefits to residents, they do restrict the timing of the fees being charged. Um, I think that these things need to be considered 
um, for all residents to say somebody that lives below 60th Street now has an additional charge just because they already own a car. I mean, I own a car, I pay for parking. So because after driving around with my children for, uh, you know, over an hour and receiving a $99 parking ticket because I was two minutes late to move because my kids didn't want the cereal I put out in the morning. And like, it was crazy. And I just, I'm thinking like, I decided, oh, I can pay for, you know, four tickets in one garage monthly fee plus a tax plus my New York City tax. And now I'm going to be charged when I go one block from my garage to the FDR every time I leave to take the kids out of the district or to go to my office. Um, I, it just seems crazy that residents aren't being more seriously considered in this plan. Um, and I wish and hope and urge that you review the, you know, global agendas of other congestion schemes and consider them when you present your final plan. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Arthur Keeler, followed by our 300th speaker Kath, on the list, Catherine Tannert Nyang. Our next speaker is Catherine Tannert Nyang, followed by Chris Castillo. Our next speaker is Chris Castillo, followed by George Pileri. Sorry. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, sorry. Oh, I can't hear you. Wait, hold on one second. Chris, you may begin your remarks. Hi, uh, my name is Chris Castillo. I live on the Lower East Side, been a resident of New York uh, City for most of my life, um, I'm uh, disabled uh, and I do have a car. And unfortunately, I can only get around in a car. Uh, mass transit is not readily available to me here. And going up and down uh, stairs is very difficult for me. I take care of my mother as uh, she is 93, who lives in Rockland County. So I travel up to her at least twice a week to help her with shopping and whatever else she needs. So it's very difficult for me to pay an additional tax that would, you know, as a credit and then wait till the end of the year to get it back. Uh, unfortunately, I do not have that kind of money to shell out for a car and for insurance and for registration and another additional tax and then be charged to come back to where I live to come sleep at night. It's unreasonable and unfair and discriminatory against disabled and elderly people to pose this tax since I pay New York City taxes all my life. Uh, I don't see anybody paying taxes for the bike riders that go back and forth uh, our streets and go in the middle of our streets and disobey traffic regulations. Nothing happens with them, but you want to penalize people who own a car because they think they're rich, which most of the people I know who have a car in the city are not rich, especially where I live. And if you want to reduce emission, you could put in another million trees like Bloomberg did, and you could lower the emissions that way. It's just very unfair that this has to happen. And if you're going to burden the people with congestion pricing, at least make it fair and suitable for everyone, not just for the wealthy and the people who have paid, paid multiple taxes. I mean, it's, it's just unfair, I'm sorry. Uh, I hope uh, everybody 
contacts their representative and fights this. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next speaker is George Pileri, followed by Beta V. Desai. The next speaker is Beta V. Desai, followed by Jason Anthony. The next speaker is Jason Anthony, followed by Kate Slevin. Good evening, everyone. Jason Anthony from the Amazon Labor Union. A uh, couple of things that we have to consider. Uh, one, you guys have Amazon employees that work in the fulfillment center in the west shore of Staten Island that commute by mass transit, either drive from all different parts of the city, even from New Jersey, from the Gothels, Verzano, and from different parts of the city, and um, even um, the Verzano. If you are not a Staten Island resident, you have to pay twenty, almost twenty dollars round trip. And interesting enough, the Verzano Narrows Bridge is the most expensive tolling by far in New York State. Have that in mind. And if we come from New Jersey, from all tollings, in other words, from the GWB South, everybody will be affected. And keep in mind, the Hudson River tunnels, if we have another catastrophe, just like Sandy, the whole Northeast corridor will be affected. So keep that in mind while uh, considering the, the, this tolling. In other words, consider something like dynamic tolling that they have in Central Florida. So they, they charge that, um, by the amount of traffic. So they don't charge overnight. That's the amount of traffic that, uh, that we deal with overnight. And especially, I live in Brooklyn. I see too much traffic on Flatbush Avenue. And, uh, and I see too much traffic too on 34th Street. And please uh, have more of these uh, hearings throughout the months of September and October. So I yield the rest of my time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Kate Slevin, followed by Aretha Tirmizi. Our next speaker is Aretha Tirmizi, followed by David Flaherty. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, my name is Aretha Tirmizi, and I'm a organizer of IDG, I represent Independent Drivers Guild. I'm also a parent of seven children with a disabled child and I'm a for hire vehicle driver. So I wanted to speak certain topics about having a disabled child and with the MTA not providing enough facilities for people with disabilities on wheelchairs. There are many stops on train stations that doesn't have the accessibility for children or adults with disabilities that can go up and down. So as a parent, I have to take a taxi for my child, but having to pay such congestion pricing makes it way more difficult, especially for the disabled community, because 
even if I'm an FHB driver or the person that I'm picking up, somebody has to be responsible for this price to be paid. So this is something very unfair that is happening. This is like being double taxed because as an FHB driver, we're also facing so many restrictions. We have only five boroughs that we can work from. There's so many restrictions. We don't get work outside of the five boroughs. And then we're going to restrict further things in Manhattan. And we have to understand the inflation. There's inflation. Just why are we putting congestion pricing? When the pandemic hit, who were they asking to become essential employees? The FHB drivers, the taxi drivers, they were the ones that, were, that became the essential drivers and they were giving protocol to the essential employees as doctors and nurses. The city also asked us that if we, without even getting paid, they wanted us to drive them and we put our lives at risk. But what did we get in return? We're not getting anything in return as FHB drivers. I'm speaking about all the people who were driving all the essential employees. We were labeled as essential employees also. But what are we getting in return? We're getting another congestion pricing to come over our head. Are we not aware? Are we oblivious of what our inflation rates are going? We're not getting any money extra to pay for our rent. Everything is so much blocked. How do we support our families? Look at the gas prices. We don't, we're not getting any stimulus, nothing. But I just wanna thank you for letting us speak. And I hope this goes in favor, at least consider to keep certain people, like for essential employees, we should have some exemptions. The, the request that they asked us to give during the pandemic, we should be given the same respect back. Thank you, my name is Arifa Termizi, I'm from IDG. Thank you. Our next speaker is David Flaherty, followed by John Doe. Our next speaker is John Doe, followed by Raul Rivera. John, you may unmute and begin your remarks. Um, I, you know, I really am disappointed in the MTA. Um, I see a lot of the people on here have green screens. Um, I just want to know, is that because you guys are not in the office and therefore you don't have to travel to work every day and you don't have to commute into the office, which is, um, I believe, down the block from the Staten Island Ferry, which is free. So those people from Staten Island don't have to pay to commute into the city, but I have to pay $23 on top of the bridge, on top of the gas, just to get in from Brooklyn because you people want to take more money to waste it. None of you on the board are getting paid $60,000. For you to think that $60,000 is enough of a limit to people who don't have to pay, $60,000 is nothing, especially if it's a combined house uh, income. That's ridiculous. For you to think that this is okay and that you can run away with this cash grab without consequences, you people need to understand that we the people have the power and we're gonna come for you at the election time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Raul Rivera, followed by Paul White. Our next speaker is Paul White, followed by Gollum Talukter. Our next speaker is Gollum Talukter, followed by Drew S. Our next speaker is Drew S, followed by Samuel Pan. Our next speaker is Samuel Pan, followed by Patrick Johnson. Our next speaker is Patrick Johnson, followed by Don S. Patrick, you may begin your remarks. Patrick, you are unmuted, but we cannot um, hear you. We 
We still can't hear you. We'll move to our next speaker. If you can try to try a different audio and we will have to come back to you because we can't hear you. Our next speaker is Don S followed by Eric Biscoff. Our next speaker is Eric Biscoff, followed by Kathy Francis. Our next speaker is Kathy Francis, followed by Lincoln Palmer. Our next speaker is Lincoln Palmer, followed by our 320th speaker on the list, Ivan Ventura. Our next speaker is Ivan Ventura, followed by Muhammad Bilal. Our next speaker is Muhammad Bilal, followed by Joseph Toronto. Our next speaker is Joseph Toronto, followed by Jose Paulino. Our next speaker is Jose Paulino, followed by John Banzer. Our next speaker is John Banzer, followed by Austin Ferd. Our next speaker is Austin Ferd, followed by Kendra Hems. Our next speaker is Kendra Hems, followed by Joseph B. Our next speaker is Joseph B, followed by Nathan Stadola. Our next speaker is Nathan Stadola, followed by our 330th speaker on the list, Tess Harkin. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Great. Um, my name is Nathan Stadola, and I live in Windsor Terrace in Brooklyn. I've also submitted my testimony in writing because I didn't know if I'd make it in, but thank you for the opportunity to present tonight. I don't own a car, and I rely on public transit to get to work in Manhattan, to take weekend excursions with my family on commuter railroads, and to visit friends in other boroughs. I'm here to voice my support for the CBD tolling program. By disincentivizing drivers, this program will reduce greenhouse gas emissions and improve local air quality. With fewer drivers, remaining drivers will experience much less traffic and delay, as will our notoriously slow buses. By providing funds, the program will help keep New York City's metro system operating smoothly and give it money to expand capacity. It is important to minimize exceptions since otherwise the toll for the remaining toll pairs will simply have to increase. So I strongly support plan A or G. I actually really like that you've proposed the idea of um, the flat fee for trucks as well, because I heard a great point before since the um, people can take trains, but packages can't. So I think both plans A and G are worth considering. As the largest city in the United States, New York deserves the best transit system, and the CBD tolling system can help the MTA accomplish that. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Tess Harkin, followed by Patrick Johnson. Our next speaker is Patrick Johnson, followed by Todd Mazel. Hi, Patrick. Oh, Hi, uh, yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, great. I'm very sorry about that. Uh, I just wanted to talk about congestion pricing. I'm a middle-class New Yorker. I'm a stagehand with a 4,000-member union. Uh, I just wanted to talk about the guy in the Bronx who said he about a bike lane on the Verrazano Bridge. The Verrazano Bridge is three miles long with a steep grade. No one who can commute to work every day is going to be able to ride over the Verrazano. The Staten Island Borough President said there was 500 crashes plus on the Verrazano Bridge last year. Uh, there's a major, we, got, we got major problems here before congestion pricing. Okay, that's number one. And uh, I really think that the White House should be involved here because this is, this is an East Coast thing here. This is going to affect economy. This is going to affect lives. This is going to affect 
big banks and corporations and Wall Street. This is this is not just something not to be played with lightly here. This is not a joke. I mean, where, where, where do these people think people are going to go for the big money? How are you going to get employees into Manhattan who, who's, who are going to wash dishes and cook food and do, you know, jobs that are, I mean, people do these jobs. I mean, there is these jobs that people have to get to these jobs. And uh, I wanted to talk about the guy complained about slow buses and deliveries, people double parked. Uh, this this study, this data that they got for congestion pricing to raise $15 billion. this was before outdoor dining. This was before they took away all the commercial loading zones in the city, okay? Um, they, they're saying by law they have to do congestion pricing. By law, the Staten Island Ferry is supposed to run every half hour, every half an hour by law. OK, it's been law for like the last three years. They break the law constantly. There is no penalties. Uh, in New York City, DOT is an embarrassment. I'm not even going to go there. OK, they're an embarrassment in this whole uh, thing here. All right. And I'd like to see somebody go from the MTA. I'd like to see somebody from DOT, from the government. I don't see Kathy Holchel in here. I don't see Eric Adams in here. I'd like to see them go to 60th Street in Manhattan and 5th Avenue and go see the outdoor dining structure on 60th Street between 5th Avenue and Madison and see how much of it takes away of truck parking and then see the guy with the coffee cart with his car full of coffee cups and garbage taking away the whole parking lane there. I mean, uh, the left turning lane. So now you get traffic backing up onto Madison, okay? This is a big problem. There's so much things that can be solved that are so easily done that it's pathetic that this is what we're wasting, we're putting all our efforts to, all right? I'm going to be at all these congestion pricing meetings. You will not, you will be seeing more of me. Uh, uh, let me see, let me see. The yellow taxi industry, destroyed. You guys destroyed it. You let Uber, Uber should not be doing pickups from like a pickup on like 55th and 5th to go drive somebody down to the West Village. That should be a yellow taxi job. That's got to stop immediately. Uh, I got, I got, you're gonna, I'm gonna be here all week. All week I'll be doing this. The woman from the Bronx was very upset. Eric Adams should hear how upset that woman from the Bronx was. And so should Kathy Holchel. I'll see you at the next meeting. Thanks so much. Have a great night. Thank you. Our next speaker is Todd Mazel, followed by Felicia Park Rogers. Our next speaker is Felicia Park Rogers, followed by Stone Yee. Hi. Uh, good evening. My name is Felicia Park Rogers and I'm with the Regional Transit Advocacy and Policy Organization Tri-State Transportation Campaign. And tonight I want to join with those in support of congestion pricing. The key to ensuring safer, more reliable, efficient, and accessible public transportation, as well as cleaner air, less traffic congestion, and safer roads is through a swift implementation of congestion pricing. It is absolutely imperative for the USDOT, the state and the city to support the program's implementation. Congestion pricing is expected to generate $15 billion, thus allowing the MTA to complete its essential capital program to improve longstanding issues plaguing our public transit systems. That said, after review of the recent draft of the EA, we do call on the state and the city to act swiftly to mitigate any potential negative effects that congestion pricing may have on environmental justice communities located in New York City's outer boroughs. The environmental assessment lists seven potential tolling scenarios to investigate potential impacts. Almost all tolling scenarios achieve the necessary funding goals and we are glad for this. Tolling the Manhattan CBD will lead to reduced traffic entering the area with a net benefit and congestion reduction for the whole region. Daily truck traffic in Manhattan's core would decline anywhere from 21% to 81%, meaning thousands of trucks will no longer drive through Manhattan. The diversion of these trucks has been accounted for through truck reduction programs outlined in the environmental assessment. Any discounts, crossing credits, and exemptions will lead to higher toll rates. If more exemptions are allowed, higher toll rates will lead to more traffic reduction in the Manhattan CBD. But will also lead to increased traffic diversions, including increases along the Cross Bronx and the Staten Island Expressway. Depending on the scenario, potential adverse impacts turn up along the Staten Island Expressway and Cross Bronx. The MTA will need to mitigate these impacts as it creates the final program. This is eminently doable and should not become a reason to stop congestion pricing. 
the MTA's current transition towards electrifying its fleet through deploying zero emission buses will, will reduce pollutant emissions in neighborhoods traditionally underserved and those most affected by poor air quality and climate change, such as the South Bronx. The MTA has developed a new environmental justice scoring for framework that will help actively conceptualize and incorporate the electrification deployment phasing process. Later this year, when electric buses are received in the MTA's next procurement of battery electric buses, the MTA will prioritize the Kingsbridge Depot and Gun Hill Depot, both affecting Upper Manhattan and the Bronx. In conclusion, I strongly support implementing congestion pricing in combination with swift prioritization of mitigation measures in any areas identified to have any potential negative impacts. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Stone Yi, followed by Dorothy DeLulo. My name is Stella, S-T-E-L-L-A. Thank you for sharing the plan, allowing the public to provide input. I'm American and my ethnicity is Chinese. I was an avid user of public transportation, but due to the rising crime, especially to the Asian community, I resorted to using my car most of the time. I too reside in the central business district and find it a point that individuals living in the zone would be charged a toll or any other individual be charged a toll. It would be advantageous to re-examine the way MTA uses the funding received and eliminate wasteful spending via unnecessary overtime pay and corruption. Adding a new revenue stream will not address the system, uh, systemic issues within the MTA. Using the guise of environmental impact will not address the true underlying issues, which is waste and corruption. The solution is to fix the current system not create additional revenue streams that will line the pockets of various individuals. I'm sure anyone within the MTA executives will not be paying a penny into this pricing. You'll be exempt because you'll be using government funded cars. Reynoso considers public transportation reliable. Well, almost on a daily occurrence, there's an attack on a commuter using train, buses, and there are delays. Betsy Plum, who represents the riders, Stays congestion pricing is the way to go. Well, it is not. Fixing what is broken is the way, not pouring additional funds into a broken system. I agree with individuals on this platform stating this pricing system impacts the low middle incomers more than any other class. I agree with the official if elected into Congress to repeal this plan. I also agree with Lee Berman and his commitment regarding the lack of safety using public transportation. We need to improve the public transportation. That needs to occur first. We have not exhausted other options before congestion pricing. How can you increase ridership if the systemic issues have not been addressed? Thank you for the opportunity to share my thoughts. Thank you. Our next speaker is Dorothy DeLulo, followed by Al Al. Our next speaker is Al Al, followed by Howard Birnbaum. Our next speaker is Howard Birnbaum, followed by Borislav Borisov. Uh, Howard, you may proceed. Uh, hello, good evening. How are you? I, I, I'm against this whole thing because it's not fair for, for those four boroughs have to pay twice every time. So I'm against this whole thing. Thank you for your time. Have a good evening. Thank you. You're welcome. Our next speaker is Borislav Borisov, followed by Joseph Tedeschi. Our next speaker is Joseph Tedeschi, followed by Madeline Rumley. 
Our next speaker, the 341st sign up is Madeline Rummely, followed by Sherelle Nix McKay. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, please proceed. Hi, I'm sorry, I was dealing with my two-year-old. Um, hi, my name is Madeline. I'm a native New Yorker. Uh, I'm a mom of a two-year-old. I work full-time. I live in Brooklyn. I was raised in Washington Heights and I uh, commute to work in the uh, by Times Square. Um, I have been riding the subway pretty much every day since the 1980s and I fully support congestion pricing. Um, I now live in the middle of Brooklyn and I find that I wait sometimes so long for the subway um, and the amount of connections and the amount of delays or subways just that aren't running um, that I bought a bike last year after never biking in the city at all because I thought it was too dangerous. Um, and it is because as a pedestrian last year, my son was hit by a car and almost killed. Um, anyway, I uh, now bike with him uh, on dangerous New York City streets because um, I find that it's just my only way of getting around. I don't own a car um, and I urge that we support congestion pricing because we need to have better subway access for everybody. I don't have money for a car. I don't pay for Uber. I know many of my neighbors feel the same way. Um, I see those uh, here who own homes and who are crying poverty, even though they also own cars. Uh, because they haven't been paying their fair share, and now they need to pay their fair share. The people who have been paying for this are the people who can't afford to, who have been waiting way too long for equal access to be able to get around their city. Uh, and we all deserve the right to be able to um, have access to transportation in New York City, and it's never going to be by cars. If we all rode a car, it would be impossible for New York City to function. And I think even the drivers all know that. It doesn't matter uh, who you are. We need to make sure that we get transportation that's funded, that works for older people, people with disabilities, mothers like myself who have a very hard time using our public transportation system. Uh, and the solution is not cars. The solution is a better, modern, well-funded transportation system. Um, it's just, this, Subway is statistically safer than driving. We all know that pedestrian deaths are very high. There's been at least 100 people that have died on New York City streets just this year. Far fewer than have had any instances of danger on the subway. Uh, I also want to say as a member of the Park Slope Civic Council and of CB6 in Brooklyn that uh, this has wide support in my district. Thank you very much for your time. And I hope that we pass this as soon as possible. Thank you. Our next speaker is Sherelle Nix McKay, followed by Tom Fox. Our next speaker is Tom Fox, followed by Scott Sloat. Our next speaker is Scott Sloat, followed by Dana Affleck. Hello? Please Can proceed, Scott. Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, I would just like to say that I think it's sort of um, surprising or disappointed, actually, that the MTA hasn't spoken more about serious efforts to balance their budget and create cost savings before coming for, the con before con coming for congestion pricing. Uh, instead, all one hears is the need for more money and more money. Uh, I think this is sort of symptomatic of a corporation out of control and with a lack of sense of fiduciary responsibility 
to the people it's meant to serve. Additionally, I think that the um, city and MTA are unable to provide safe and reliable service. So many people have switched to bikes rather than the subways due to the issues of cleanly, cleanliness and safety. I think that needs to be addressed and resolved before you can expect to increase ridership. I think it's kind of shocking also that it hasn't really been addressed, but lately you sort of seen more and more um, reports of the decreased speed of crosstown traffic due to congestion. However, I think it should be noted that over the past few years, the city, the DOT have created the congestion by reducing lanes available for traffic by creating turn lanes, parking, bike lanes, and restaurant outdoor dining. Yes, outdoor dining was needed during the pandemic, but as we all know, that seems to be ebbing. These block lanes have created the congestion and increased the numbers of double park delivery trucks as there's literally nowhere else for them to park. In many cases, what were five to six lane avenues have been reduced to two lanes plus a turn lane such as 7th Avenue coming off of Central Park South or 8th Avenue around 34th Street. I would question how independent the study panels actually were. I think everyone is aware of how any report can be altered or data manipulated to present the desired outcome. I think perhaps a more reasonable starting point would be to implement this with the trucks and the commercial vehicles, Amazon, FedEx, UPS, these giant companies that are using the lanes and create much of the traffic rather than imposing upon everyday citizens. This all being said, I think that this is seen and it's unfair and it needs to be further studied. If this does go through, then there should be no exemptions for any government, MTA or DOT employees. If it's good enough for your citizens to pay, it's good enough for you too as well. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Dana Affleck, followed by Tuhami Ben Masood. Please proceed, Dana. Thank you. Um, I wanted to start by saying that I um, am sharing my comments because I am. Um, strongly in favor of congestion pricing. However, um, and I should say that is for a whole variety of reasons. Um, we need to reduce traffic in the city for climate reasons. We need to reduce it um, so that people can get around and access the CBD equitably. Um, however, and we need to fund the MTA to make um, the changes that are necessary to support working and middle-class families and folks um, with disabilities. However, I strongly also believe in a just transition and a just transition must center jobs and justice um, in frontline and working communities while we transition our economies and our infrastructure to meet the climate goals that we need to have a future we can all live in. It's clear to me that the architects of this plan have not done a good enough job to engage with frontline and working class people. And the idea that someone who has a car can afford to pay a congestion price up to $23 is absurd. Um, the idea that you know the federal poverty line is a good place to draw a line of someone's ability to drive a car and be able to pay this congestion pricing is also absurd. We should be actually thinking about what is practical when we think about someone living in New York City in any of the boroughs or the surrounding um, areas where we have workers that commute into New York City. So I, I do want to support congestion pricing. I want that noted on the record. And I want it to be very, very clear that exemptions must be designed to ensure an actual just, just transition for the people that live in this city and support this city and keep this city running. There are enough corporations and millionaires and billionaires to go around in New York City that can very easily fund these sorts of schemes and they should not be disproportionately harming working class folks and low middle class folks. So um, yeah, 
I want to, I, I've heard from everyone tonight, I've been listening all night, and I really understand why this is freaking out people who rely on their cars to work and live in this city and the outer boroughs. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Tuhami Ben Masood, followed by Yuki Endo. The next speaker is Yuki Endo, followed by Levit Quincy Jones. The next speaker is Levit Quincy Jones, followed by Shmuel Avital. The next speaker is the 351st sign up, Shmuel Avital, to be followed by Gregory Dreyfus. The next speaker is Gregory Dreyfus, followed by Kamol Sarwar. Hello, oh, can you hear me? Yes, we can, please proceed. Oh, yes, uh, I'm calling in, I, I think a lot of these sessions don't fully reflect the average person. It's the type of person who can show up at 10 p.m. on the evening uh, in the middle of a work week. And I, I want to give voice, I'm, I'm a suburbanite, I live in Nassau County, uh, and I'm in strong support of uh, congestion pricing. And I want to give voice to that support as a suburbanite. Most New Yorkers don't own cars. That point has been made before this evening. And the vast majority of people entering the central business, uh, business district tra travel by transit. We need to prioritize those average New Yorkers. And so rather than thinking about exemptions, I, I would encourage the MTA to think about other implementation questions about why it took so long to implement congestion pricing uh, to get this priority out the door. Um, you know, an environmental impact was done, but what was the environmental impact of waiting to do such a long review of congestion pricing? Um, and how can those delays be, be lessened in the future? People have brought up um, the problem of how MTA uses its money. I think that is no small thing. And I think it's not a side issue to congestion pricing. If people had more trust in how the MTA spent its money um, go a long way in fostering buy-in for congestion pricing to the remaining doubters. And so I think it's crucial that the MTA think critically about using uh, the funds that come from congestion pricing more uh, economically, more efficiently, and to invest in uh, cross borough and north to south as a Long Islander uh, transit. I was very pardoned by uh, Governor Hochul's uh, Interborough Express idea to move between Queens and Brooklyn. I would also love to see greater transit options north and south uh, across Long Island, across Nassau County, Suffolk County, across Westchester, expand transit access so that people don't have to own a car to live in New York City. People should not have to own a car. People should be able to get around without one. And that's what congestion pricing should be about. That means using the money economically, and that means raising the funds to improve uh, transit options, transit reliability, transit speeds, and, and that's what I want to say. Thank you very much. I support congestion pricing. Please get this done. Have a good evening. Thank you. The next speaker is Kamal Sarwar, followed by Adam Phillips. The next speaker is Adam Phillips, followed by Christopher Sanders. The next speaker is Christopher Sanders, followed by Zaire Baptiste. The next speaker is Zaire Baptiste, followed by Tom Kazarowski. The next speaker is Tom Kazarowski, followed by John Law. The next speaker is John Law, followed by Kawas Terrigan. The next speaker, the 360th to sign up, is Kawas Terrigan, followed by Megan Dyer. 
The next speaker is Megan Dyer, followed by Jasmine Vasquez. The next speaker is Jasmine Vasquez, followed by M.D. Hussein. The next speaker is M.D. Hussein, followed by Grayson Paris. The next speaker is Grayson Paris, followed by Sean Johnson Jr. The next speaker is Sean Johnson Jr., followed by Harry Malakoff. The next speaker is Harry Malakoff, followed by Nana Impofo. The next speaker is Nana Impofo, followed by Morgan Adze. The next speaker is Morgan Adze, followed by Ahmad Ali. The next speaker is Ahmad Ali, followed by Tamika Flowers Ball. The next speaker, the 370th to sign up is Tamika Flowers Ball, followed by Jamal King. The next speaker is Jamal King, followed by Allegra Legrand. The next speaker is Allegra Legrand, followed by Danny Sena. Hello. Hello, you may proceed. Seat. Thank you. Uh, hello, my name is Allegra Legrand. I am a resident of Inwood. I live adjacent to the Kingsbridge bus depot. Uh, I, I am strongly in support of the congestion pricing plan in general, but I have deep concerns about the I-95 corridor, including not only the Cross Bronx, but also the park that crosses Manhattan. And in particular, I'm worried about extra congestion related to the George Washington Bridge. Already uptown, we have a lot of children who suffer from asthma at a disproportionate high rate, including my own child. And I wanna make sure that our air quality is taken into full consideration. I'm a little bit perplexed as to why uh, there's going to be monitoring for two years and we're not presented in the environmental assessment statement already with ozone and particulate matter uh, modeling already. If we know the volume of trucks, why we don't have the mo modeling output already and, and projections for how much exactly our air quality is going to be deteriorated. With that in mind, I'm excited about the prospect of having electric buses, but I have to tell you that most of the diesel vehicles that I see uptown are not buses, they're actually trucks. And I'm perplexed why there is not some sort of incentivization scheme to get more electrified diesel engines in general, not limited to the buses. I also would like to see mass transit made easier for folks in living in the five boroughs. Uh, for instance, in my neighborhood, we have easy access to the Metro North, but in practice, no one takes the Metro North because it's three times the cost of taking the subway. Why haven't plans that would make the cost equivocal for taking the Metro North or Long Island Railroad uh, to uh, taking the subway? Why haven't those plans been presented as part of the overall congestion pricing with the goal of decreasing the number of people who are reliant on their vehicles to commute into the city? I'd also uh, like to see more incentivization for uh, cycling and other micro mobility type transportations like people are going, not going to be taking cars, but what are they going to be doing? I think that the environmental assessment and the, the, uh, the plans study did not go far enough with the carrot portion, making it easier for people to bike, make it easier for people to take scooters and other non-car options. Um, I'd also like to see congestion pricing, therefore, not limited to just uh, the central business district, but congestion pricing in general for the entire five boroughs with, with a zoned uh, approach so that we don't disproportionately bear the burden of uh, deleterious air quality uptown and in the outer boroughs to having uh, the central business district have decreased congestion. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Danny Sena, followed by Leah Strzok. The next speaker is Leah Strzok, followed by Evelyn David.
Leah Strzok. Leah, once you're unmuted, you can begin. We'll come back to Leah. The next speaker is Evelyn David, followed by Joseph Lading. The next speaker is Joseph Lading followed by Alexis Bruno. The next speaker is Alexis Bruno, followed by Michael Huarachi. The next speaker is Michael Huarachi, followed by Jenny Lee. Go ahead, Michael. Michael, 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 we'll have to come back to you. The next speaker is Jenny Lee, followed by Sam Streeter. The next speaker is Sam Streeter the 380th sign up to be followed by Charlene Burke. The next speaker is Charlene Burke, followed by Jay Ehrlich. The next speaker is Jay Ehrlich, followed by Avi Bortnick. The next speaker is Avi Bortnick, followed by Mika White. The next speaker is Mika White, followed by Ronald Simoncini. The next speaker is Ronald Simoncini, followed by Ned Day. The next speaker is Ned Day, followed by Michelle Grossman. The next speaker is Michelle Grossman, followed by Luann Kanopko. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, please proceed. Thank you. Hi, I both live and work in the CBD and am against congestion pricing. I'll be focusing today on the lack of transparency, planning, and good faith in this public review and comment process. At future hearings, I'll touch on my concerns and solutions. On August 10th, the Notice of Availability of Environmental Assessment and Public Hearings was released with the cutoff date for comment. Mom, could you speak a little slower? Just four days after Labor Day. The 868-page report was released as summer is winding down, a popular time for vacationing and downtime. As I mentioned, I both live and work in the CBD, and I haven't seen a single attempt for this to be publicized on the ground to this people to the people this will greatly impact. Most people who I spoke to have no idea this is a thing and no idea that they're being asked as a member of the public for their feedback. Speaking for myself, I have a job and commitments and wasn't able to read the 868 page report in full that was released just 15 days ago. If public opinion was truly desired, perhaps more time and notice to read through so many materials would have made sense. Perhaps it would have made sense to ask the public- Ma'am, please. Speak a little slower. I have a lot to say. Have the review and feedback with a strategic mindset, as in not during a one-week window during the final Ma moment. Of please summer, speak a little slower. When people are either checked out or gearing up for back to school, perhaps this was all very strategic, as in the broader public's opinion and feedback is not actually desired in this whole process. I share all of this because. 
because there is a serious lack of transparency, planning, and good faith, or a combination of those things that's going on here. And those are critical qualities for an endeavor like this. I'm calling on the MTA to actually work in the best interest of the very people in community they plan to rely on to generate the revenue needed to meet their budget shortfalls. My elected officials will be hearing from me as well. I have the benefit of going almost last. Of the 67 people who spoke, only 24%, 16 people were fully for, 47 against, and four people were for, but with strong exceptions to the current plan. Anyone who self-identified as elderly is against this. Business owners, immigrants, disabled people, caretakers, essential workers, taxi, FHH drivers are against this. If I'm being blunt, those who commented as for this had an air of privilege. Meanwhile, others who are speaking as if their livelihoods and lives because they do. Please take all of that feedback seriously. And to those with the talking point of as minimal exemptions as possible, what do you want the elderly, disabled, caretakers, those driving to medical appointments like chemo, low but not low enough income people, what do you want them to do? They won't survive. I provide this feedback in good faith and I hope it is taken as such. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Luann Kanopko, followed by Leah Strzok. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Thanks for giving us the opportunity to weigh in and staying to hear us all. Um, I've had a love-hate relationship with Manhattan for many decades, first as a city resident and strap hanger, and then as a Long Island resident, and now as a resident of Rockland County, and I've experienced firsthand the increase in congestion and decrease in air quality. So I understand the need for some sort of a program. However, I second everything Assemblyman Waller has already said. This is um, unfortunately grossly unfair to Rockland County residents in particular. I'm speaking in the first person, but please know that I'm also speaking for all of my neighbors. The first and most significant point I'd like to make is that I already personally subsidize the MTA. This is through the Metropolitan Commuter Transportation Mobility Tax. This tax is imposed on every employer within the Metropolitan Commuter Transportation District, which includes Rockland County. And it includes the self-employed, so it comes directly out of my pocket, not from some corporate coffer. So, as a Rockland County resident, the CBD toll would effectively tax me twice for the same thing that I can't even use. Living at the northernmost end of the county, I have no practical public transportation options into the city, while Westchester, Connecticut, Long Island, and even parts of New Jersey have one seat train rides into Manhattan with a high frequency of runs. Buses into and out of the PA bus terminal aren't even a viable option because from my town, Service has been greatly reduced since June 2021, and when operating, the bus ride is two hours one way, and if I should miss the bus home, later runs are few and far between. So when I need to get into Manhattan, I really have no choice but to drive, and I pay a significant toll already to do so. As illustrated earlier, the vast majority of drivers originate from within the immediate vicinity of the CBD. A great number do have a variety of public transportation options available to them, and many don't pay to drive into Manhattan like I already do. Further, unlike drivers of delivery trucks or for hire vehicles, I do not continuously drive around the city adding to the pollution and congestion. I drive directly to and from a parking garage on the west side, the fee for which I must add also includes a high city tax. And finally, if I had to pay the CBD toll, I feel I would just be supporting the habits of more well-to-do individuals who actually have public transit options don't mind paying the new toll. They will continue to drive or be driven into and throughout the city, no matter what the cost. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Leah Strzok, followed by Saul Green.
Leah Strock. The next speaker is Saul Green. Hello. By hi. Oh, hi. Yeah. Hi. Can you hear me? Please proceed. Hi. Sorry. Please. Sorry about that. I was having some cute computer pro uh, computer problems. Uh, thank you for dealing with me. Um, I live on the Lower East Side. Um, I have lived here almost all my life. Um, what you call the Central Business District is actually not a Central Business District where I live. It is actually not business at all. This is where we live. Um, and so what you're doing is you're putting it, us in this business district, even though that this is residential. So I really have an issue with that. Um, I know that you're fashioning this after London. People who live in London where there is the um, the congestion charges are exempt from those from that area. And come on, we have to face it. The people who live in from 60th Street below, it's not us that is causing all the congestion. You know that, and we know that. Second of all, and I hear what people are saying about you know cyclists, and I find this really ableist because I'm a 65 year old woman, and I find it more and more difficult to take public transportation. I do it, but it's I have to go really slowly, and you know people are in a rush, and it becomes more and more dangerous. And so our our um, subway system is really not set up for anyone who can't move rapidly, and. We do have a lot of elderly people in this area. And, and out over the years, our taxes have just gone up and up and up. And putting this congestion charge on top of this is just going to make it so the people who are, you know, middle class and, and, and working class are going to just have to leave the city. And what you're going to end up with is you're going to end up with a whole Manhattan full of, of billionaires um, who come here sometimes, they don't care about the congestion charge because they're going to just pay it anyway. So I think that you really need to look at having some exemptions, especially for people who live in this area. So every time I, I move my car, I'm going to get charged. I mean, I work a lot sometimes on the outer boroughs. So I'm, I'm not even in rush hour in Manhattan. So, I, I mean, think about it. The people who live below 60th Street who have cars are very minimal. And the ones that they do, we are not the ones that are causing all this congestion. And I think that you really need to pay attention to that. All right, thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Saul Green, followed by Michael Guarachi. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Please proceed. I'm sorry. Uh, I was having technical difficulties. Uh, hi, I'm Saul Green from Brooklyn. I work as a volunteer at work. I'm a volunteer for an organization that has 800 volunteers. We service basically communities and two communities in Brooklyn, Bar Park and Williamsburg. Last year, we serviced 43,000 calls of taking people to hospitals and doctor appointments and people who go for treatment for cancer, etc., and therapy. And we're mainly concerned where, where we come into the city, is not, we're not there to park. We're just taking people to hospitals, dropping them off or picking them up. We want to make sure that our service does not get disrupted by having to pay this uh, congestion pricing fee. Uh, we have people who rely on this tra transportation. They cannot take public transportation. And essentially, we save money for, this, for the MTA by not using the accessorized, which is a nightmare for, for people that have to take that, traveling with other people. And I also see that the federal government is involved in this. I know the federal government covers volunteers' expenses 
for voluntary work, so one know if they would pick up this hat and give credits for the toll that we have to pay if this comes through. Thanks for my listening to my comments. Thank you. Our next speaker is Michael Harachi, followed by Edward P. Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. Uh, first of all, I want to thank all the panelists for being here for five hours listening to everybody complain. Thank you very much. It really means a lot to us. I've lived in the district for over 20 years. I'm from New Jersey originally. I'm familiar with driving. I do rent a car every now and then, so I know how that feels as frustrating as it can be to drive into the district. Um, I also donate my time to uh, plant street trees, over 300 street trees in the area. I've donated my time with Port Authority. Uh, I'm familiar with Colleen Chattergoon, Mr. Carey's uh, counterpart at the New York City DOT. Um, I look forward to doing a lot of work with, um, with everybody here in the next upcoming meetings. I fully endorse congestion pricing. Uh, let's remember that this must be one tool in the toolbox. It must be part of an arsenal to combat climate change. Uh, it must include no exemptions or as few as possible. Um, uh, a, this, this can be part of the toolbox, which should include also loading zones. I know this is beyond the purview of this project. Expanded red light speeding acoustic cameras digitized and streamlined into every traffic light across all five boroughs. Car-free Broadway 24-7, 365, the entire stretch separating east from west traffic. We're talking about enforcing the illegal 53-foot tractor ban that's already not enforced, uh, creating a placard corruption force that is citizens enforced, removing, most importantly, I would say, removing the NYPD from traffic enforcement, uh, implementing citizens enforcement, run more buses and trains, right? A lot of us are co complaining about the trains, the subways, the not reliable. I'm not arguing with that, but Will the E-Train get me to JFK? Sure. Will it take two hours? Okay. But that's something that we can cross that bridge when we get there, right? Let's put the horse before the carriage, not the carriage before, before the horse. Let's shrink the delivery fleets, NYP, NYPD, FedEx, USPS, UPS, Amazon, et cetera. Uh, implement those off-peak hours, as somebody said earlier. Connected, fully protected, dual lane bike lane network. Abolish parking minimums containerized tra trash replacing parking spots, uh, more street seats, more dining structures. Um, this is the opportunity for the panelists to shape your legacy through design and implementation of the country's first and most influential urban transportation projects in the country. I live in the city, I work the city, I take the subway and I keep the city running. Thank you and thank you for your time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Edward P. followed by Sylvia Lynn. The next speaker is Sylvia Lynn followed by Sunny. Sylvia Lynn. Sylvia will come back. The next speaker is Sunny, followed by Ari Aronowitz. Go 
Hello, can you hear me? Yes, please proceed. So I, I would start by, I do want to support congestions, but until you, get, until you guys can explain why we pay for roads, why we pay for tunnels and pay for bridges, now we got to pay for transit riders as well. Why do drivers have to pay for train riders? My next door neighbor is not going to pay for my housework. President Biden gave you guys money already. Don't tell me you already spent it. I hope you spent it wisely. I'll give you money for one only one condition. I want somebody to ask Allison, Rick, Lou, what did you do with the 50 cents you raised on the transit riders once before to clean up the subways? You didn't clean it up at all. At all. Where did that 50 cents go? And the transit riders should be the one paying, not us. Or if anything, let's compromise. Let's both pay. Why do drivers are the only ones who have to pay? I find that unfair. For structure repair, you got money from Biden. And I still don't understand where that went. And I would agree with MTA if they, if they open their book and find out where all the money went, then I'll pay. I have no problem. But we must know where all the money went. You guys take money for cleaning up subways, this, that, whatever. I This time, I see everybody's against. The ones that are against, uh, uh, that are uh, with uh, congestion pricing, next time you guys raise 75 cents on them and they start complaining and they want our support, we won't support them. And I agree with uh, Ms. Leah who said that congestion prices should be only in Wall Street. That is Central Business District. That's where all the businesses are, not where residents live. I find this very ridiculous. I think it's completely unthought process that's going on. Go back to the table and come up with a reasonable price at least. Okay, I'll be with you. Come up with a reasonable price. $23? That's ridiculous. Biden, again, I'll repeat, Biden has already given you money. Why do you want to attack us? We can't afford it. Like I said, open up the MTA books and find out where all the money went. And then maybe we'll talk about supporting you guys. And thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ari Aronowitz, followed by anonymous speaker number one. Our next speaker is anonymous speaker one, followed by Lourdes Aquino. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Thanks everyone for your time. Um, my name is Sarah. I'm a born and bred New Yorker. I was born in Manhattan, lived in the Bronx till the age of 10 and most of my adult life in Manhattan. I currently live in the mid sixties on the West side. I have several concerns with this plan and I implore the Federal Highway Administration to reject the CBD tolling program as currently proposed by the MTA. A genuine congestion reduction plan would be collaborated upon and jointly proposed by the various city and state agencies beyond the MTA, such as those who oversee construction sites, restaurant, sanitation activities, and the plethora of items that contribute to congestion around the city, as well as the roadway authorities and whatnot. These all contribute to congestion. It's not just cars. I'll try to focus my concerns and on suggestions um, that haven't already been made. I'm an ardent supporter of all environmentally conscious measures locally and globally. However, this, this proposal is a false promise of reduced, of reduced congestion, especially given the projected single digit percentage reduction in vehicular use and is just a guise for funding the MTA. I'm all for improving our transit infrastructure. New York has the widest transit infrastructure, one of in the world, 
but the MTA needs to be first federally audited and to also pursue alternative and stable funding sources or to get semi-privatized with a private equity infusion or a turnaround investor, or maybe Michael Bloomberg should take over and, and turn it around. Here are my concerns. All that the current proposal is going to do is further divide New York City, literally and metaphorically. It's going to move congestion into Northern Manhattan, into Queens and Northern New Jersey as drivers avoid the business district. My biggest concern that I haven't heard about all night is the impact to traffic in particular just north and just south of 60th Street. It's gonna create a border with Man within Manhattan that makes no sense, especially given the vast majority of Manhattanites who, or Manhattan's residential neighborhoods, excuse me, are north of 60th Street. I'm concerned about the traffic, the noise and the air quality. I also think any comparison to other cities implementation of re congestion reducing efforts is disingenuous, in particular, any comparison to Singapore. So if the MTA passes muster and the only way is for citizens to fund the MTA, then we need to widen the area and decrease the cost. Widen it to the entire five boroughs. That should be the congestion pricing zone. Have you ever seen traffic in Brooklyn or Queens or by the airports? And all city, all city residents should be exempt and all trucks that support essential services should be exempt. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Lourdes Aquino to be followed by Sylvia Lynn. Good evening, and thank you for allowing us to have the platform to share our thoughts, you know, regarding this congestion pricing. I'm sure everyone has had a long day, but we all know external customer service is just as important as in internal customer service. So again, I thank you so much for staying on this late. You know, I'm a native New Yorker, and I grew up with getting around New York City by train or bus. I have no problem with the MTA in that regard. However, I have a few concerns that I'd like to share, and after I have listened to other people's opinions, I can understand all sides, right? So there are three sides, right? We have the MCA's position on congestion pricing, those for congestion pricing, right? And then those who aren't for congestion pricing. I'm somebody who makes lemonade out of lemons. So I kind of go with the flow and I try to figure out how to work, right? All New Yorkers figure that out. We face daily obstacles every single day. Um, and I do agree with the env environmental benefits. I have a daughter and I want the best future for her um, and all the other youth as well. They're the ones who are going to save the world, right? But the $9 to $23 fee is really, I normally don't do these kind of things. I speak in front of people. I have my colleagues I talk with. But, you know, for this level, I feel like, you know, what's going to be done is going to be done, right? Um, and it is good to speak up. And, and that's how, um, you know, everybody can see each other's sides and how, you know, choices affect each other. You know, I lived in Lower Manhattan for 40 years. I could understand the traffic issues. I hated it around Grand Street. You know, it was it was tremendous, right? And then I love bikes, but you know, the bike lanes came. I heard a couple of people make comments like, I went from two lanes to one lane. I've caught myself not having road rage, but a little upset, like, you know, they're cutting people off. There's no room. I get it, right? It's normal. We're human. Um, but I moved in 2020, not because of the pandemic, but because where I lived became extremely dangerous. I grew up there in the 80s and the 90s. I never thought I would leave, right? But I had to. And then, you know, Manhattan wasn't as affordable as normal, right? I wish I made more money, but you know, that next next life, right? Maybe I'll become an MTA panel, you know, member or board member like you all. But every day, the point is I drive my daughter to school on East 4th Street. I take the BQE. I have to get there to her school by 815. Then I have to be at my job by 830 in Lower Manhattan, right by City Hall. You know, I'm sure some will say, hey, get up early and take the train, whatever, you know, everybody has an opinion. But if I took the bus or train, which I've tried before from my daughter's school to my job, I don't make it there on time. And I don't wanna be one of those employees that create problems. So all I really wanna ask all of you is that please take, I know people say no exemption, but please take people like me and working families like me into consideration. Charge us the same fee that you do for the train to get on the train. My husband takes the train. That's what I wanna let you know. Every day he takes the train. So we're in support of it, but please. And I know that some of you look tired. I could see all the, Will, I see he's been looking different ways. You know, I'm on Zoom meetings too. I know when you lose, and it's been a lot of talk, 
But please, all of you, women, men, take into consideration conclude our your hardship. Thank you so much and have a good evening. Thank you. Our next speaker is Sylvia Lynn, followed by Stefania Kupalova. Sylvia Lynn. Our next speaker is Stefania Kupalova, followed by Roy. Our next speaker is Roy, followed by James Lee. Hello? Yes, Roy, please proceed. Yeah, I mean, I, I just wanted to say, like, the $15 billion uh, for capital uh, raised the, 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 for the capital program, it really goes towards paying for the MTA, which has not been able to keep up with its payments uh, to, to support its own infrastructure, to support its own. I mean, like, look at 2011. You know, you guys made half of what the operating budget was just out of, you can't support yourself out of, out of tolls. I mean, uh, out of fares uh, from the, from the subway. So really it, it, it's all, it's all about, you know, being able to meet the operating budget without depending on the state, which you often do to bail you out. Um, and really what, what this money is going to go towards is, is like, I've, like a lot of people have mentioned before, um, just things that really we don't need, um, repairs that just continues, continue, continue to happen every three, five years, 10 years. And it, it really, like the MTA just needs to be revisioned, reimagined, I think. Uh, we need a, a a much much newer, more modern system, and I, I don't think the fifteen billion dollars is going to do it. What it's going to do is just it's going to keep the problems. It's just like patching the problems up, um, and it's really unfair. I think for people to be paying that toll for all the the you know the, the working families, especially to be paying that, you know, because one way or another we're going to pay for it, whether whether it's the tolls or it's you know through 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 the state subsidies that you guys get through the federal money that you guys get one way or another we're paying for it and now we're paying twice for it so it's, it's ridiculous it's ridiculous uh, i don't think it's fair at all i think the no action alternative should should take place instead until a better plan and also like coming out of the pandemic come on like after two years of being hammered by the pandemic and now you guys are going to introduce this plan that's going to take jobs from people from 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 the taxis from the from the ubers that's gonna you know it's, it's just disastrous disastrous timing horrible timing uh you know well that's my time thank you and th but, but thank you for sticking around until the 10 you know a night it's crazy you guys are crazy thank you thank you our next speaker the 400th person to sign up is james lee to be followed by jeremy zaida
Good evening, Jimmy Lee. I'm a resident of Jersey City, New Jersey. You may, you may have recently seen that the New Jersey Turnpike proposes a $5 billion widening of the New Jersey Turnpike extension that runs from Newark through Jersey City to the Holland Tunnel. Here in Jersey City and Hudson County, opposition to this project is strong and widespread because the region is already full of dangerous, polluting, cut-through traffic, and it would be pre preposterous to funnel additional traffic to Hudson County and New York City. In fact, with the support of a broad coalition of local community organizations, the cities of Hoboken and Jersey City both recently unanimously passed resolutions opposing this terrible project. Regarding taxes, the residents of Hudson County already pay a heavy and burdensome tax. While we are in an economically vibrant and diverse region, we also suffer from some of the worst air quality in New Jersey due to the immense amount of cut through traffic, including truck traffic that is headed to or from the Lincoln and Holland tunnels. The American Lung Association rates our air quality an F. This pollution, the asthma bills, the learning loss suffered from the particulate pollution, as well as the related road dangers are, are already an unfair tax on our communities. And so with that bit of context, I would like to express strong and full support for swift implementation of congestion pricing. I do want to express a few concerns. I am concerned about the lack of improvements to good alternatives for crossing the Hudson River. The PATH train schedules on nights and weekends are a running local joke. And while the Lincoln Tunnel's dedicated bus lane is the most successful in the entire United States, it only serves morning weekday commuters and the Holland Tunnel currently has no bus lanes and realistically would also require NYC DOT to coordinate with New Jersey Transit on usage of bus stops and planning of routes. I would also like to revisit allocating a 10% share of revenue not only to Metro North and Long Island Railroad, but also to New Jersey, New Jersey Transit and improved path service. Last, I'm worried that if congestion pricing provided enough revenue, but did not reduce traffic enough, I worry that the effort would end there. And I urge that the effort would continue to truly uh, have an impact on um, vehicle miles traveled within the central business district. In Hudson County, a majority of which do not commute by car, uh, I believe are strong supporters of congestion pricing as is. But I think if you reconsider the problem as a regional problem and not just a New York state problem, congestion pricing would be even more of a no-brainer and a sell to the region. Thank you for your time. Thank you. The next speaker is Bessie Ng, followed by Sylvia Lin. The next speaker is Sylvia Lin, followed by Jeremy Zeta. Hi, can everyone hear me? Yes, we can. Perfect. Hi, I'm Sylvia Lin. I, I strongly disagree with the tolling program vehicles entering Manhattan. I think it's a terrible idea and I hope we can overrule this decision. Um, I lived in Manhattan my whole life. I moved to Brooklyn. I still commute into Manhattan. Uh, I was always a public transportation girl. I ride a bike and now I own a car only because one reason I find tr uh, public transportation unsafe due to the pandemic. And, um, you know, let's not forget the bad service that's ongoing work and detours on the weekend. You know, the only benefit I really see is the MTA benefiting from this. You know, I, I don't really see any, you know, goals for anyone else uh, other than the MTA benefiting from this. I think, uh, you know, MTA, I think the MTA should really focus on people who are not paying the ride or people who are, um, I should really say, maybe MTA should focus on bringing riders back by making it cleaner, safer, and a quicker way to travel. You know, another reason why, like, I start owning a car now is not because I have money to afford it. It's because it's easier to travel with, right? It's safer to travel with. You know, MTA is making it a lot more transportation-wise, but in terms of, like, getting from one district to another, it takes forever. So, that's definitely not another way to travel, right? And, like, and then when we look at pollution problem, I mean, we're moving towards like hybrid and electrical cars within the years or so, right? So, you know, why can't we look at that direction? 
And if we're looking at the traffic issues right now, the number of vehicles on the road, it's really the new uh, the grid line that's created on the road that's like making these traffics happening. Um, you know, extra bike lanes added. And, and that's, I, I think that's the congestion part. And then I, I honestly think traveling should be a choice. It really shouldn't just be us focusing on just the MTA. You should have a choice of how you travel. You can bike, you can, you know, drive, you know, take the MTA. I still take the MTA regardless. So uh, that's my, my, that's all I want to say. Thank you. Thank you. We've reached the final two speakers on the list. After they've been called, we will call the names of all speakers who we previously called but did not speak yet. If you've joined the Zoom under a name that is different from the one you used when you signed up to speak, please identify yourself in the Q&A function. You may also request to speak anonymously. Our next speaker is Jeremy Zeta, followed by Alpha Ba. Our next speaker is Alpha Ba. Alpha, you may unmute and begin your remarks. Please unmute and begin your remarks. Alpha, if you're unable to unmute yourself, um, we will be going to the next speaker. We have now called all the speakers once and will call those who haven't spoken yet a second time. Our next speaker is Senator James Scoopus. Our next speaker is Beatriz Bofill. Michael Smith, Jonathan Peterson, Gil Franco, Andrew Fine, Jonathan Blair, Daniel Hernandez, Kay Cardona, Frank Tufano, Michael Adler, Ross Perlin, Silvano Ferrin, Tommy Ruchu. Ruchuzic, Jennifer Beretta. Again, if you have heard your name called, but you've joined the Zoom under a name that is different from the one you used when you signed up to speak, please identify yourself in the Q&A function. You may also request to speak anonymously. Gilda Aronson, Anderson Blackman, 
Fred English. Nicole Nurse. Isaac Perez. Joshua Beanstock. Michael Murray. Isabella Reek. Anthony Nichols. Vladimir Malinsky. Henry Kim. Daniel Geary. Gregory Bishop. Sonia Figura. Suzette McLeod. Israel Kaufman. Dana Dennis. Chris Collins. Sharon Lee. Henry Shire. Christopher Colon, Cindy Patterson, Jean Darcel Michelle, Lauren Secular, Chris Doyle, John Chamberlain. DJ. DJ, you may unmute and begin your remarks. Hello? We can hear you. Hi. Um, so yes, to chime in on the discussion, I think uh, the congestion pricing is a tough bit because I drive for a living as well. And I feel like this will create a tale of two cities where essentially those who live in Manhattan who could afford to live in Manhattan or those who could afford to travel will not be uh, bothered by it. And those who of us who struggle um, will will basically won't be able to uh, have a living or or simply travel throughout Manhattan um and some may believe why don't you just you know get an education and get a great job but between my wife and I we have four degrees three bachelors and a master's and we have a child in far Rockaway and we're, we're expecting uh, a second so it's not simply about um you know uh, Education leads to affordability due to great jobs opportunity. That's not always the case for everyone. So I just would simply want to make a, a honest living. I, I, I enter into the driving industry thinking that was going to be a temporary thing. I uh, a supply chain um, major with project management. I was working with one of the, the biggest um, cosm uh, cosmetic companies in the world. And yet, um, as, as I mentioned, I, I joined this thing thinking it was temporary, but uh, I've been driving for six years. Um, we are hit with so many high high costs during the pandemic. My my cost for gas doubled. I pay three times as much for uh, registering my 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 vehicle than my wife does, and I have to do it yearly to where she has to do it uh, by annually. Sorry, not by annually, every two years. So, which is man. So honestly, we we as and I'm pretty sure some has mentioned that's my baby crying in the background. Um, I'm pretty sure others have mentioned that you know they've paid into the MTA system um, multiple times through the uh, 275 that they have to pay. Um, I forgot the name of it per ride, and then we are also asked to do this again, which is 20, what seventeen dollars or twenty four dollars. That's astronomical. And people are just simply trying to have an honest living. And I believe it shouldn't be as the previous 
person mentioned, it shouldn't be a forced decision of whether or not um, you take the MTA or not. I think it should be an option. And if the MTA is failing, then it's really the MTA's problem and they need to restructure their business. Uh, if Mac is failing, Apple isn't forced to contribute to the business of Mac. So if the industry is failing, then they need to replan, restructure and, and revamp itself. Um, that's my time. Thank you. Next on the list of speakers who have not commented yet, Kat Harley, Renee Kinsella, Zwei Peng Peng, David Tenenbaum, Gina Lim, Austin Celestin, Michael Gross, Christopher Gomez, Maria Del Pilar, Jennifer Harvey, Michael Dumas, Ian Robinson, Alexander Frank, Wendy Pincus, Erica Levin, Felicia Sparkman, Eric Martz, Quanda Francis, Tensei Andergachu, James Ofalo, Maritza Deleon, Dunton Black, Chase Penna, Tai Lau, Harman Preet Singh, Steve Neeran, David Stern, Richard Calabro, Frederick Cuvassier, Tuhin Khan, Wasim Rikabi, Tim Schnur, Jessica Giti, Murtaza Manir, Jeffrey Zach, Samiko Ito, Joel Antonio Cespedes Rodriguez, John Lindenbaum, Millwood Hughes, Jesus Urena, Anthony Duran, Malik Francois, Christopher Piero, Sean Garlis, Tiffany Zhang, Dana Lufo, Stephen Burke, Roland Levin, Robert Schweit, Arlene Kurinik Kuringa, Judy Edwards, Marcel Kaganaskaya, Gerald Adams, Christoph Klanowski, Ranjit Singh, John Simoleus, Abdelkader Frika, John D'Amato, Bryce Schumann, Octavia Williams, Joel Samuel, Daisy Cuevas, Mukul Biswas, Abdul Wadud, Anika Richmond, Marietta Vieira, Sandra Fleming, 
Neil Williams, Robert Arnone, Seydou Sangare, Ibrahim Sedrak, Hassan Ali, Johnny Smith, El Medina, Uzma Ghul, Anne Marie Carboneau, Edgar Rodriguez, Joseph Sukawi, Howard Spector, Susan Lee, Mary Ann Cerrone, Stephen Collage, Andrew O'Toole, Jason Seo, Donald Davis, Neil Cooper, Rava Ambrose, Daniel Feldman, Daniel Tenau, Jospel Sidhu, Bill Feinberg, Sheldon Sood, Jim Reyes, Imran Khan, Stuart Keller, Gene Han, Ray M, Patricia McSherry, Matthew Hopkins, Andrew Krug, Devon Edwards, Ray Dries, Kabir Javid, Christina Santos, Thomas McGuire, Martin Weinberg, Tom Lejudis, Alex Shahasov, Stephen Ken Abraham, Joseph Labetti. If you hear your name called, or if you have joined the Zoom under a name that is different from the one you used when you signed up to speak, please identify yourself in the Q&A function. Our next speaker is Jesus Urena, followed by Giovanna Esquivel. This is Urena, we are trying to promote you to speaker, please uh, accept. Oh, and you've joined and you should be able to unmute yourself and begin your remarks. Hello. We can hear you. Okay, perfect. I'm just, um, I'm an individual, right? I lived in New York approximately like 40 something years. And I find it very disturbing that the MTA would be in charge of something like this. It seems like it's somewhat a money grab like everybody else was speaking i understand we're trying to protect the environment but the same token it's only the people that have vehicles that are being punished for this i don't make a, a lot of money but whatever little money i had i was able to purchase a vehicle i live in a two-fair zone in queens village new york and the busing system the MTA has literally taken over 
the roadway as well as bicyclists. But yet, the motor vehicleists are responsible for maintaining the roadways. DOT has failed to maintain proper roadways for vehicles, bus, and bicyclists. There's no one ticketing these bicyclists that's going the opposite direction, going out of their way to get into accidents with motor vehicleists, but yet the motor vehicleists are the ones with the burden. This is really a burden on every class citizen in New York City. You've strangled New York to a point where everybody's leaving New York due to the nickel and diming of everything that we have in New York. MTA, you're at fault for wasting the, the funds that you receive. You've been given a bailout from the federal government during the pandemic. You still received funds from everybody that was getting monthly passes during the pandemic. You failed to maintain the subway system cleanliness. You allowed the homeless to live in there. To all my constituents and to all my regular citizens of New York City need to understand, all you people, the NTA, the DOT, and also you, the federal DOT, was responsible for this. And I, and I leave it at that. We need to change who we elect into office. Thank you. Thank you. We are currently at number 200 on our list of speakers and we'll continue to call the list. If you would like to speak but have not heard your name called yet, please indicate that in the Q&A function. Again, if you're waiting to speak, please identify yourself in the Q&A function. Robert Aracena, Richard Catalano, Ciro Luna, Naomi Pemberton, Prakash Parmar, Aliza Gregory, Shane Harris, Robert Belowski, Thomas Neubauer, Angel Rodriguez, Michael Torres, Isabel Hernandez, Mark Berger, Angel Paredes, Tawana Denard, Konstantin Shishkovsky, Kofi Afriyi, Andy Wong, Carolyn Davis, Anonymous Kareem, Sergi Lyshenko, Eric Pinto, Alfonso Anderson, Seth Doby, Grace Marrero, Dario Cremades, Enrique Quezada, Cheryl Boyland, Karen Loreno, Joseph Mudo, Joseph, you may unmute yourself and begin your remarks. 
Hello, hello. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, first of all, thank you for um, enduring this <laughs> long marathon. Um, I'll try to keep it quick. Um, I just want to tell you guys to stay strong. Um, <laughs> don't give in to the car fetishists. Um, I hear people complaining here that these policies are punishing drivers. I say, good. They should be punished. Um, <laughs> New York is a town that should belong to pedestrians, cyclists, and public transit riders. That is how the vast, vast majority of this city gets around, and the policy should favor those people. Um, if I had my way, I'd go even further than this policy. I would ban private cars entirely from all of Manhattan. Uh, look how nice uh, the 14th Street busway is. Um, that's wonderful. You should be doing that all over the city. I don't know why you haven't expanded that yet, but I'm hoping that when congestion pricing comes into effect, that more of the city will be like that. Um, you see buses moving quickly. You see pedestrians crossing the street. They're not afraid of getting mowed down by some you know, lunatic in a private car. I think that's wonderful. That's what the city should be. Um, anyway, I live in Bay Ridge. I actually own a car. Um, I don't think I've ever driven it into lower Manhattan. Um, that's a crazy thing to do. There's no need to do that. We have wonderful public transportation here. Um, I saw my Congresswoman Nicole Maliotakis spoke. Uh, I just want her to know that she doesn't speak for me. <laughs> She's wrong. Uh, Bay Ridge, everyone I talk to in Bay Ridge supports this policy. I think it's, I think people are on board with it. Um, all that said, if we do grant you guys this power, um, I would say there's also maybe a new responsibility on your end as well. Please Dear God, fix the trains, fix the buses. They should be fast. They should be safe. They should be clean. <laughs> um, I live on the R train. I take it all the time. I, I like taking the train. I prefer taking the train to driving, but it's, you know, it's slow. It's kind of a, it's kind of a joke. Um, <laughs> uh, so fix it. That's, that's, that's all I ask. But, you know, other than that, just stay the course, push this thing through. I, the whole city is counting on it. It's going to make the city a better place to live. So thank you very much. Thank you. We'll continue calling names from the list. If you haven't heard your name called and want to speak and have not already indicated that to us in the Q&A function, please do let us know in the Q&A function. Sandra Flores, Ali Mohammed, Richard Osman, Paul Mankabadi, Andre Cano, Thomas Santana, Jan Gershkovich, Elizabeth Curry, John Buckholz, Ahmad Saeed, Aglaia Davis, Ralph Saro, Dan Anacito, Haran Douglas, Stephen Omis, Margaret Basilio, Raghunandan Ankalekar, Susan R, Vijay Nayak, Tobias Russo, Robert Gilpin, Tyrone Murray, Antonio Siquera, Michael Samuels, Rafael Santos, Jessica Jean Baptiste, Rafael Salazar, Geraldine Fredericks, Michelle Sarno, Demiana Johnson. Luis Gamboa, Rodney Carter, Jeffy Tuller, Ira Gershenhorn, Atta Panyan Young, Teresa Collins, Felix Oenwalder, Robert Last, Flory P. Matha Sangir, Judith Dahill, Lisa Mangal, 
Marvin Lowe. Patrick McLaughlin. Dina Ruiz. Eric Bell. Ibrahim Barry. Douglas Gordon. Basia Osowski. Jonelle Wright. Jamal Moe. Christine Negra. Akinwal Kilanen. Arthur Healer. Catherine Tanner Nyang. Catherine, you may unmute yourself and begin your remarks. Catherine, you may unmute yourself and begin your remarks. You appear to be unmuted, but we can't hear you. We'll have to come back to you. You might wanna try changing your, oh, we can see you. Do you wanna try speaking? We, all can right. you hear me? Yes, now we can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Uh, you know, thank you for including me. I know this is very late. I signed up. I am a member of the district. I am a cyclist. Uh, I have been a resident of uh, the Lower East Side for more than 40 years. Uh, I am also a driver of a vehicle. And I feel very strongly that your plan is incomplete. I was very disappointed with the presentation this evening, which I felt there were a lot of gaps in information that was uh, very would be very helpful to me. Uh, but I feel right now that your approach to this is a new form of redlining, uh, which will disproportionately impact residents of the district. Congestion is not the problem of my neighborhood. It's not the problem of people who live and reside and have businesses below 60th Street in Manhattan. It is a problem of the people who come in here. I live in on the Lower East Side and I see all of the cars who come in from New Jersey on Saturday and, and you know Friday and Saturday night to go to dinner, to go to clubs. I do not have a place to park in my own neighborhood. I've already moved my car to Queens and your plan doesn't even allow me to understand whether or not I would be subject to congestion pricing going over the Queensboro Bridge. The, your, your plan is incomplete. For all of the different scenarios that you proposed this evening, you did not you know, really come up with scenarios for ordinary New Yorkers who live in this district who might have to contend with that congestion pricing. I wholly reject it as something that is oppressive uh, to me as a longtime resident who is already, you know, a civil servant living in New York, serving the people of New York, paying taxes through the nose, local, state, and federal, um, but you would you would impose more tax on me um, for me to have a car? Why shouldn't I have a car? Why shouldn't I not ha be able to have a car in, with, to go places around the country where public transportation will not currently take me? It's absurd. I should be able to live here and enjoy having a vehicle enjoy being able to park 
wherever I need to park and not have to compete with people who are coming from outside the city. Why should this tax be imposed on me? Thank you. George Pilari, Beta V. Desai. Good evening. My name is Beta V. Desai. I'm the executive director of the New York Taxi Workers Alliance. We are a proud organization of over 25,000 taxi and FHV drivers. And we're really offended by the fact that your own report says there are going to be massive job losses for this workforce. And yet you have not recommended exemptions for drivers in all of these scenarios. You know, you're going to upend the lives of one of the largest workforces, in fact, the biggest private sector workforce in the state of New York, a workforce that is predominantly immigrant and is already on the edges of the economy. And fundamentally, what this comes down to is you're saying to an entire group of drivers that when we're in the middle of a pandemic and, you know, the subways and the buses aren't running, Drivers are good enough to risk their lives and serve the public. But now when you need money, you're willing to risk them, you know, and leave them pretty much destitute. The idea that your, you know, your solution that you would waive a $70 bus driver's exam, it's just so incredibly insulting to a workforce that works incredibly hard, serves a million people every single day puts their lives on the job. They're 30 times more likely to be killed on this job, 80 times more likely to be robbed on this job. They deserve to be treated with dignity and respect and their labor deserves to be valued and recognized as central to the transportation network of our city. Having said that, you also must recognize yellow cab drivers have been paying a congestion fee of 50 cents per trip since the year 2009. Since 2019, they've been paying an additional $2.50. That's $3 as of today. On Uber and Lyft trips, there's $2.75. Your own report says that the companies would be all right but it's the drivers that would face massive job losses. This industry has still not recovered. More than half, 60% like of the cabs are not even back on the streets yet. People have high debts on the medallion that they're still trying to pay off. While only 11% of Uber and Lyft cars are not back on the streets yet, each driver is making 41% less trips today than pre-pandemic, and they get paid by the trip, not by the hour. You must go back to the drawing board. Drivers need to be exempted. You cannot put this on their backs. They deserve to be treated with dignity, and your plan does not do that. Thank you. As a reminder, this is the second call for speakers who were unable to speak when their name was first called. If you would like to speak, please identify yourself in the Q&A. Kate Slevin, David Flaherty, Raul Rivera, Paul White, Gollum Talukter, Drew S, Samuel Pan, Don S, Eric Bischoff, Kathy Francis, Lincoln Palmer, Ivan Ventura, Go ahead, Ivan. Hey, how are you guys doing today? Um, 
definitely some of you guys definitely look tired. Um, I'm a driver in New York City. I've been doing this for, I think, too long now. Maybe uh, going on. I started in 08. Um, driving Uber and Lyft, I've done over 30,000 trips in New York. Um, you know, my argument is very simple. You guys are not thinking about the drivers. You guys at the beginning of this, during the pandemic, when the MTA shut down, you guys were encouraging yellow cabs and TLC drivers to come out and move all these other people when you guys shut down. So at that point, we were essential. Now, we ain't even that. We're, we're way less than essential drivers to anything. You know, my biggest concern is you guys have got on over a billion dollars since 2019. Open up your books. Let us see where the money went. You know, if you guys want to start trimming the fat, you guys got to start trimming the fat within the MTA because you guys don't know how to budget your money for anything. If I failed in my business, I would have to move on and start something else. You guys have to let an independent contractor come in and run you guys to profitability because you guys have no idea what the value of a dollar is. You know, besides that, let me let you guys know that that email on waiving $70 for um, FHV drivers who lose their job to go to become bus drivers. That's great. What about the older FHV drivers who don't have um, GEDs, who don't have high school diplomas? What are you going to do with them? You want them to clean the buses? You want to hire them to clean the, the buses, the, the MTA, the trains, the train stations? Maybe you guys do need the help, but where's the money going to come from? You guys have no money. You know, what you guys fail to realize is over a 16 month span, when the recession for drivers started, nine drivers committed suicide. You guys are leading the way for more drivers to lose their job, not know how to provide food for their families. And eventually some might commit suicide. You guys have to go back to the drawing board and figure it out. If you guys can't do it, with over the billion dollars that we've contributed to you guys. You guys ain't gonna be able to do it with $17, with $23. It doesn't matter what number you put. You know, you guys increase the tolls. I live in Staten Island, I pay three tolls before I ever get to the city. Imagine what happens when the $23 hike comes in. You guys have to look at us and understand that well, during the pandemic, we delivered over 53 million meals that for free, basically, you guys, TLC paid us. But we delivered 53 million, 53 million meals. At that Extremely time, we were your remarks. Thank you. Mohammed Bilal. Joseph Toronto. Jose Paulino. John Banzer. John Banzer. Can you hear me? Please go can ahead. Yes, we can. Yes. Yep. Um, hi, how are you? My name is John R. Banzer. I'm a write-in candidate for governor, and I've been uh, very upset with the, what has gone on throughout the pandemic. As a mentally ill person, I watched my contemporaries be stuffed into corpse bridges and uh, my other contemporaries be worked to death. And uh, I'm staring at restaurant boxes right now, which are very little more than uh, just a, a rat parade. And uh, I'm sitting outside a, a music, the Music Inn, which is a landmark place where uh, I, as a comedian, by the way, they made comedy illegal during the pandemic, but it was allowed for bands to go around. I uh, watched my business collapse from a psychiatric facility before the pandemic started and got into theater of March of 2020. So I've been, uh, it's been a hard road. So you got to know this, that when I, I can't put my tools on the train because I had to live with my parents. 32 because uh, I'm broken now trying to get back into art and this is the only functional form of therapy I have and with this congestion charge I can't come into the city and do little 
things around the theater so I can barely keep my head above water. And I watch people not come back. And I, I will do anything and treat anybody who tries to take more money out of my pocket as a hostile entity. I, I, I love doing comedy. I, I love performing art. I love helping doing all these people. I love driving my friends home when they're drunk. I, that's something I also have a right to do with the car. You know, th this is a money grab in so many areas because I take my friends home and I'll get a whole bunch of them to come here and tell them how many of them we got home safely. But I can't do that when I have to pay $120 a week to just go and express myself freely. So I got, the, I got to let you know that this is, this is a non-starter from anybody on the, uh, on, the, on, the, on the island because then I'm trapped. This isn't a peninsula. I don't care what the Supreme Court rule. Oh, and by the way, what color is the first uh, woman that's gonna be arrested uh, for not paying to go to work. That's my biggest concern. Who who goes to jail for not paying to go to work? Is it going to be one of you guys who 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 had ninety thousand dollars just just wa waved away? You know, no problem. Keep your pension. I'm never paying any money to go do art in the city. So you're going to have to contend with every single artist. And we love doing what we're doing. And we commute hundreds of thousands of miles just to come entertain and make people laugh for nothing. A lot of it. I really need you to understand that there's a lot more in danger than what's on paper. It's the ancillary things that make this city inherently valuable. Why, where there's more languages spoken in Queens than anywhere else on earth, and we wonder why so many new words pop up around here. That's what's in danger. And I'm not gonna take it. We're not paying a dime. And you're gonna have to send an army to come take me to, to, to jail for not paying to come try and do this. Thank you for your time. Please have a good night. Thank you. The next speaker is Raul Rivera. Good evening, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, good evening, my name is Raul Rivera. I'm a native New Yorker. I'm a New York City uh, TLC driver and uh, I oppose the congestion pricing uh, I'm 52 years old. Uh, when I was uh, a young teenager, I, uh, I, I worked for various small firms in the city. And, uh, I did the, my deliveries on foot and I seen, and I know my city, I know Manhattan. I was born in the Bronx, but I worked all my life in Manhattan. I see all the streets that have been closed. I'm 52 years old. I see street after street after street being closed. If you keep closing streets, you're gonna get congestion. I'm ordering all elected officials to stop saying that we have a congestion problem. It's obvious that we're gonna have one if you continue to close the streets. It's an overreach. Not only did you go and try to put a toll on one or two bridges, you went and got all four bridges. It's, 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 it's a job killer. It's gonna, it's gonna decimate the, the taxi industry. Listen to uh, uh, the, the, uh, the director from uh, Taxi Workers Alliance, she said it, uh, I mean, she couldn't say it any better than myself. You know, it's, it's, it's a job killer. You have to understand that. I was at a rally today at 42nd Street and Park Avenue. They kept talking about safety. How is it gonna be safe? It's gonna be safe. Our pedestrians are gonna be safe. I says, we have to educate the, the, the the New Yorker, how to cross the street. They try to use safety for everything. For safety, we're gonna start taxing you. We're gonna take your money. We, I say no to congestion pricing today, tomorrow, forever. We are sending money. We are sending money to other countries when that money can be used here. So I ask you guys, reach out to the, to the, uh, uh, the Biden of Brooklyn and have the Biden of Brooklyn call the Biden of Washington and tell him that we need the money here. Stop sending money to other countries. Stop stealing from the drivers here, the workers here. Again, we oppose congestion pricing. Thank you for the time. Thank you. A reminder, if you have joined the Zoom under a name that is different from the one you used when you signed up to speak, or if you did not sign up to speak, but would like to, please identify yourself in the Q&A function.
Austin Ferg, Kendra Hens, Joseph B, Tess Harkin, Todd Mazel, Dorothy Delulu, Delulo, sorry, Al Al, Borislav Borisov, Joseph Tedeschi, Sherelle Nix McKay, Tom Fox, Tuhami Ben Masood, Lavik Quincy Jones, Shmuel Abital, Yuki Endo. Yep. Please proceed. Okay. We can hear you. My name is Yoga. I'm the listener of the Doctor of Hygiene. And then I applaud the congregation blessing uh, because the stand island and the love place are turned on the board channel already has the pay for it. And uh, uh, the as then I didn't obey the hardest store for both NTA and, and the Pro Authority New York New Jersey uh, bridges and tunnel. Uh, bridges. Also, if the announcement to this morning, vehicle like a fire, fire truck, ambulance, law enforcement vehicle, I should not obey to access Manhattan, including the uh, police responding to uh, two trucks. And then also, all taxi drivers I should not uh, pay the toll either. Uh, 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 luckily, on the end of the time, all the board channel has to pay toll to access each other, but going to the next will be longer. Congestion pricing might be a good idea for the public funding, uh, but not for the knowledge. Also, congestion pricing on a New York City uh, DOT bridge to your class uh, delayed to public, uh, public buses. Uh, 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 congestion pricing, uh, pricing to your class headache for the DOT workers who move us at the access of other business. I do not support any non NJ commuter buses, buses, including the charter buses from the out of New York City. At the pay for and at all and any uh, British tunnel owned by the NTA for authority uh, or the New York City DOT. Uh, 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 and then I have when we drive from the Osmin at the Manhattan Center. Uh, 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 thank you. Thank you. We're nearing the end of our second call for speakers who were unable to speak when their name was first called. Again, if you would like to speak, please identify yourself in the Q&A. Kamal Sarwar, Adam Phillips, Christopher Sanders, Zaire Baptiste, Tom Kazarowski, John Law, Kawas Terrigan, Megan Dyer, Jasmine Vasquez, MD Hussein, Grayson Paris, Sean Johnson Jr. Harry Malikoff, Nana Mpofo, Morgan Adze, 
Ahmad Ali, Tamika Flowers Ball, Jamal King, Danny Sena, Evelyn David, Joseph Lading, Alexis Bruno, Jenny Lee, Sam Streeter, Charlene Burke, Jay Ehrlich, Abby Bordnick, Mika White, Ronald Simoncini, Ned Day, Edward P. Ari Aronowitz, Stefania Kupalova, Bessie Ng, Alpha Ba, Alpha, if you're there, you can unmute and proceed. Hello there, can you guys hear me? Can. Yeah. I'm having trouble with it. Can you guys hear me, yeah? We, yes, we can hear you. Oh, perfect. Okay, I, I have a little concern. Okay, so I'm looking at the panel. I think this congestion is a scheme, is a red lining. Definitely, it's racist. I'm looking at the panel. All I'm seeing is a descendant of European American, all right? I don't see no Asian American on the panel. I don't see it. I don't see no African American on the panel, maybe the, I don't, So we've got a very bad. Hello. Alpha. Yes, I'm here. You may want to uh, go back about 10 seconds yeah, in your bad. statement. We didn't hear much of the most recent portion. Okay, how about now? Can you guys hear me now or no? I still yes. kind of lost me or something. Oh, yes, go ahead. Okay, so what I'm saying is, yeah, so I'm, what I'm saying, this panel is very, it doesn't represent the body, the makeup of New York City. It's a very hand-picked, you really see Ameri European American descent. So that itself bothers a lot of folks out here because we are included, we all should be included on the panel. That's number one. Number two, this congestion pricing is nothing but a money grab. Um, it's it's a scheme. It's a Ponzi scheme. The MTA will never do it in court. Um, and again, we just have all kind of pandemic. We just came from a pandemic. There's a chance of people getting the pandemic. That's just, it's just ludicrous. It's terrible. If you guys cannot handle the pandemic, um, handle the MTAs, just give it up to private property. I mean, to private companies, let them run it. Since you guys cannot really, really control such thing. All right. I think it's uh, we don't just have want to have nothing but white folks, to be honest, be on the panel. We don't have black folks, Asian folks, Chinese, Mexican, Japanese, Arabs, everyone. We just always see is same body that doesn't represent all of us here. All right. Yes. Thank you. Uh, okay. Thank you. Yeah, get a fix. Equal representation for all of us. Not just nothing about white folks. It's not fair. All right. 
Thank you. Thank you. Jeremy Zaida. Jeremy, if you could. Hi there, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Please proceed. Hi. I'm a, my name is Jeremy Zeta. I'm a resident of Manhattan, not in the CBD. I strongly support congestion pricing. Um, trying to take the bus around here is impossible, mostly because of the traffic. Um, and less people driving into the CBD means less people, not only in my neighborhood, but in the outer boroughs as well. Um, I also want to thank all of you for being here, um, especially for the interpreters. Thank you. Um, and uh, I just really hope that, first of all, whenever you are hearing somebody's name being called, you're realizing that this is somebody who your plan is affecting. And I want you to take your role in this city seriously, because a lot of times that you hear the complaints, the MTA is not properly budgeting what they have that needs to be a priority. You, we need to fix the subway system. That is very important. Same thing with DOT. Fix the streets, too. They're not safe for pedestrians. They're not safe for bicyclists. They slow down the buses. We need more bus lanes like the 14th Street busway. I work right at 14th and 6th. I see the effect that it has on the surrounding community. And I see how much better it is having the accessibility for all different modes of transportation, not just cars being trans. Uh, prioritized in this city. It really is frustrating seeing how much money and time and effort the city puts into making things easier for people who drive cars, when that's where the vast majority of people in this city do not have a car. The best day of my life was being able to get rid of a car because I moved here to New York City. Being able to live in this city without a car is a privilege, and we need to be able to encourage more people to use public transit. That means in better service in all ways, but I do support congestion pricing and it'll be able to make our streets safer. I think it needs to go further in the future. Um, so on a technical note, I do wanna say that in the environmental report, I uh, think that scenario G is the best. Um, having it be simple, uh, one toll across all um, vehicle classes and no exemptions makes it easier for people to understand. Uh, that's another thing that the MTA needs to get right there's a lot of misunderstanding about what the CBDTP is all about, how it'll affect people. You hear people citing the $23 toll all the time, thinking that that is the baseline, that, that it's always going to be that. You guys need to do a much better job of communicating with the people in this city and the surrounding areas so that people understand what you're actually proposing. Thank you for listening. Have a great rest of your night. Thank you for participating. That concludes our second run through the list of tonight's speakers. Thank you all for joining us this evening. For those who did not do so already, we encourage you to take our short survey via the QR code or link currently being displayed. The link can also be found in the Q&A section of the Zoom. For details about upcoming hearings, For details about upcoming hearings, please visit the project website at mta.info slash cbdtp or call the public meeting hotline at 646-252-6777. As a final reminder, in addition to the virtual public hearings, there are several other ways you can provide comments on the environmental assessment through September 9th, 2022. We encourage the public to comment via the CBDTP website, where you can also find the latest project information and sign up to stay informed via email. You may also email comments to cbdtp at mtabt.org send them via mail to CBD Tolling Program, 2 Broadway, 23rd Floor, New York, New York, 10004, or call 646-252-7440. Comments may also be provided directly to the Federal Highway Administration, 
via email to cbdtp at dot.gov or via mail to FHWA, New York Division, Ray CBDTP, Leo W. O'Brien Federal Building, 11A Clinton Avenue, Suite 719, Albany, New York, 12207. The time is currently 11.42 p.m. This concludes our hearing. Thank you again for your participation.